This comprehensive course will teach you how to turn your idea for an app into a reality, all from a business perspective. Professor Sluter is an experienced teacher, and he's great at explaining things so anyone can understand. Hi. In this video, we're going to talk about the business of building mobile apps. Normally in this channel, you think about apps and the technical parts of how to program them, how to design them, how to troubleshoot them, how to make them work. And now we're going to talk about maybe the business side of it. So if you're kind of a business person or you're looking into changing your role from a programmer into a team lead or a business leader, then this is going to have some good advice for you. So here's what's ahead of us in the next few videos. In this video, we're going to talk about the motivation for building an app. Because if you don't know why you're building an app, you're probably going to fail. In soon videos, we're going to talk about effective design and making your app work for your users. So you ask your user what they want and build exactly what they need rather than choosing the features that you like and are cool. The next part is about marketing. We're going to look at how you can actually turn your app into something successful that people want to use. How do you make money on it? And whether you support a business or you're trying to create a business, we need to ask the principles about supporting and monetizing. Also, many users just ignore their apps. They install it once and then forget about it. So what makes the difference between the apps that are sticky and the ones that get thrown away or ignored? So there are some pretty standard principles for how to build an addictive app and increase user loyalty. Also, what's the tools? What do we do when we come to decide on which language, which platform, cross-platform, which frameworks, what's going to happen in the future? How am I going to find employees to work for? And now we're going to see all of these questions in one of the most critical technical decisions that you can make about building apps is choosing the right tools. Also, not just the tools for building your app itself, but the supporting infrastructure. What's called the full stack involves not only just the things that you see on the screen, but the databases behind it, the cloud services, the integration between websites and mobile apps. And so there's a lot of technology that is unseen. And if you're not a technical developer, this could be a huge blind spot. And so we'll talk some advice about how to build for a more scalable cloud service and now we're going to talk about, speaking of your technical people, how do you choose a development team? What's the right way to create a job requisition? What's the right way to find the right person that would actually help you? And so we're going to give you some advice for hiring people and choosing the right people that will make their career a happy place if you are their manager. And then finally, what are some emerging trends? So you don't want your app to uh, be expensive and be replaced on a regular basis. You want it to be able to grow and expand. And what's coming down the road? What things are we going to do with our mobile apps that we don't do very well right now? And so that's some of the things that are ahead in the videos that are beyond. Now, first of all, we're talking about the motivations. And so that's why you came to this video. What reason do you have if you want to make an app? So some people, it's about money. Some people are solving problems. Maybe you are just trying to make things that people love to use, or you're trying to save the world. Now, you might ask, why an app then? If I'm going to build an app, are there better ways to invest my money? Is the app the right solution? You have to understand your problem before you begin typing, obviously. And so apps are expensive. Web apps might be better. Uh, a good app for a bad business plan is probably going to fail. And so make sure that you answer some of the fundamental questions about why you're building an app in the first place. Of course, some people are going to say, the motivation is just that I've heard you can make a ton of money as an app developer and an app creator. Well, for some people, yeah, it's true. There's a 1% club that seems to do very well at that, but for the rest of us, not so much. Maybe you have a, a good motivation to say, my app is going to save the world some way. I'm going to reduce carbon emissions. I'm going to help people with anxiety. I'm going to provide services for the underserved. I'm going to promote racial harmony. 
I'm going to make our government work better. And so there's a ton of things that you can provide services for that you could put into this category of saving the world. And maybe you don't even have to make much money at it, but I bet in the long run, if you really come up with one of these solutions that you say you are, you're on the success track already, even though money wasn't your first motivation. However, what you have to get right is this question here. What problem are you trying to solve? And so we're going to take an entire video in just uh, another one or two uh, steps here to figure out how you can identify what problem needs to be solved. If you don't get this one right, you haven't gotten anything right. So solving a problem is the fundamental problem of designing and managing your app. So in the world of apps, there is this huge uh, ocean of apps to choose from. Uh, a very small percentage of those show up on the top. As a matter of fact, I think 60% or more are never downloaded. Uh, most never make any money. Uh, and so your, pro your proposition isn't so much about how can I make money, but it's how can I solve the right problem. Clearly, there is an app for every need but there's not a need for every app. So most apps are used once and then uninstalled. There are a great many solutions out there that are probably similar to the idea that's uh, brewing in your head right now. And you better be darn sure that there are customers that you can identify that actually want to use your app and even more are willing to pay you money or desperate to give you money if you've got the right solution. So what you need to do in your motivation stage of an app is to think about the value you provide. So let's think for a second about one of the most popular apps and one of the greatest success stories in app development. Let's talk about Airbnb. If they were to state their value proposition, you might think it was this one here. They said, Airbnb allows travelers to stay in a room that is less expensive and better than hotel rooms. Now, I wrote that value proposition. I'm not the, obviously, the uh, CEO of Airbnb, but I'm thinking this might be their value proposition. I'm their customer, and this is what they provide me. Well, I'm kind of their customer, but really their customer is not me. I'm the customer of the person renting the room. So the customer for Airbnb is the person that has the property. And so maybe a better way for their value proposition to be stated would be something like this. I want to enable property owners to make money by renting space. And so you can see the formula here is that in one sentence, they can justify the expense and the business model that they're trying to build. And so Airbnb might be an app, but really, it's an app that is a business or a business that is an app. So your value proposition, this is your homework. You've got an idea right now for an app. Can you state it in this term that my value proposition for my app is something like X, my business, X is a service that allows Y, Y is my customer, that allows Y to do Z in a better way. And so you have to be very specific on each of these. What do I do? Who do I do it for? And why is it better than the competition? So do your homework. See if you can write out a clear statement. And if you can, not only are you sure about what you're going to be working on, but your proposed uh, investors and employees and your entire organization has a clear vision of what you're trying to do. So your business might need an app to do its service, but a better question to start with is, are there people who need to do why? Are there people that are willing to pay you to do it? And so this is your homework before you even begin to write code. Let me give an example. So I look at my phone and I have this app on my phone called All Trails. Now, I hate paying for software, probably just like you. Uh, I have Microsoft Office only because my employer pays for it. I try to get the free stuff whenever possible. Now, All Trails is an exception to that. For some reason, I'm willing to pay $30 a year for this app on my phone. Why is that? Well, it's because I am their target user. I love hiking, I like backpacking. 
And so if you look at what they're trying to say, my proposition is you can plan ahead with detailed maps. You can navigate on the trail. So my GPS tells me exactly where I am, and so I don't get lost in the woods, which, of course, has happened. And so as a result, they have identified exactly who their customer is, they know who I am, and even though it pains me, I am willing to offer them money on a yearly basis because they do this better than anyone else. And so they found their niche, they found their persona, they found their customer, and they provide me value that I'm willing to pay for. Now here's the other example. So if you are an elementary classroom teacher or you know somebody you could, or that does that, you could probably ask them, do you use class dojo in your, in your room? So you're probably not an elementary teacher, just by statistically speaking. But here's what it is. 95%, this is a huge market penetration. They say 95% of schools use this app in their classroom. So why in the world does everybody adopt it? Well, you can see, first of all, it's free. And so that's a pretty easy proposition. And it does exactly what a teacher needs. So all of your classroom tools in one place, there's a good value proposition. So you can see they throw an example in front of you. How many groups do you want in your classroom? You can see that they are grouping people with the ease of an app. And they could probably just show this right on the screen in front of the classroom to say, hey, random groups today, click. Or you might say, what does this app do for communicating with my parents? You could also do things like keep track of classroom discipline or give bonus points to students. You can modify their behavior. You can keep track of things. You can translate. In other words, they have found what a teacher needs. They have either lived in the shoes of a teacher, they were a teacher, or they know teachers so well through study that their app now rests in 95% of all classrooms here in the United States. And so your goal then is to have a value proposition for your service that fits somebody. That somebody might be plumbers. It might be accountants. It might be kayakers. It might be chiropractors, bicyclists. It might be hairstylists. So, so you don't want to say, well, my app is for everybody, anyone that has a car. No, you want to have people that have specific needs, people that have car seats, people that have babies, people that commute to work. Uh, whatever their issue is, you have an identified solution for them. And so like Class Dojo or the Hiker app, they have picked a segment and they know exactly who they want to serve. Also, here's the question about the motivation. Do you really need an app or do you just need a better website? Because here is a principle if you're thinking about spending a whole lot of money on an app. You can serve a great deal of your customers through a properly designed website. So this is called mobile first web design. And you can see in the example that a properly formatted page is just as easy to use on a phone as an app is. And if you do it right, you can have one server, one set of code, one programmer, and you don't have all the expense and hassle of an app store. And so maybe you should think about does my service or does my solution really require an app? Or can I just make it better with a website? So fortunately, Google has given us some advice on what things people prefer in which format. So as you can see, the top of the list is heavy on tasks that people want to use an app for. So games, why would they care for games? Well, probably performance. You have high speed graphics, you have better downloads. Uh, games just work better when they're an app. Uh, how about tracking your physical activity? So you probably have built in heart sensors, GPS, accelerometers, you can tell how fast you're moving. Uh, listening to music, navigation. So there are certain things up here that are focused in on the performance or feature of the phone. So obviously Pokemon Go is gonna work with an app and not a website. Now, if you look down at the bottom, you can see the opposite of the spectrum. So don't bother with an app if you're trying to do one of these things. So search or browse the internet, find things to do, order takeout, find things to do or eat, organize your leisure or business travel, read the news. So all of these are probably just as well done or even better with a website. So just use your Chrome browser that's already built in on the phone and then you don't have to worry about building an app. So think about some of these issues before you go out and hire a, a mobile development team and invest a lot of money.
So one of the next things we need to do is think about the categories of apps that you might want to develop. What's the competition in these categories and how much money can you make? A second question is, who is your app for? And so knowing your user is the second video that I recommend that you look at next. Hi, and welcome to the business of applications. We're talking about mobile applications and the business of making your ideas work. And so here's the agenda that we're looking through on the class. So we're in section one right now, which is motivations for building an app. So in this video, we're going to talk about the categories of apps and which categories are profitable, which ones that you actually have a chance of in competing, and perhaps the one that you're best suited for based on your expertise. And so let's look at the categories out there and help you make a decision about that great app idea that's in your head. Which category would be best for you to compete in? And so let's talk about some of the things that we could do. So first of all, fact number one, if you're trying to sell your app, you may get some money for it if you put a price tag on it. If you do, we can know this, that the average price for a premium app on the App Store is $2.17. Now that sounds pretty good if you made a million apps, but if you're in the majority of people, you're probably far below this. Because when you think of what an app is, most people expect it to be absolutely free. And so the best way to make money is not actually to charge money for the app itself, but to get it in other ways. And so you could probably think about getting in-app purchases or trying to sell advertising. Which apps do the best, by the way? So if you're trying to put a price tag on your app, you should probably think of who is willing to pay for it. Notice at the top, we've got technology and finance. Yeah, both of those are kind of rich people things. Or they're actually pretty useful things that uh, solve annoying problems. Look at the very bottom, though. If you're like me, you probably think games are cool. They're kind of neat to build. And they're also some of the things that people don't want to pay for. So. You're going to have to come up with other ways if you're going to make money for your app than just charging for it. Now here's a principle that would make sense if you want to actually compare you with the average. So really there is no such thing as an average when it comes to our apps. So think of the big monstrous companies. Do you really think you're going to make something like Amazon or you're going to make the next McDonald's app? Probably not. So if you're comparing apps, think of how a realtor would come up with a price for a house. You don't just take the average price for the city. You take a look at your house and you compare the same number of bedrooms, bathrooms, same square feet, locations pretty close, and then you have a better idea of what your app can do. So instead of looking at these top lists of the averages or the top 100 in the internet, look at people that are doing something that is like what you're doing. And so another way to do this is to try to compare on scale. So if you know that Clash of Clans makes over $2 million a day in purchases, uh, don't just think that your app can somehow make $2 million either. So what you need to do is maybe divide. So how many customers does the app serve and how much do they make in a day? And you can come up with something that is a little bit closer to what you can expect. A better way to compare yourself with other people in the App Store is to use the median instead of an average. And so, you know, in a median, you just take the middle score of a value. So if there are some really high-end people, which there are, uh, that way the median isn't so much affected. So take a look at premium apps here. So I just stole this right out of the uh, Google app, um, Play Store and to see what they're advertising. So what people are willing to pay for in an app can tell you something about maybe the app that you're thinking about building. And so it looks to me like we have no games here. We've got some tools. Uh, the Star Walk, I think that's a cool one where you can actually uh, use your phone to track uh, where things are in the sky. And so sometimes premium apps are there because people are willing to pay for a service without having to look at advertising. So a good piece of advice for coming up with the uh, amount of money that you're going to make is actually not to think about the money at all. It's to think about who your customer is and how you can satisfy them. So if you can scratch an itch, you can meet their need, you can solve a problem, they're going to eventually pay you, whether you charge them at the beginning or along the way. And so your priority should be to think of how to make a great app that they love to use. Let's take a look at the first category that you'd come across. 
in most app stores. I think most people would think of social media as probably the most common app that they've got on their phone. And so it's a crowded field. All of these things that you're looking at here are probably one or two or many of them on your phone right now. Uh, they're huge though. So think of how big the apps are and how far away you are of actually competing against them. So if you're thinking about building the next Facebook, you could probably do that in a semester. So one of the courses that we teach uh, uses a social network and you build connections and you have a database and you can add comments and send messages to your friends. And so technically, we got the solution put together in one semester. But realistically, the, the app is still worthless because well, nobody's on the app. The, the, the real value of a social media app is how many users do you have? And so maybe a good strategy for you to compete in this category is to think about augmenting or adding on to something rather than competing against it. So unless you've got the next TikTok, you're probably not going to bump somebody off. These are tough categories to compete in. But here's an example of something that you might think of if you were in social media. So here's a tool. It uh, augments what Facebook does. Or maybe you could come up with some kind of a Twitter uh, actual add-on or something. So think of the ways that you can make an existing app a little bit better. Now, a great category for a beginner, especially somebody that would be in one of my classes where you're learning how to program, is to build a game. So games are really a good place for you to start if you're just trying to experiment with the App Store and build apps and try to get some customers. Not because you're going to make a lot of money, but because games are a nice way to build an app that you can understand. And what you can do, instead of make money with your app, is maybe just as good, is you can add it to your portfolio. What do you mean by that? A portfolio is a collection of projects that you can show potential employers. And you bring it to your interview. You put it on your LinkedIn. And you say, listen, I built this app. And it's kind of like Angry Birds. And it's got a bunch of graphics. I used a framework for building cross-platform apps. I have a database. I'm using a REST service. I learned React. And so if you've got all those key words in there and you have this working game, it's a really good project. And I recommend that you do that if you're trying to get a job and maybe have someone hire you to be an employee for a company that builds apps. And so you might end up working for Pizza Hut and ordering a pizza app instead of creating your own business. But it's a pretty good job if you're going to be an app developer. So I've got another video that compares the, the prices and the salaries and the expectations about a web developer versus an app developer. And it's worth checking out. Well, looking at the chart here, you can see that these are some of the most downloaded. And they're also some of the most profitable apps that are in the market. So social media and gaming probably dominate what we mostly think about, about our phone purpose and what we do with it. And so we're always on one of those two. Now look at this category. This graph here is amazing. Um, you can see that the value of daily revenue by category is like really skewed toward the games area. And so $22,000 a day is the average app revenue in the category. Then we split up the game category again, and we can see that strategy games are the most profitable. And so you might think, oh great, I'm going to make a strategy game and get rich. Remember what I said about the, uh, the balance between an average and the median? Well, this is where this math comes into play. So the top game in the category back in 2016 was Clash of Clans, and over $2 million a day in revenue. Well then, if you look at the 50th percentile, which is pretty good, you might squeeze out $150 a day. Well, you could almost make a living on that maybe if you were just, uh, had no expenses. And then if you look below, you have the 20th percentile. In other words, the games that are probably the ones that you and I are going to publish, they average $0. And so they might not even get downloaded. Another category that would be useful for you to experiment with if you're trying to get into the app market is this lifestyle category. Now for the life of me, when I look at the apps that are in the lifestyle category, I don't really see the theme. What is lifestyle mean anyway? I mean, there's realtor apps and there's Tinder and Pinterest and it seems to me like 
baby monitors and eHarmony don't have a lot as far as the commonality of how the app works. And so uh, whatever, whatever this category means, it, it's, it's something that affects your life. So fitness apps is something I can understand. What does a fitness app gain? That's pretty good. You can see that this graph here shows the top 200 fitness apps on their daily revenue. So whoever the first guy is, he's making $45,000 a day. You could make a living at that one. And the average is 1,500. So once again, let's take a look at the, the median score rather than the uh, averages. So the 50th percentile, once again, zero. So expect that if, you're, if you don't have a billion dollar company backing you up, you're probably gonna have that zero number. So when you look at averages, you should probably just ignore them because they are not going to tell you anything about you and your experience at all. Take a look here. This is probably Strava. So this would be a typical winning home run app. Everyone seems to like this one. So you can track yourself, you can analyze your workouts and share with friends and make connections. So a great tool and it seems to be clicking with everybody that is into exercise. And so that would be one of the better lifestyle apps that I can think of. So the key of a lifestyle app is to find something that people do and make it so that it works really well for meeting their needs. Another category that is really useful, and this one actually where you can sell things, is the utility category. So what's a utility? Well, a utility is something that enhances the operating system or does some kind of a task for you. So for instance, this one here is going to figure out where your empty spaces are and make your, uh, make your phone work better. So a utility could be any of these on these, this category list here. So you can see that things such as adding fonts, for some reason Chrome is considered a, a category of a utility. Uh, I would think of you know, things that make your phone work better, things that encrypt your data, things that uh, make your spam calls go away, those are good utilities. And so anything that would enhance your operating system would fit in the utility category. A close relative of that is the productivity category. And so people are usually willing to pay for productivity if they're going to have something useful. So these are some of the most commonly used things, some of the services that people would use on a regular basis. So Dropbox, cloud storage, uh, note-taking, uh, Microsoft Office, uh, any kind of tool that is going to make your job work better. And so productivity apps are something that you can probably come up with as well. Do you have a problem? Do you have something that you're trying to work on? Do you have a note-taking app? Do you have some kind of a scorecard? Do you work with uh, pictures? Uh, what, what, what does your utility need to do? And uh, if you can find a winning solution, you can see that sometimes we can actually charge people. Now, utility apps is probably the one place where you don't want to put ads. Uh, ads are annoying, of course. Even people that play games don't even like the ads, even though they get spammed with them all the time. But especially, don't put it in a utility app. Uh, your utility is supposed to save you time, not annoy you. And so try to come up with a way that you can give them the free version and then go to the freemium model so that way they uh, like their experience. A category called shopping, of course, is going to be dominated by the big people such as Amazon and Walmart. But you don't have to, once again, compete directly against them. I mean, you're not going to come up with Carfax. That's like just not going to happen, right? But what you can do is think about that strategy of augment rather than compete because people are going to be using their phones to make purchases so if all you need to do is make recommendations for pur purchases and then send them to somewhere to buy such as if you're a, working with an affiliate program on a store then really you have taken a cut you've taken the slice and you can make a living if you have enough people looking at your ad and making a decision so some kind of a price comparison now, news and information, another category that has a lot of variety in it. So if you look here, you can see that some of these are actual people that make news, such as the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post. Once again, good luck in trying to compete against an established newspaper. What can you do? Well, take a look at um, Police Scanner, for example. What they're doing is they're taking existing data and they're packaging it in a way that the user can see it. Other things such as 
your news aggregators. So if you could come up with an app that is able to predict what the user is interested in, you look at their habits and see what stories they read, you can give them more stories that would be similar and you can probably make their news reading experience better. And so you don't have to be a reporter, you don't have to own the newspaper, you just have to be able to organize the data and deliver it to the user. Now here's a good category. If you've got a specialty of what you know and you want to share it, go with education. So education could be anything like language learning or math. Those seem to be the two that are like the leading categories. Uh, Coursera is something that obviously you're not going to compete with. If you've ever looked at Coursera, it's like universities across the world publish uh, entire courses and Coursera is just publishing those in a nice format. But if you have some special content, uh, you might be able to sell it. So for instance, let's say you're an expert uh, guitar player. You could offer guitar lessons with your app. Or if you're going to help people learn reading, or maybe English is a second language, or if they just need to learn how to do a hobby, do they need to learn how to ride their bike, play ping pong, or they need to learn how to fix their car, or they need to fix an air conditioner. I mean, education is really what we hit the internet for. And if you've got an app that can make it work, then you've got yourself a market. So here's a page that I thought was very handy for figuring out what kind of categories you want to compete in. So this is Kickstarter, and I'm looking at the page called Apps that were recently funded. And so these are idea pages where you can think about what people are building now that really are not big yet. And so there's room for uh, competition, obviously, if these people are successful. So you notice the first one that's on here? It's called Fluent Forever. It's a learning education app. Uh, look at here, the next one called Seed Time, the fastest way to plan your garden, kind of a utility. Uh, free photo prints, that one looks like more of a business than it is an app. Uh, you can see that we got scripture listening, uh, we got uh, learning to code, so two educational apps here. So I would, I would go through this and just get ideas from who else is out there that is at pretty young stage in their in their life of their company and you might find some ideas that can help you trigger what might work for you. So here's a list of the top uh, educational category apps right now and you can see that um, we've got a few things that are doing math and language. It seems that's a pretty popular one. So let's sum up here what we're trying to learn. So perhaps the best lesson is if you're trying to pick a category for building an app and choosing the idea that works for you then go for this first principle. Pick something you know a lot about. Because if you're trying to solve somebody else's problem, um, that might work, but it's going to take some very careful research and interviews, and you're probably going to have to walk in the other person's shoes for a while. But if you've already got an idea, you've already got a problem, you already got a field that you're good at, then you know a lot of the things that you need to do. Principle number two. Make sure that instead of focusing on which app is going to earn the most money, think of it maybe as which app can I build that will make people super happy with my product. I'm going to make something that people love to use. And then you can figure out the money later. And so that's maybe the best uh, principle for which order you think in. And part number three, if you have a mega category such as social media, and you know you're never going to replace Amazon or Facebook, then what can you do? What you can do is create an app that can make the experience slightly better for the user. And so those principles here are going to help you in which category you want to choose to build your app. One of the jobs that you have to do if your app's going to be successful is identify a problem that people have. And so check out this video that helps you do that. The second thing is, you need to be able to identify the user that you're trying to serve with precision. You know exactly who's going to use your ad. So check one of these two videos out for the next step in learning the business of apps.
Hey, welcome back to the Business of Applications. In this course, we're studying some of the motives and some of the design that you would do if you are building an application. So we're in the first part of the course still. We're talking about the motivations for an app, but as you can see, there are other course items that are coming. So stick around, and if you want to see them all, make sure that you subscribe. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach application development at Grand Canyon University. So let's get into this subject today. So we are trying to find a problem to solve. That's pretty much fundamental when it comes to designing an application. You have to ask yourself, what's the motives? Why are you doing it? And in this video, we're going to talk about some strategies that you can do to discover problems that people have and how you can solve them. Here's the principle of what we're trying to present here in just one sentence, that an idea that does not fulfill a need is really not a business opportunity. So you've got a great app, but nobody cares, you might as well not even build it. So here is a analogy that has been used in many different uh, situations like this when you talk about coming up with a need for an app. So are you selling candy? Are you selling vitamins? Or are you selling painkillers? So let's talk about what that means, because we're obviously not selling any of these, but we're using them as an analogy. So Kevin Fong gets credit for this uh, analogy here. So he's an entrepreneur from Silicon Valley, and uh, this is his quote. So he says, we divide business plans into three categories, candy, vitamins, and painkillers. So he dismisses candy as just junk. It's um, things that we just discard without much thought. Uh, we look at vitamins. We know that they're good for us, but don't really use them on a regular basis. And he says, we really like painkillers. Now, when he says we, he's talking about the venture funding people. These are the angel investors. These are the people you need to talk to to get money to make your business work. And if he says we really like painkillers, he says you must have a problem uh, identified and uh, people are willing to pay you for it. And then he says we especially like addictive painkillers. And so painkillers are the products that you can't live without. So let's look at each of these categories individually. So uh, a, a piece of candy is something that is perhaps what you would call a game app, something that's cool, it's fun. It could be a fad and disappears quickly. And so that's the danger of, of, a, of a fun app. So I know it's fun, I'm wasting my time, but I like it. So have you ever played cri Trivia Crack? <laughs> yeah, I played it too. It came and went like within months. Maybe you're not the right age group to remember it, but it was certainly a piece of candy. It was fun. They probably made a lot of money, but it didn't stick around. Uh, how about this one, though? Clash of Clans? Uh, that certainly is candy. It's kind of eye candy. It's fun to play with. Uh, just recently, I checked the stats on it, and they made $20 million last month in revenue. So even though candy can be a fad, if you sell really good candy, you're going to sell a lot of it. Uh, here's the idea of vitamins, though. Uh, if you look at a feature or an app and you say this about it, you say, that's a really cool idea. I could probably use it. I mean, you can justify it and say it's, it's nice and all, but you might forget about it. Uh, you say it's good and then it doesn't stick around. So for instance, I have the Amazon uh, Echo, um, Alexa in our house. Uh, they, they bought it for my birthday and it's fun to play with, right? So I can say, Alexa, play some music. And then off in the distance. Classical station based on your listening history. There on she Amazon goes. She's music. Starting. Alexa, stop. Just a minute. I'll be right back. Okay, so I consider Alexa to be fun. Uh, but, you know, if you took her away from me, I could probably still do life just fine. So she's convenient to yell at, to argue at, and to have you tell some jokes. But really, she's, in my case, she's a vitamin. She's nice to have. Now, the painkillers, though, are a different situation. So when you say this, when you say, something's wrong, I need this now. Here's my credit card. And by the way, what did it cost? That means that you've got a product that suits a need so well that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be covered with customers. People are going to come to you asking when they can sign up. And so sales are really easy, and it's probably an addictive app because if people really want to pay you that much, they're going to. So I looked at my computer and I thought, what are the apps that I 
must use. I can't live without. And pretty much anything that is made by Google seems to fit this category. So for instance, could you live without a good search engine? Can you find your way around without maps? Can you find stores? Can you locate things? Can you send and receive email without thinking about Gmail? Really, those three are pretty successful. Now, Microsoft has Office, which has pretty much become the default standard for any kind of the utilities that I work with. Uh, I know there's free alternatives, but Office seems to just come back all the time. For instance, right now, you're looking at a PowerPoint presentation. I've certainly tried to get rid of PowerPoint, but I keep coming back to it. So the idea is that you want to have a solution that is addictive and people cannot live without. So that's really what a painkiller. So here's a nice quote that says, once we come to depend on a tool, nothing else will do. And so you've come up with a good painkiller solution for your app. If you can build this app, you're gonna be rich, you're gonna have many, many users. But you can see that sometimes apps fit into multiple categories. So let's talk about Facebook. Is Facebook to you a piece of candy? Is it a vitamin, kind of nice to have? Or is it a painkiller? So look at the first guy, obviously on the top row, he's bored. And to him, Facebook is as good as playing a video game. So he might just pass the time. And then the second one is perhaps this mother here, who is probably more dependent on Facebook. Uh, she's talking to her friends, she's scheduling meetings, she's finding out what's going on. But look at the grandma down in the bottom. She is isolated, she's far away, she lives alone. To her, having Facebook or Zoom or any kind of social media, to her is a painkiller. It is something that she must have. And so I, I certainly have visiting friends that are like this, have discovered their dependence on it. Uh, you know, they ask me for technical help to say, I, I, gotta have my, I gotta have my app. This is the only way I stay in touch with my friends. And so Facebook would like to be the painkiller for us all. Uh, for me, it kind of fits somewhere in the uh, nice to have category. I honestly don't check it very often. So a single product can be different things to different people. And so don't just judge your product based on one person's opinion. So here is another way to find out if you're solving the problem. Think about higher needs rather than the immediate need of your program. What does that mean? So for instance, our higher needs are things like we have a desire for fulfillment, or you might say we have a desire for belonging. That's certainly a higher need. And these are strong needs, a need for recognition. I mean, look, I'm checking how many people are subscribed to my channel. What in the world is the need here? So YouTube is solving a need for me that I hate to admit, but I'm getting recognition through this tool. How about security? Security, financial security, security in your relationships, security of your home, physical security, uh, security of your job, future. And so sometimes products can help us with needs that are just as basic as food and water. Now, here's a way to find out really what people's motives are. This is a, uh, a, a technique that was used in the Toyota Motor Company, and probably still today. It's called the five whys. And the idea is that you ask a bunch of whys to find out really what's at the bottom of somebody's request. And so it requires literal digging, digging into their mind and into their psyche. So you define the issue by asking the question, why, five times. You say, why is this happening? And they give you an answer. And then you say, why is that? And then you ask them again, why is that? And then finally, when you get to the maybe about the fourth or fifth level, there's really no specific number, but somewhere down there, you're going to find that there is a stronger reason than the one that was first given to you. So in the case of Toyota, they ask questions like, um, why did the production line stop? And then the, the, the answer is, well, we ran out of parts. And then they ask, well, why did we run out of parts? Well, the, the manager uh, refused to order uh, extra supplies. And you say, why is that? Well, he was trying to do lean manufacturing and he didn't want to spend the money on uh, excess inventory. Well, why is that? Well, our stock price is getting hit because we have not used our money efficiently. And so you can see that there's reasons behind why the production line may have stopped. 
And so then they can address those bigger reasons if they can identify the whys behind it. Now, when we talk about a product, we do the same thing. So we would come up with different solutions depending on how the user responds. So let's say we want to build an application that produces recipes. Now, what kind of recipes do we want? Do we want ethnic recipes? Do we want home cooked? Do we want quick? Do we want diet? So all of those questions are going to be asked at the, uh, at the panel you might have of users and your interviews. And so let's ask this. So somebody does respond to you in a request for your um, information to say, hey, I'm, I'm building an app that's going to do recipes. And you say you need to make them or you need to use them. So why is that? And so the person says, well, I'd like to eat healthier. Well, don't just stop there. You say, why do you want to eat healthier? Well, I want to live longer. Uh, okay, so <laughs> why do you want to live longer? Well, that's pretty obvious. I want to see my grandchildren. Okay, so why is that important to you? Why do you want to see your grandchildren? Are they not annoying enough already when they're visiting you? And she says, family is important to me. So there is a value at the bottom of this thing about I want recipes. And really, what this person says is I want food to bring my family together. So that's a pretty powerful need, isn't it? And so if we're building an app to serve this person, we would have maybe a slogan, right? This on the left side, it says the right food brings family together. Now that sells to this person in particular. But we might ask the same question and get different results. So we might have to slant our advertising or the design of our app to this. The right food can make you pretty. So listen to this question. So this person says, I want new recipes. Okay, why is that? Well, I want to lose weight. <laughs> okay, why do you want to lose weight? I'm 30 pounds overweight. Okay, why are you overweight? I eat when I feel bad. I think I do anyway. And then why is that? Because people laugh at me often. So these are obviously getting into some sensitive areas too. And so if we can provide something to help an, uh, a person overcome their deep emotional problems, then we've got a painkiller app. So the right food can make you pretty. I don't know, maybe that's a lame way to advertise it, but if we can make a product that will help people lose weight, not just to get thin, but to be liked, then you've got yourself a painkiller app. How about this one? The right food can help you get ahead. So same recipe app, but we've got a different motive going on now. So this next interview, the person says to us, I want new recipes. And so we ask, why? Then they say, I only have 30 minutes to cook. Okay, why are you in such a hurry? I work full time. Okay, don't stop there, ask again. Why do you work full time? Well, I want more money. Okay, obviously what you have isn't enough, so why do you need more? Because wealth is a status to me. And so the conclusion is, Time is money, right? So I want more time. I want my food preparation to take little time. I've got bigger things to do. I've got bigger fish to fry. And so we could advertise the convenience of these recipes as well. So now we've got ourselves, we've got these different types of opinions. And remember, the goal here of the video is to teach you how to identify the problem you're trying to solve. So if your solution is build an app for recipes and you talk to a variety of people, you might find that your initial reason or what you thought was the reason for the app is not actually the reason of what your users say. So I love my family. I feel ugly. I'm very busy. These are all reasons that are being input into your why you want to make your recipe app. So if you do some research and you talk to a bunch of people and you start to hear the same things over and over, then you start to make conclusions about who we're going to serve, who's the first person on our list of, of things that we want. So most of the people that we, let's say, we talk to are saying, uh, I want to find healthy food. And so comfort and quick and easy were not the highest priorities. So the next steps for us would be to build an app or at least to design the features about identifying the nutrition, about maybe the, uh, the benefits for the food that you're eating, 
and how it can affect your health. So in this scenario that I just set out to you, you would obviously then fixate on healthy food and why that works. So if you'd like some more information about how to discover that niche where your app can suit a need that no one else is meeting, take a look at the next video about finding a niche. If you'd like to take a look at all of the videos in this course about building apps and the business of apps, then take a look at this playlist here. And make sure you subscribe and join me for class next time. Thank you. Hey, welcome back to the Business of Applications. This is a series of videos that I'm working with my class on how to make your business thrive using applications. And so this is a seven part series and we're in part one right now, which is about the motivations of building an app. But you can see that there are other chapters that we're going to cover here. So if you like what you're seeing here, make sure you subscribe. My name is Shad Sluter and I'm a professor of computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. So please join my class here as we learn the business of apps. So in this video, we're talking about the idea of finding a niche in the market. And so since it's probably pretty hard to compete against the really big mega apps, we need to find something that makes sense for you. And so there's some strategies in this video for making your product work. So let's talk about a product niche. What's inside of it? Well, when you think of a niche in nature, you think of something where there is little competition. And so that's what we're trying to find here in your market is to see where there is unmet needs. Also, make sure that there is a market. So you might have a great idea because nobody else is doing it, but there's a good reason. It's because nobody wants it. And so you have to find an overlap here between what people want, what's not being met, and then also it would be nice to make some money to be able to pay for your app and so where these three intersect, we would find a niche. Now, these are obviously hidden because if that was a problem that everyone knew about, then there would be an app in that niche already. And so what we're trying to do is figure out where you can find your niche. Now, the word niche usually comes from biology. So when you think of a place where an animal lives, where there are few competitors and that is able to thrive. And so that is the idea of finding somewhere where no one will bother you. And so if you think of the dung beetle, this is a great example of a niche where nobody seems to want all the dung that's rolling around on the savanna in Africa, except for these beetles. And they've got it all to themselves. So if your business is collecting dung, then there aren't a lot of competition for you. So here's what it looks like in the market. So if you hear somebody say, we are the Uber of, or we are the Amazon of, You've got this mega leader in the category and you are trying to do similar things but in a smaller category. So here's an example. So this was what something I found on Reddit in the uh, app ideas uh, thread. So TaskRabbit is one of those uh, service apps where you can find somebody that's willing to work on something that you're willing to pay for and then TaskRabbit takes a cut. And so they said, hey, there's an unmet need here, a personal beauty care, and so perhaps this is an idea. Wow, that's an idea. So maybe you could develop it. It would take an entire business, of course, but get started. So one way that you can find a niche is to see if there are new areas opening up that weren't there before. And so that's called following the trends. So if you were to just do Google Trends, you can find what's going on month by month, day by day, or maybe over a longer period of time, such as what people are searching for in the year. Uh, so for instance, 2020 was uh, a year where these were the items that were trending. They didn't appear before and then they showed up. So maybe you could come up with an idea that way. More than likely, most of these are just ideas that are in the media. So what's a better way for finding a trending use pattern for mobile apps? So I did some Google searching to find out what trends are happening in mobile applications in general. So look at here, here's a four trends that are shaping 2020. So this deals with technology. So the first trend is they see that PCs are still in place. Um, and what's the next one here? Number two, wearable ownership is growing. Oh, okay, so there's an opportunity. Do you want to make something with a watch or glasses? So it looks like that's on the trend upward. How about this one? The smart home market is growing. 
So connecting your devices, that's kind of an IoT thing. So is there an app opportunity there? So I know for sure that in the Canyon Ventures uh, section of the university where I teach, there are companies that are in this market. Uh, what did you say Canyon Ventures was? It's the entrepreneur startup section where businesses come and recruit students to work for them. So these are new companies and they're growing. So smart home market is uh, one thing that I've noticed that was over there. Let's see what else is here. Gaming gear is busy. Well, 2020 was the year of the pandemic and so gaming was a major major growth area. So maybe those are some things that you could uh, find as trends. So Google places like this to see if you can learn something about what's coming. So here's another site that I found that had something about trends and mobile development. So here we got 15 of them. Let's see if there's anything that we could follow as a trend. Here's the trend that says IoT is growing. So application integration looks like the trend is going to continue off into the future. Uh, apps for foldable devices. Oh, I don't have a foldable device, but maybe that's on the future. Uh, 5G. Can you take an app and uh, take advantage of faster internet connectivity? How about number four? Uh, wearable devices. Hmm, that sounds like a previous uh, blog item that we saw before. Uh, beacon technology. So beacon technology. What in the world is that? Uh, it looks like we can have um, down here a description that says uh, clients install this app and when they go near another place where there's a beacon, they get a notification. I'm kind of skeptical that that will actually be a trend. I really don't want people annoying me any more than they are, but hey, they say it is. Uh, mobile commerce, well, that's kind of like a given. Artificial intelligence, okay, so that's pretty much a good trend. Mobile wallets, uh, augmented reality, I would bet on this one as a trend. And let's see, chat bots, uh, superior app security. I'll vote for that one. Uh, predictive analysis, so that way we can have more AI. And then on-demand mobile apps. I kind of like that. So the idea is do some research, figure out what the trends are, and then see if you can come up with something that is going to fill a niche before everyone else jumps in on it. Here's another idea. If you can find an app or a process or a game or something that exists and add a feature to it, add a twist and make it yours. So here's an example, uh, Words with Friends. It's, it's really just uh, Scrabble, but then it's added the multiplayer dimension to it, uh, some social media, and you've got yourself an app that is still very strong and popular. Uh, then you could also say, well, Maybe Words with Friends just took a regular board game, but you could also go look around at apps that you know exist. So you look at one app and you look at another app and you think, hmm, there's some overlap between those. What are the features that I could do? So if I could combine app A and B, then I get what's called the twist. And so you can invent a new app based on what you've already seen others do. So really that's what a lot of inventions are. It's just combining two other people's ideas into your own. So there's hardly anything that's actually original. Here's an example of combining two apps. So Waze, uh, you haven't used Waze. It's basically a map like Google Maps and it allows you to talk to other drivers. So you can plant a little pin on the map that says, hey, there's a police waiting here to give you a ticket. And so essentially what they've done is take Google Maps and they've added some social media and enhancement to it and kind of made it a, a gamification so you can win points by taking trips. Uh, whoever thought that driving would be that much fun. But anyway, Waze was purchased by Google for probably billions of dollars. And so it was a successful spinoff of just the standard driving app. Now, if you're trying to find a niche, then maybe the most obvious advice of all is do your own thing. What that means is, do you have a specialty, a need that you have to fill yourself? There's not an app that exists for, to do what you want to do. For example, here's an, a fill your own need item. Uh, just a quick glance at this shows me somebody came up with a brilliant idea to fix an annoying problem. So this is a magnetic wrist. And so it's just a, a Velcro strap that goes around your wrist and with magnetic plates in it. And you can glue all your, your nuts and bolts and screws and drill heads and even the pencil. So you've got yourself something like a pocket, but very much accessible, a one-handed use pocket. And so what a great idea. This person came up 
with a simple solution to a problem that annoys almost all of us. So I can see this as an invention for someone on their own needs, but then quickly spreads to everybody else. So what app would you build to fix a problem that you have and then only worry about finding customers later? Because if you like it, more than likely somebody else will. So if you're trying to find a niche, then think about improving what's already out there. So take a look at the landscape and see if you can fix it. So when you compare competitors, you're going to find features that are similar to apps that you would like to build. But is there somebody that has an app that is missing a feature? Or you see it in the user comments, uh, for instance, in the reviews in the app store. If only this app would. That is like free market research for you if you read through those comments and see what people would like the app to do that it doesn't. And so you find a gap there. It's called a niche. Also, you would find if people are being annoyed. So if advertising is becoming the best way for a certain app to make money, you can guarantee the users are going to be annoyed. Maybe you could come up with a replacement for it. You can sneak in on market share. And then you can figure out later how you can be the annoying advertiser. How about this? If you're looking for competitors, are you competing against Microsoft or Google? Or are you competing against a single programmer or a small team? So that'll tell you a lot about what your competition is up to. So uh, there's only infinite resources at Google and Microsoft. So don't even bother if you're trying to reinvent Google Maps. Now, also think about updates. If you look in the App Store, you're going to see that uh, some people build their app and then forget about it. So has it been five years since they've updated it? There is a niche. You could probably just walk right in, do an update to the current ad, and you can start picking off users. How about poor ratings? That's a pretty obvious sign that there's opportunities here. People have a need that is not being met. And there's your competition, red flag, to say, I'm going to step in here and fix a problem that people feel. But what happens if you look at your competition and they have good ratings? Well, that just tells you that it's free market research as well. That tells you what people like. And if you build a similar app, you better make sure that some of those features are for you. So back to words with friends. So if this is one of the most popular games in the world, then tell me this. When I look at the reviews, why in the world are all the reviews currently showing up as one star? And you look at it, it's all about the ads and about how annoying the program is to work with. And so people want to play this game, but they really don't like to play this version of the game. There's a niche. They're opening the door for competition. Uh, here's another one. I've actually paid for this uh, app uh, many years ago because I wanted to have a good pl place to show podcasts. And so I probably wouldn't buy the app today because if you look here, you can see that most of the users are annoyed with it. Uh, every time they do an update, something breaks. And so I don't know if a podcast manager is really a good app anymore because uh, Apple and Google have pretty much taken care of that need right in their operating system. But if you wanted to build one, this one here would certainly be a good competitor to try to beat. So do your research. Come up with a chart and go through... Um, a bunch of competitors that you find that are similar to the app that you have in mind. And so you just put down a chart to compare. What's their popularity? What's their notable features? How do they monetize themselves? What's their company size? When did they last do their update? And what kind of reviews are they getting? And so when you have a comparison chart here, you're going to see perhaps opportunities arise. So this might become a large spreadsheet as you mine the data to find what you want. So make sure that when you're doing your comparisons that you're not trying to compete against the monster companies. Do similar apps that are about the same size and complexity as what you're doing. Learn from what they do well and then see if there are some opportunities where they leave the door open. So that's your ideal. So where are you going to find this information? So uh, for Beyond Pod, I did a search there at Sensor Tower. And uh, for this app, you can see that it's kind of a mm, meh, C minus grade. So what's the competition for what you're trying to build? Go look at their ratings, go look in their app store, and then check them out here on Sensor Tower to see if there are opportunities for you to take advantage of. So that's some advice for how to do a niche. 
Now the next stage is to get some users together or potential users and ask them a lot of questions. It's called listening to the user. And so check this video out to see some advice on how you can do that well. If you'd like to see the entire playlist for all the lessons on the business of apps, then I'll put it here as a playlist. Hi, and welcome back to the Business of Applications. This is a course where we talk about the business of planning, designing, marketing your application. So we're in the middle of a class that has a several sections. We're in part one right now, which is on a, the motivations for building an app. So we're identifying the problem and our users and trying to come up with what fits in the market. You can see that there are other topics that are coming up. So make sure that you subscribe if this kind of thing is interesting to you. My name is Shad Sluter and I teach software development at Grand Canyon University. So please join us for class and tell us what you're doing. Now, what we're going to do in this video here is talk about the elevator pitch, or you might call it listening to your users. So you're trying to talk to real people about an idea you have to see if it actually is grounded in reality. So here is what a lot of people would do in their elevator pitch. So when you, an elevator pitch is usually about getting a job or trying to sell your business. And you've got about 30 seconds. And so here's your goal. State what the problem is, tease with a solution, and then tell them how you can add value. So here's an example of an elevator pitch. So you might say, the problem is we have a process that currently takes our employees about 30 minutes to accomplish. And we can make that better if we put some software in place. As a matter of fact, my value proposition is that you can reduce this task to just four minutes. Are you interested? And of course, 30 minutes to four minutes sounds like a great value proposition. So that's kind of the idea that you want to do when you're selling your app. In one sentence, you can describe what your app does and why people should pay you for it. So what you should do then is you should probably have some kind of a prototype or at least drawings or something that you can show users. Give them the 30 second pitch about what it does. Have them look at it and then Honestly, watch them. Don't try to argue with them. Just see what they say. You've got yourself a maybe a one minute time frame window to get their first initial reactions, which are probably accurate, and then take the lessons with humility and uh, either throw away your idea or modify it or run with it if people seem to like it. So don't worry about your idea being stolen. Uh, ideas are cheap. Everyone has a great idea, but it takes a lot of work to make an app. And so if you have an idea without any execution, you've got nothing. And so the App Store has a, a lot of people that put work into it. They don't have ideas in the App Store. So like I mentioned, be humble and be open. So feedback is going to come in various ways. If you show your prototype or your, your idea to somebody and they just are kind of confused, means you're probably lacking clarity. Or if they say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen, don't argue with them. Uh, just see if more people tell you that it's really that dumb. However, if you get a few good reactions like this one, keep moving because of course your mom is gonna think it's great. Uh, your friends might be a little bit uh, yeah, critical for you, but strangers, see if you can get some people to evaluate it objectively and if you can get some positive ideas then maybe you're on to something. So speaking of ideas, go to Reddit. There's a whole Reddit subreddit on app ideas. And here is where you can read about other people's ideas and post your own to see if there's some feedback. So you can go ahead and steal right here because as I said, ideas are cheap, execution is everything. So post your ideas or go look for ideas. So make sure that you get the uh, process in order. So this here is what some people would plan for their order of operations. Uh, they would say, I'm gonna create this great app and I'm sure there are customers out there which will then lead me to make some money. So unfortunately, this is probably a failure. Uh, you gotta find this in a different order. So start it this way. Find the customers, give them an idea of what you're going to build. So build something very simple or at least draw some pictures that don't take a lot of time investment. Once you have the users that are going to tell you, yeah, I think this is going to work, then you can go ahead and work on building something great. And then following that, you'll have the money. So the next critical step in building your application 
is to make a user profile. How to find the ideal person. You have to be very specific. So check out the video here on targeting the ideal user. And if you want to see the entire playlist, I'll post this here as the link as well. So keep watching with me and subscribe and thank you. Hi, welcome to the Business of Applications. In this series of videos, we're talking about how you can take a product and turn it into an app. So the business part here has got several topics, and we're in part one right now, which is about the motivations for your app. And so we're going to get to the others, but so if you're interested in building a application and knowing how the strategies work, we're looking at best practices for all of these topics. So make sure you subscribe. So my name is Shad Sluter, and I teach software development at Grand Canyon University. And so I'm inviting you to come to class and get an A-plus education. So in this video, we are talking about a task called Know Your Primary User. And so knowing your users is one of the most important things that you can do early on in the development of a product or service. So having a very targeted user is going to make you an effective person for how you design your product and how you interact with your people. A piece of advice is make sure that you have a narrow enough focus about who your customer is so that you can say, I have at least 100 true fans instead of a lot of publicity from people who really don't even care. So the goal of this video here would be for you to have identified who the person is that is most likely going to buy your app or use your service. And so you can literally come up with a profile of the age, the type of work they do, how much money they have, what kind of hobbies they would do, what bothers them. And so if you have all these relevant things targeted, then your job of finding out what your product is supposed to do will become easier. So one of the questions might be, can you just invent this profile? Or should you check to see if they exist in the real world? And so trying to find out if these customers exist in the wild is part of the strategy here. So one way that you can actually do some experiments to find this out and verify your assumptions is to create what I would call a coming soon page. So here's an example. So let's say you have a great business idea. We're going to call it Teak Tech. And the idea is that we are serving freelance uh, businesses, so single employees that are trying to make a living. And so this doesn't exist. It's just a vaporware, you might call it. But we would advertise with a website like this to describe what our features are. And we would uh, post uh, Google ads to see if we can get people that are searching for our type of service. And if they click it, they would be brought here. And if they are willing to enter their email and ask to be put on a waiting list for when your service launches, then you've got some data that you can compare with. How many people click the ad? How many people see your product and actually sign up? Or how many people just bail and go away? So these are great ways to do experiments with limited amounts of money, no software development, and you can find out if your ideas are actually going to work in the real world. Here's another one, GoBlog. So GoBlog is in the works, it says. Uh, we're going to have a blogging community for people who are passionate about everything. So uh, this obviously exists already, but we're going to see if people are willing to sign up for our service. And so you have a, a landing page like this. Here's another one. So uh, here is a more of a long-term one. So I have somebody that is trying to get paid. It says, get jobs, get them done, get paid with Workweek. And do you have a small service? Uh, Workweek is all about getting your paperwork out of the way. Does this sound interesting? Would you pay for this service? If so, go ahead and sign up. So you can find out if people are interested. Now, also, this is a nice uh, mailing list because if you actually do launch your product, maybe a year from now, you're going to have a whole bunch of people that are actually willing to download your app on the very first day, which helps a lot with the Google services. Here's another one here. So a design and prototyping tool. So we can take a look at uh, 
tools to build apps. So you might be the target audience on this one. So we can build prototypes without coding. Uh, here's the list of features. It looks like it'd be a great service. So be the first to get on the list and get this installed on your phone. If you're interested, go ahead and subscribe. And if you're ready for this, we're ready for you. So make sure that you can get some feedback about real world situations. So putting a landing page out there is one way. Now check your assumptions because you are probably convinced that your app is great, but that's not the right answer. You need to find out if other people are feeling the same way. So conduct interviews, start with your friends, your family, work with people that you meet and ask them these questions. So how do you currently do activity X? So for instance, how do you currently manage your freelance operations? That would be a good question from one of the examples we just looked at. Uh, do you like your current process? If so, tell me about it. If not, what would make it better? And then I show you the solution. And here is the screenshots. This is the outline. This is what I think will happen. Do you think this would help you? And then please explain. And so this is a great way to verify that people would buy into your app. And hopefully you have honest feedback to say, nah, or yeah. And so then you've got something actionable. So where are you going to conduct these interviews? Where are you going to find people that are willing to talk to you? Hopefully you have some targeted spots. Well, you can start online. So I did a quick search here for um, uh, some comment reviews on YouTube. So you could publish a YouTube video talking about your service. You could sell ads to get people to watch it and then ask for comments to say, is this a great idea? Would you pay for it? So here's an example. So Apple just launched the purple iPhone. Now, my opinion of it was, seriously, Apple has billions of dollars and brilliant engineers and the best upgrade they could come up with was purple. However, looking at the uh, comments of this YouTube, I can see that uh, there's a lot of positive feedback. Now, I don't know, are those people that were hired by Apple to go out and uh, provide some good feedback or are these actual users? So that's unknown. But anyway, there's some feedback that you could use as some research. Uh, here's another. Go to Reddit and sign up for the thread called App Ideas. And you can post your idea. People can tell you whether it's a good idea or not. Or you might discover some other people's ideas. Now, this specific idea I kind of liked. Um, have an app that uses GPS to track your walking or running or cycling miles. And instead of just showing you the map, overlay it against a, a fiction map such as Middle Earth and you can see how much progress you make on a daily basis before you get to Mount Doom. And so you could do other maps, uh, fantasy places. So you could go to Narnia or Middle Earth or you could have people crossing other continents. Uh, you could climb Mount Everest if you were doing a stair-stepping app. And so you could have people set goals and have some fun doing it. So this app doesn't exist. Uh, it got 38 upvotes, it looks like. So apparently someone thinks it's a good idea. So you could go there. Uh, how about this? You could just come up with your own web page. Just say, I'm going to launch this and start to advertise it and get feedback from people. So it might cost you a few dollars to set one up, but you're going to have more information before you actually start spending the real money about building your app. Here's a great way to get user feedback in your own town. So Meetup is a nice app and website where you can find special interest groups in your community. So I've certainly found a bunch here in Phoenix, where I live, about software development. And everybody at the meeting is looking for a job or they have interests in finding other people that are doing the same thing that they are. And it never fails that people go there to learn from each other. So we learn about who the companies are that they work for. You learn about new software. You learn about new techniques. And this is a great spot where you could do informal interviews when you got a drink in your hand and you're just talking to people and trying to pitch your idea, getting the feedback that you need. Uh, show it to your friends. Show it to your family. Show it to coworkers. Show it to anybody that would give you the time and watch what they do. So you can see their feedback, whether it's confusion, disbelief, or maybe you've got some good ideas in there. So refine your idea based on what they tell you. 
If you got some money, you can have other people do your reset search for you, such as Mintel. So you can see that they will sell you a report from anywhere from 2000 to it looks like about $5,000. And they will actually do market research about trends. About Here it says families in the UK, what they're doing, uh, health and wellness in China. So you can find your report here, and if you've got the money, you can save yourself a lot of time. So they'll tell you if people are willing and how willing they are to spend their money on certain things. Uh, here's an example from Mintel. So about research in the United States. So what people are doing with insurance. And for $4,500, you can answer that question. So if you've got the money, you can save the time. So here's an, another example of Mintel's market research. It says here, HBO Now users are twice as likely from any other streaming service to cancel their subscription when a specific show ends. Okay, so if you were trying to do market research for streaming services, uh, you would want to know what did Minta or what did uh, HBO do that causes people to leave them so easily, and what do other people do that makes them sticky, and so you can gain insights and adjust your plans for your own product with uh, results like this. Here's a, a great way to conduct your interviews. First of all, listen. You're there to learn because the expert in the conversation is the customer. You are trying to gather data. You have a proposal and your, your whole goal is here is to experiment and test it and see if it is as valuable as you think it is. And if it's not, you want to know why. So understand what their problem is. So your solution might not be quite right, but if you could tweak it, it would be the right product for them. Show them a prototype to see if concretely uh, it matches what they believe. So showing a prototype is a lot better than just explaining an idea. The more specific and graphic and concrete you can make it, the better they'll understand you. Then get a reaction. So listen for suggestions. See if they're confused. See if they're blasé. Uh, you can measure pretty much on scales of 1 to 10 uh, what they feel like and actually give them that opportunity to rate what they believe with a number. And so these interviews then are going to provide you with a lot of good data. Another way to do this is to conduct what's called focus groups. And so you can bring people in and provide them uh, benefits such as money or a good meal and just ask them questions. So people will sometimes give you their time if you make it worth their while. You can also hire these focus research groups from other companies that do surveys. And uh, I don't know if I would find them as a great value or not. I think you'd probably have a good experience of doing it yourself and uh, spend similar amounts of money. But I know that they're out there. So if you want to do focus groups, you can get some more information. So let's take a look at an app that I, that I said I used. Uh, in a previous video, I said I used uh, All Trails. What would an interview look like if they were coming up with the plan? And so they look at me. I'm a hiker. I'm a backpacker. And they ask me these questions. So they would say, currently, how do you find good places to hike? And I would say, I read magazines. I look at Google Images. I look at the map. I watch Instagram. And then I try to go from there. But I really don't know if I'm finding anything good or not until I actually show up. So how does that work for you? The information is usually incomplete. I must make a guess. And so I would like it if there were actual more concrete uh, suggestions. So what features do you like in our solution? Well, I would say I'd like to have photos of the, the hike, the park where I go to. I want to see what the National Park Trail looks like. I want to have actual reviews from people that hiked it. Maybe just a week ago, is there snow on the trail or is the bridge out? Uh, those kind of informational uh, tidbits are really important on user reviews. So to me, it looks like they did their homework. They, they found their ideal users and then they asked them these questions and they incorporated exactly what was needed. And so like I, I mentioned earlier in another video, I pay them money on a yearly basis, which is kind of painful because I don't like to pay for software. But in this case, it's very well worth my time. Uh, here's another application that I purchased. So some time ago, I was a math teacher and I was doing tutoring on the side. And so I was helping people do their high school trigonometry, uh, their calculus. 
And uh, one tool that I kept buying for my students was Wolfram Alpha, a strange name, but it is the ultimate graphing calculator. It can solve problems and show you visual solutions. And so if you ask, how do you currently solve math problems? I use pencil and paper. I use inflection points and vertexes, and it's tedious. I will pay you whatever it takes because you are you are creating a solution that, that solves a painful problem for me. And so a lot of my uh, students paid for this on their own uh, based on my recommendation. So they obviously know their audience as well. That's my point here, is that they did their focus groups, they did their user interviews, and they met exactly what the users wanted. Now here's what's going to happen then. So you do these interviews, and uh, you're going to have what you think then is a pretty good idea of what people want. And so you must do these because if you have this we will build it and they will come attitude, if you think that way, you might spend a lot of time and effort when they won't come. Now, this I think this comes from Field of Dreams, the movie where, uh, was it Kevin Costner decided to put a baseball diamond in the middle of a cornfield? And uh, he said, if we build it, they will come. And of course, it's a horrible marketing strategy. Uh, if you build it, they might come. So make sure that you verify your assumptions with interviews and tests. Uh, pay for the Google ads if you have to. Pay for the interviews because the money you invest will be well worth it. And so what you're standing on right now is the left side of the cliff. You are looking at what current data is. You have... Uh, other models to follow. You have businesses that you can imitate. You have track records and history. But what you're trying to get to is this vision to say, I'm pretty sure they'll come. And so before you take that leap, try to close the gap by verifying things. Let me give you an example of a company that did exactly that. So Zappos, owned now by Amazon, was a startup company some years ago that wanted to sell shoes online. So they had an interesting problem. They didn't know if people would actually buy shoes online. So instead of building an entire distribution system, they started a website and advertised some shoes at the current competitive retail price. And they said, buy shoes from us. And so people would fill in the form and click buy. And they would get an email. So how did they fulfill their orders? Well, amazingly, Zappos literally went to the store where the shoes were sold. So they went to their local department store, bought the shoes, went to the post office, and mailed them. And of course, it was a huge loss. They took money to buy the shoes, and the postage was completely uh, an expense right out of their pocket, as well as the time and effort. But their point wasn't to make money selling those shoes. Their point was to prove to themselves that people were willing to buy shoes in the mail. And the experiment worked. And of course, Zappos is worth quite a bit of money today. And they're owned by Amazon. And so what you want to do then is to verify who your user is and whether he or she is willing to use your product. And if it doesn't match, then you can abandon the idea without spending too much money, or you can adjust your idea so it fits exactly what your users need. The next step is to figure out how to design the perfect application. And so that's the next video. And then if you want to see the rest of the videos in this course, then check a, take a look at the playlist here, and you can follow along on some of the other topics. So thanks for watching, and welcome to class. Hi, welcome back to the business of apps. This is a series of videos that I'm doing with my class right now about the business process and the design of building an app. And so you can see all the different uh, topics that we're talking about here. So we're in topic one right now, which is the motivations for building an app. And what I'm going to do is give you an activity. So if you're in my classroom, I would actually assign this and grade it to you. If you're just watching along, then take a look at what I think you should do next. So what I'd like to assign is something to listen to about Airbnb and Lyft. 
So these are obviously two uh, mobile applications that are very successful, leaders in their world. So the first is an interview with the founder of uh, Airbnb. So this appears on a radio program for NPR called How I Built This. And so it's a very interesting interview that talks about the uh, story behind how the business Airbnb came into existence. So this doesn't really show a direct line from point A to B for this business plan. Uh, at the time, it seemed very strange. Why would anyone want to stay in a stranger's home? And why would you let anyone come in and sleep in your living room? And so how did they create a new business model that has now uh, control of more um, hotel rooms than any other hotel company in the world? The second interview is also from How I Built This, and this one comes from Lyft, which is also a mobile application, and they grew from a campus uh, ride-sharing service into uh, an Uber-like company, uh, the greatest competition that Uber has, really. And so with these two different interviews, I'm going to ask you to take a look at five questions. And so, if, like I said, if you're in my class, I'm going to ask you to write these out. So the first one is... After you hear these two people talk, I want you to answer the question, what is the core business of Airbnb and Lyft? Each of them have a different core business, obviously. But what I'm trying to distinguish here is that the app itself is just a means to an end. And so if you're thinking about app development and growing it into a business, um, think in reverse, maybe. And so ask yourself, what does Airbnb do and why do they need an app to do it? Second question. How does the mobile app enable them to function? Could they do it without the app? Could they do it without computers? And is there anything secret about it that would make that success? And so they had to do it at this time and no other to become in the business that they are. Also, think about a wider scope. So what besides the website or the mobile app does this company need to provide successful service to their, comp to their uh, clients? Um, so do they need people to answer the phone? Do they need quality assurance? Do they need salespeople? Do they, do they need uh, drivers? Do they, what, what do they need to make their business run? And so if you are thinking about, I'm going to build an app business, look at these two examples that are clearly app businesses and think of how much else they have to do besides create code and a website. And then here's another one. So besides mobile apps, how else do they communicate with their customers? So the mobile app, I think, is central, but what other services do they do? And then finally, why are these two companies successful? Uh, literally, you could build either one of these apps as a semester project. In one of my classes, you could learn all the technical things about programming the interface, putting the database together, scaling it even on the cloud, but yet you wouldn't have Airbnb or Lyft when you're done. You would have an app with no users. And so how did they go from the app stage to millions of users stage? What was the secret? What was the uh, process that they followed? What were the challenges that they, they faced? And so what I'd like you to do in this activity then is to consider these five and then also consider your own project. So likely you have something floating around in your brain, don't you? I mean, you've, we've all got an app that we would like to make. And so I'd like you to then take a look at these same questions and apply them to what you're working on now or what you're dreaming about now. And so using Airbnb and Lyft as case studies, we can learn a lot about our own selves and perhaps if we have that in our future. If you're interested in looking at the motives for how to build an application and some of the questions you have to ask before you even code, then I have a video to check out here. Also, if you'd like to look at the entire playlist for the business of mobile applications, then take a look at the link that's here. And thanks for watching and please subscribe. Hi, welcome to the business of building apps. In this video, we're going to talk about an assignment that I'm going to give you if you were one of the students in my class. So the business of building apps has several chapters, and we're here in chapter one, which is about the motivations for building an app. So we're going to call this assignment activity 1.2. And so what we're trying to do here is examine the current 
marketplace of applications and see if there's any results that we could glean from the market and where there might be opportunities for you to build an app. So the first thing we're going to do is look at App Annie. So I'd like you to go to this address and look at the top apps. Um, what we're looking for are trends or for any gleanings of information about what makes an app successful. Or if it is so unlikely that we are going to succeed against them to see if there are any opportunities where we could find something that we might be able to compete against. So for instance, you're probably not going to replace Minecraft or YouTube or Roblox as you see here. But if we look down the list, we might see some opportunities. So a second source of information that I want you to examine is here at Sensor Tower. And so you can see that it looks like the same kind of a organization where we have the top apps for each category. So you can look at games and fitness and other different categories. But if you look on the left side, Sensor Tower provides more information than App Annie does. So you can examine the details of a single app. You can compare in this section called App Intelligence to know more about it. And so for example here, Clash of Clans, we get some drill down detail on when they made their money and how much uh, activity they see. Do we see any trends seasonally? So if you're trying to compete against Clash of Clans, this is obviously is an important report. Uh, we're trying to think of our own app though, that's, that's the goal of this course, is we're starting to form our own opinions about what our app can do and who our customers are. And so Clash of Clans probably isn't one that you want to compare directly against, but find a competitor that you are probably going head to head with and see what kind of results they have and maybe you can glean some information there. So Statistica, this is another website that can give us insights into mobile apps. And so I went to their webpage and picked a current uh, report that was here that says total value of global consumers uh, spending on mobile, on mobile apps in the fourth quarter of 2020. So obviously we see a kind of a gradual trend and then suddenly there is this massive jump. Something happened. What do you suppose that might have been? So what, what we're doing right now is we're just looking at raw data and reports and I'm going to ask you in this assignment to draw some conclusions. So here's what we're going to conclude. I want you to provide several statements, at least three, of the market in general. So where would you find some opportunities? That's really the uh, market research here. Looking at what's going on with trends and where would you find yourself something that can lead to success or failure. So it's an open-ended assignment here. You are now a business analyst. You're not just a programmer or you're not just answering questions out of a textbook. What I want you to do is pretend that I'm your boss, right? And I look at you and I say, find me a market opportunity. Go look at the competitors. See where things are moving. What is opening up to us? And where could we possibly enter? And so really that's a very high level kind of a question to say, analyze and compare and make predictions. So you're not in high school anymore. We're trying to make you a business analyst. So the conclusions that I want you to do are things that might look like this. So we're going to say these top X apps accounted for 80% of all downloads. So what would that do for your manager? Well, it would tell us that there is some very dominant players in that segment. Or we might have a different kind of a, a observation. So looking at our category, so we'll call it category X, looking at our type of app that we're considering building, there is no clear market leader. And so therefore you would tell your boss, I think we've got a chance to become that market leader. There's nobody yet that has dominated that space. Or we might say, category X, our category, has increased in user downloads by a massive percentage in the last 12 months. Or contrary, you might say, what we were thinking of doing, online donut ordering is actually not something that people care about and it's falling in the last 12 months. I don't know what the statistics will be. You're the one that's going to do the research and find that out. How about this? We, um, we found a new emerging leader. So App X recently created an entirely new category, something that is unique and it is growing rapidly. So we could probably tag along with them maybe and see if there's an opportunity to become maybe second or third in that category and compete.
Or how about this? You might find a conclusion that says X percent of apps get less than Y per downloads per month. So there's some category that we were considering, but we realize nobody cares about. There's hardly anyone downloading there, so maybe that is your conclusion. How about this one? We could find a different conclusion that says only X companies account for 80% of downloads, similar to number one. And then similar, we might have another dominant leader at the bottom that says there's only a few apps that are collecting all the money or new apps account for percent of some total monthly downloads. So the conclusions that you draw here are not something that I can tell you exactly what the right ones are. So that's what market researchers do is they try to find the needle in the haystack. And so those are called market study conclusions. So when you're done with that, it's a better idea to present something to your boss in a summarized graph. So this is where Excel comes in, where you can create pie charts and line charts and trends, and, and you, can, you can visualize your statements very easily. And then finally, I'm going to ask you to do a summarize. So write a paragraph to answer the following question, to say, what category should I compete in if I were to build an application? Really, that's the conclusion. That's the whole point of all this research, is we're trying to find an opportunity out there in the market. So if we've got several opportunities, that would be great, and we can consider options A, B, and C. But that's your goal here. So for the deliverables, I want you to create a one-page document, and you're going to embed a chart, and I want you to tell me where the opportunities are. If I were your boss and you were the business analyst, what should we be doing? What opportunities should we pursue? So if you're one of my students, I will evaluate you on how well you can write and how well you can draw conclusions from a wide variety of sets of data. I will put a link here so that you can see the rest of the course material and then see some background on how we came up with this. Also, if, if you're not one of my students, then feel free to put these kind of conclusions in the comments below and everyone else can evaluate your work based on the YouTube commenting system. Thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. In this video, we're going to talk about an assignment that I would give you if you were in my class. So this is a course about building apps and the business plans that go with them. So we're in number one, which is chapters about motivations for building an app. And so that's what the activity will be. So we'll call this activity or assignment 1.3. So the third one that I'm going to grade you on if you were in my class. So this activity is going to be about writing down the details of a plan. So a plan for building an app and building a business. So what I want you to do first is think about problems that would be able to be solved with a business solution. So this is where we're going to be writing in just a minute. So background information here is to think about how other apps are solving problems. For instance, how to find a hotel room quickly. That's a business problem. Or how to save money while grocery shopping. That is also addressing a business problem. Or maybe how to visit a destination using a virtual tour guide. Maybe not so much business as just tourism, but the idea is that each one of these could have an app that would be the solution to this person's issue. So then what I want you to think about then are the personal interests that you have or the problems that you face in your own work. Those are currently things that are bothering you. Those are often the best kinds of solutions that you can invent. And so that's where I'm going to have you think. So what I want you to do is to think of a product idea. Hopefully you've already got one that's been brewing in the dreams of your head. Uh, an idea, and we're going to write about it in six different paragraphs. So first of all, I'm going to say, identify what problem exists for the ideal user. So we're thinking about what they call a persona. Somebody that fits the mold. Somebody that fits the profile of who would buy your app. And so what problem do they have? Tell me that. That's your first paragraph. The second is more about that ideal user. So the ideal user is, you're going to tell me their age range, you're going to tell me their gender, what hobbies they have or where they work, why they fit this category. 
What things do they do on a frequent basis? What preferences do they have? Do they have strong political beliefs? Do they have certain practices, such as are they an environmentalist or are they a, a gun activist? Or where are they in the education world? Uh, you know, those kind of uh, demographics and uh, ideas that kind of categorize people. So then the next question is, and you're going, you're going to write this paragraph, is what do you do in your app that will solve a specific problem that this person experiences? So we're doing the profile, and now we're coming up with a solution. So what does the app look like? So here's, we're making a, an, an app plan, right? So your solution then is going to be, what does your app have for screens, the wireframes? What, what, you know, what's the navigation? How do you get from the title screen to the first screen and so on? And then I'm going to ask you, what competition currently exists for your app? So you've done some market research, right? Who are the people that already have a solution that is like yours or adjacent to yours? Something that is a competitor. And then what do you propose will be your distinguishing characteristics? What makes you different? Why is your app slightly better? And so in six paragraphs, you're going to give me a business plan, essentially. Why your app makes sense and who it makes sense for. So then what I want you to do then is after you've written up this document, you don't just turn it in and say, I'm done. I want you to take this and actually do some real world interviews. I want you to get some user feedback. And so you can go talk to your friends or your family, or if you don't have friends or family, you can post it on Reddit or somewhere and get some user interviews. What I want you to do is to describe your app. You're going to show them the problem. You're going to show them the wireframe or whatever you've got for pictures and then you're going to get the reaction. So you're going to give them open-ended questions. So in your interview, you ask your mom, tell me what you like about this product. Maybe your mom's not the best person because she'll just say, I love everything that you do. So tell it to one of your friends. What do you like about the product and what do you think it's lacking? What would you change about it? Did I get close to what your solutions are? Do you care about this? And if you do, what would you make in a difference? On a scale of one to 10 then, how likely are you to use the app if it were available today? And of course, maybe a follow-up question is, would you be willing to pay for it? And so that is your user interviews. So what you're going to conclude then from these user interviews is one, you've either got a great idea or two, you'll get a gigantic yawn and people will ignore you. So the summary that I want you to get from that is, who did you interview? And why did you choose them? And then finally, what did you learn? Did you get anything from them? Because you thought you were the expert when you started this process, but you quickly learn that you are the student. The real experts are the, the potential users. And so what did you learn after you presented your ideas to them? So then part three then, we've created a plan for part one. Part two, we've shared it with a few people. And now we're going to do uh, plan B, you might call it. And sometimes that's the best thing you can do is figure out what doesn't quite work. So based on the feedback that you received, I want you then to write what you d would modify. What features would you need to add or people didn't care about? What modifications would make your app better? Conduct new interviews then. So you can go back to the same people or find somebody similar and see if there's a different response then after your uh, suggestions were implemented. And then finally, I want you to re record any of the insights that you learned from these people. So this is somewhat of a big writing assignment, isn't it? Not only do you have to write, but you have to talk to people and figure out what they want. So then for the deliverables, this is what I want you to submit to me. I want you to write a three to five word page Word document that describes the ideal app idea, uh, what your user is, what did you put in for the features, what suggestions did you incorporate from your users, and what did you learn from these interviews? And so if I were to grade you, I would base your uh, grade based on not only how you write, but how thorough you were, and how well you learned and listened to your users. So really that's the goal here when you're designing an app, 
is to conform it to what the users want rather than your own preconceived notions. So if you'd like to see the entire playlist for this course, I'll post that here. And if you're not in my class, then you can feel free to put these assignments in the comments here and let the YouTube comment system do your grading for you. And you can comment on other users too and based on what they think their app ideas are. So thanks for watching and make sure that you subscribe. Hi, and welcome back to the course that we're teaching right now called the Business of Building Applications. So we're talking about mobile applications and the process of design and running your business. So you can see that we are in several different units of study right now, and we're on the second one, which is called Designing an Effective App. However, there's a lot more material here, so if you would like to take a look at some of these others, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and watch along. My name is Shad Sluder, and I'm a professor of software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University. And so the course that we're working right now is called Building Apps and the Business of Design. So in this video, we're talking about the features that you would put into an early version of your app, perhaps the first version of your app. So application design includes these four topics that we're gonna see in the next few videos. So we're talking about the first one right now, which is which features should you put in there? The user interface answers the question of what does your app look like? The UX or the user experience is how is the user experiencing the entrance, the actual flow of your app, the uh, product delivery and things like that. So the experience is the overall feel. And then finally we have what's called the MVP, which is called the minimal viable product. And so getting your app to market involves making some very strategic decisions about how it looks like, how your users experience it, and how much you spend on the early development stages. So taking a look from Google, we have some advice for what users think about what makes their application valuable. So the question is, what users find most valuable about their favorite apps? And so if you're designing, make sure that you focus in on these key features. So number one on the list, they're easy to use and navigate. I suppose if you get that rule right, you've probably made almost all of the right decisions. Uh, there's always something new to explore. That's number two. And so in a future video, we're going to talk about making your apps addictive or a nicer way of saying increasing user loyalty. And so we'll be addressing that in its own topic. And so then you can see down the rest of them, uh, they drop off quickly. But the first one is probably the most important, getting your app easy to use and navigation. And so that's what this video and the next few are all about. So we are in this process. Let's get context of where we are. So in earlier videos, we talked about the problem that we're trying to solve, identifying a solution to a known need. Number two is finding our niche. And so looking at the competition and finding a place where we're going to succeed and the competition won't crush us. And now we're into this third one here about figuring out what user features are really important and which ones can wait till later and uh, balancing the user needs and the costs. And then finally, the user interface and the experience is where we're going today. So the question is, if you've got a list of nice things that your users want you to create, which ones are you going to prioritize? So you don't want to create what's called a Frankenstein app where it has every feature and nobody cares about it. You want to address what matters the most. So one way to do this is to take a look at your competition, uh, apps that are similar to what you're trying to develop, and compare what they have. So earlier we looked in another video about the uh, opportunity here about an app called Words with Friends. One of the biggest apps that you've uh, probably seen in the games. And we found a, 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 a surprising discovery here. If you look at the reviews, currently they're receiving mostly one-star reviews because of one single problem. They're advertising. So they're annoying their users. Even though it's a free app, people will still expect a good experience. And so if you're looking at building an app and you have a similar review problem in the App Store, Take close note of that because you don't want to make sure that you do the same mistake. How about this? Uh, is there an opportunity here? So I remember at one time it was kind of a joke to put on your resume that I'm a, a, an application designer for Craigslist or I am a CSS expert for Craigslist. It's almost like a friend of mine who was a 
architect for the Aldi's grocery store. And if you know anything about Aldi's, they pretty much look like Craigslist. They're a warehouse where they just throw boxes on pallets and expect people to shop there. And so there, is there an opportunity here? Craigslist was so dominant. Well, there is. Um, I have certainly use OfferUp. It's Craigslist, but with a good user interface. And you've got yourself less spam going on. You've got less corruption. Uh, you've got a great communication tool. The browsing and the the video, uh, the, the pictures are good. Um, I haven't used Craigslist since. Now, here's what you want to do then. If you're looking for some kind of an opportunity like that, whether it's you're trying to kill Craigslist or Words with Friends or likely some other app that you're targeting right now, think of what you guys have in common. So your proposed app and what the competition does. That overlap we'll call analogies. And you want to check to see if the user experience is good in those areas. And if so, then don't be afraid to copy it. I mean, certainly, every time Snapchat or TikTok comes off with something cool, uh, Instagram is not afraid to copy exactly what they see there because we don't want to lose out on what's actually working. Now, what the competition does and what you choose to leave out, we could call the anti-log, that would be the anti-analogy. And if they are doing something wrong, make sure you leave that part of it out and, and make your app somewhat unique. And so that way you take the best and leave what they don't want. So let me give you an example. Um, so here is something I found on Reddit where a person was doing some research and uh, their research involved comparing different weather apps that are available. So you can see that this uh, Reddit thread is Android apps. So this person is talking about designing their own weather app. And they did the research to find out who's out there and what they can do. So you can see they created a table and they have all of the different uh, currently uh, published apps out there. They talk about the weather providers, the number of uh, widgets that are out there, the uh, hourly temperatures and all the features. And so they go right through everybody's uh, competition and come up with a pretty good chart to know what is available now. So if you were to try to get into this crowded market and build the better weather app, you'd probably want to look at this chart very carefully and see which features are working, which ones that are really important to the users, and which ones are just complete add-ons or even annoying. And so you can tell that the research here is done with quite a bit of time and effort. Also, in the typical Reddit fashion, there's all kinds of very honest reviews and feedback about people that talk about which app they use and which ones they don't like and what works. And even in some cases, you can talk directly to the developer here in one of the apps. And so do something similar to this if you are anticipating creating a list of features. So once you get yourself a little bit of competition and you make a table like this, then it's time to identify the main features of your application. Let's say you're going to build a social app, so something along the lines of Facebook or Instagram. And so you're going to put down the user stories or different tasks or different abilities that your app will feature. So for instance, one feature of your app would be to say users will create an account using current Google or Facebook password. You put it on a sticky note so that way you can move it around. Users will be able to set up a profile. That's another action that the users will do. The main part of your app, of course, is post a public message with a video or photo or browse other people's posts and maybe comment on them, able to write things or put a like. And so this is pretty typical social media things. Now, you put these together and you start to see the number of hours of work adding up. And so it's time to prioritize which of these features are going into your app. By the way, there's nothing really unique on this app. So what do you have that is the twist? What is the unique feature or value proposition? And that should probably show up in one of your posts. So once you have most of the main features, then you want to be able to put them into categories. And so a user experience should have some kind of a cycle or process that they follow through. And as well, you should probably think about which parts of your application have good amounts of these features and which don't. So think of the first problem called activation. So which features help you activate your app? Or how do users find you? You better have a feature in there. Acquisition means how do you onboard the users? Get them from a interested party, a curious party, to somebody that's registered and somebody who is an active user. 
Then the retention part is what is the main point of your application? It better be interesting. It better be engaging. It better be entertaining. It, it better be useful. There's something there that is the main reason that people came. Now, this is the main course. And now then you get to the point where you say, I want my app to grow. So there should be some kind of a way to refer others, whether you invite them to play a game with you or to share a photo or to at least uh, get some kind of another download from another user. And then lastly, perhaps somewhere in here, there should be a monetization. So either you ask the users to pay you money or you show them an ad or some kind of a way that you can do a cut of business. And so monetization can fit in one of these categories. So let's give an example here. So if we're talking about our social app, we would probably say our activation comes because a friend invited you to respond to a picture. And then the next step is the acquisition. So as you have to log into the account, you're invited to create your own profile. And then you're hopefully going to respond. You're going to either play the game with them or you're going to read the post or put a comment on it. And then hopefully you share a picture and invite somebody else to look at it. And then the cycle repeats. And once again, make sure that there's some kind of a way to make a monetization play here. So show an ad. That seems to be a pretty typical thing for social media. Now, ads aren't always great, but they're pretty typical as a solution. So this is our feature map with the objectives. So let's put in here the first one, which was activation. So the users will create an account. So they're going to use Google or Facebook password. So activation, we've got that one covered. We also have, they will be able to set up a profile. So we'll put that in that column. Retention means what are we doing that creates actual value or entertainment to the, stu to the people that are here. And so posting a public message with a photo or video would fit. We can also browse other people's items. And so we have an interesting activity going on. That's retention. And then we have the ability to write. Now you might be able to say, is that... Is that part of the retention or that might fit into referral? So maybe one of those two categories would fit. Now I've got some gaps though because I've only created two columns and I have three empty ones. So I might start to say, well, let's add some new features that I hadn't actually thought of because we're not covering all the bases. So we have a new feature called share a picture with a friend with either a phone message or an email. And so that clearly fits in the referral category. Well, we don't have monetization and acquisition filled in yet, so what are we going to do there? Well, how are we going to monetize? Well, maybe people have a, a desire to promote their photo or their picture. Or if we were doing some kind of a job posting, we could, pro we could uh, promote your, uh, your resume or something that people are willing to pay for for other people to notice. And so we'll put that into the monetization category. Here's another one. Notify the user when your post has been liked. Oh, we all want to know that three people have seen our video, and so we'll put that into the retention area. So that's interesting. How about this? Generate a web page. So how are we going to get people to look at our images? How are we going to invite them into the app? Well, you can rely on people inviting other friends. That's one way to do it. Or in this strategy, we would create deep links. And so if somebody is posting about a picture or a subject about something that would be hit in Google searches, uh, a place, a geography place, or an event, or a celebrity, or something, then we can ha hopefully get a few people that are doing uh, web searches with Google, and we pick up them through web pages. So then you've probably mapped out most of the columns by now, and you have the basic features of your application. Now, the, the point of this video is to try to focus on limiting your desire to fill everything. In the first stages of building an application, you want to do what's called a minimal viable product. You don't want to have the entire thing developed because that's expensive and it's still untested. So what we're trying to avoid is a Frankenstein app. So Frankenstein, of course, is the movie or the story of building a monster out of body parts. And this actually is a photo from experiments that were done in the 1700s of using body parts with electricity. So the danger of creating too many f features is that you have created things that your users don't actually need. So let me refer you to a good blog post on the subject. So uh, beware of feature overload, a case study. And so even though this was written some years ago, it's still very uh, applicable today. So I wanted to capture this picture here. So live chat was this person's company communication tool. 
And the point of putting it on the blog was to talk about how bad the user interface was, how many features that they've tried to crowd in on one item. So look up close here. We've got ourselves um, every feature possible. And to the software developer, it makes total sense. They've got everything there. But for you and me that have never seen the app before, uh, it's a little overwhelming. Where do we start? Uh, what feature is most important? And when you're trying to onboard somebody, the goal is to leave them basically one option, <laughs> just the one option that they need to do next, and hide the other features until they've become a little more proficient with the app. And so this is, I don't know if you could call it a Frankenstein app, but it's certainly overwhelming. Now, if we scroll down a bit, they came up with another version of the same tool. Now, this one here is called Live Chat, and it certainly presents a whole lot fewer options. I assume all the, all the features are still there. You can probably find them if you click the right menu, and then you're looking for those features. But if you're trying to scare away your users with overwhelming uh, amounts of choice, uh, then the first version is your goal. So you can see down here, the uh, conclusion is the lesson learned. Product teams should learn to say no. And that's the point of the video that I'm telling you here, is that when you're picking your features for your first version of your application, pick only the ones that are absolutely critical and simplify your app. So let's do a summary of what we talked about so far. So that for the features that you're going to include in your app, make sure that you have them proven to be necessary. You've already done your interviews with your users and they've told you what they think is the most critical parts of the service. And so make sure that you include those. Also, you might want to include things that are fairly easy to develop so that you don't invest a lot of time and money. And so really what you're developing then is considered the minimal viable product or MVP. And we'll talk about that in a later video. So once you've identified the features, it's now time to create the user interface. And so if you want to look at that, the next video in the series is exactly about how you can create an effective user interface. If you want to see the entire list of course material, then take a look here at the playlist that's in the other link. So thank you for watching and welcome aboard. Hey, welcome back to the business of building apps. This is a course that will help you create apps and the business of making sure that this is a profitable business for you. So in this course, we're talking about seven or eight different categories. So we're in item number two right now, which is about designing an app. But as you can see, there are other chapters and other topics that we need to cover. And so if you'd like to see some of these, make sure that you subscribe and watch the others. My name is Shad Sluter and I'm a professor of software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University. And so welcome to class and please join us for others. So in this, we are talking about application design. And so really those are four questions about how your app's going to look. First of all, which features are we going to choose? Second, what the app looks like. Third, what's the experience of the user? And finally, what goes into creating a minimal viable product? or the MVP. And so we're here in section two. If you haven't seen the others, please look at the other items in the playlist for this course. So what does the app look like is what we're asking today. And what that question is, is what is the user interface going to be? What are the principles of design and how do you make an effective user interface? And so to answer that question, we need to talk about a process called onboarding. So onboarding is a way to turn a novice or completely ignorant person about your application into somebody who is a minimal user, somebody who is adopting your program. So onboarding sounds exactly like what it's, it's talking about getting on a ship. And so let's think about the process of a uh, cruise company and adopting users into their system. So you're the cruise client, you're going on vacation and you show up at the boat. What are the questions that you would have when you get to the dock. The questions are gonna be things like immediate needs. Where's my room? Does my key work? Or where do I put my suitcases? So if you're trying to onboard a customer in this situation, you better make sure that these questions are answered. Don't shove a menu in their face or give them a plan for how they're going to get off and do tours at the first island. Those are for later. And so once people get installed into their room and they got their first cup of coffee and they start to feel comfortable, what are their next questions going to be? They're going to say, what's the Wi-Fi password? Or 
when is supper, or what entertainment is happening on the ship. And so these are questions that you would present to the user when they get to this stage. And so you might have a piece of paper or a poster in the room or some kind of a guide on an app or whatever. You're going to guide them through the process of onboarding. And so you want to do the same thing with your applications. And so don't present them with all of the features of your user interface at the beginning. Just give them one or maybe two options and make it so obvious that they always choose the most logical thing. So only show the most urgent and essential features of your starting screen. And in our case, since we're starting a brand new app, maybe that's the only features that are in your app. And so your user interface makes sure that the essential features are obvious and super easy to adopt. So perhaps one of the best examples of making things obvious is Google. No wonder they're a good search company. Well, they give good searches, but there's really only one thing to do here. Uh, you have a search item and you have this other, I'm feeling lucky. I don't even know why they still have that there. I've never clicked it other than the first experimental time. But anyway, they're pretty simple. They've got a great user interface. Now consider what they used to compete against. Uh, Yahoo was really the only other viable choice for search engines. And what in the world are we supposed to do here? So if you knew what you were after when you started Yahoo, you probably hit the search bar. But they've got so many other distractions going on. Am I supposed to download a toolbar? Well, no thanks on that one. Am I supposed to browse news? Am I supposed to get weather? And there were a lot of choices. And I think the strategy was, let's just give every kind of idea possible to our users and increase uh, interactivity there. Instead of focusing on one really good thing, such as search, uh, they tried the buffet approach. And other than giving away all of their user data in a data breach, uh, Yahoo just was completely defeated by Google for a number of reasons. So don't be Yahoo when you're trying to create an app. So it's fun to hate people. So let's go take a look at another one that I would like to criticize. So this is Adobe Illustrator. Uh, Photoshop and Illustrator are like the dominant tools for design and graphic arts. So I consider myself you know, somewhat proficient in both of these. Uh, I teach them in school. But the one thing that always bothers me is, ironically, the tool used to design user interfaces and choose layouts and wireframes in itself is a horrible example of a user interface. As you can see, if I want to select a color, there are multiple ways to get to that. And so Adobe apparently thought that multiple ways is a good thing. And the users have flexibility. You can even, uh, you can even customize the user interface so that only you understand it. And everyone else that looks at your computer is completely baffled. Uh, and so this is a, an example of succeeding in spite of having a bad product. And so what do these icons do? If you look at these Photoshop icons, you can see that they have some kind of a purpose. And then you click and hold on them. For goodness sakes, who would have ever thought of that? You click and do a long click on them and you get more menus that pop out beneath them. The only way you can know what these are is either to have a YouTube video from some 14 year old that's gonna demonstrate the, the process for you or take a class. What software requires you to take a class, in other words, to become a user? That's just telling me that there's way better solutions that could be done. Uh, take a look at, here's another example, uh, how to export a file. So I choose export, and now I'm it's presented with what, a dozen different things to export in different ways? Please help us. This should be a dialog box. And so Adobe, ironically, has the market on all of this. Here's their layers palette. So what are you supposed to do here? What is kind, normal? Uh, what is going on with these little icons at the bottom? Some of these are effects, some are browsing folders. It's, an, it's a complete overwhelming experience for a new user. Now, if you're already an Adobe user and you know all these features, you're probably proud of the fact that you've mastered the program. Well, good for you. For the rest of us though, we want to have something simpler. So what is this thing? This is Sketch. So a competitor that does a lot of complex things. To be fair, Photoshop and Illustrator are complicated programs. They do very sophisticated things. But there are better alternatives out there 
basically because of their user interface and user experience. They have all the features, but presented in a much more uh, straightforward manner. How many people actually need to read the manual for Sketch? What a contrast to what there is for Adobe products. <laughs> Here's another one that I picked up. Uh, this, is what ha this is what happens when you let developers build the user interface. So check this one out. Uh, what in the world are we supposed to do here? How many checkboxes do we need? Every one of these should be hidden away in, a, in another separate section where it shows up only when we need it to be. And so if you're a developer, don't take offense. There are people out there better than us. I, I consider myself a developer. There are people out there that are better than us at user interface design. And so it might be worth your time or money to get some advice and uh, at least get some plans from a user interface uh, perspective before you go ahead and develop your first vision. So here's the design order of what we're trying to create. So let's get some context here. So first of all, we picked out what our user needs are. We figured out which features are going to meet those needs. And now we're on creating the views. So every feature that you create has to have some kind of a screen to go with it, the view. And then finally, we'll get to the navigation at a later point. So let's talk about some of the UI elements that are going to make your app effective. Some best practices. So this is just the, the 10 minute version of a, an entire uh, profession. So a mobile application should have some consistency. You should probably have something as a, the typical app. So don't try to get too creative on your user interface here. Make sure that you have a bottom toolbar and a top toolbar where users can see the same thing on each screen. So separate the functionality, each feature that you're trying to do have its own screen. So don't try to create the monster screen with uh, 50 different check marks and different menus that you can pick from. Separate the tasks and put each task into its own view. And now you need to imitate and say, look at the favorite apps that you already use and know and you admire and just copy their design, their, their plan. So some people say that user interface is like a joke. What does that mean? It means if you have to explain it, you probably did it wrong. So I pulled up some examples of people who are designing user interfaces. So there's two things going on here. First of all, the user interface is each screen that is going to be in the app. And the second part, maybe we're getting a little ahead of ourselves, but it's closely related, is how they relate to each other. So that's the user experience, the navigation essentially. And so what you want to do then is before you write code, just draw pictures. So you can do it as this was a pen and paper, uh, obviously not too sophisticated, or you can get other tools that are actually nice to draw with and look like professional graphics. Uh, here's another example of a, an app that's going to be a diet app for your pet. And so the, the, the motive for the app is that healthy food is best provided to your pet by creating your own food in the kitchen. And so this app will help you create recipes, share them, and uh, be able to uh, improve the health of your pet. So every screen here represents a different task that's going to be done in the app. And then of course we can see the navigation between them. Here's another example of a project that somebody's working on. This is called the Time Bank app. And so it's a time management. So you can literally budget the amount of time that you plan to do on each task and for each calendar day. And you can borrow time from the bank. And then when you run out of time, you stop working on that task and go to another one. So I don't know if I would use this app myself, but it's certainly a novel idea. And for some people, this might be just what they need. But the point here I'm showing you is that this person has thought about each task that the user plans to do. And they've drawn it out in a very nice uh, pencil and paper format and then shown the navigation between them. And so you can see the link here, it's from Flickr, and you can find out if this uh, process is going to work for you. So let me recommend to you a resource. Uh, I like the title of the book. It's probably just worth that in itself. Don't make me think. And the idea is that user interface is supposed to be obvious. And so what are some of the things that Steve would recommend that you would do to make a user app? So extra credit reading for you. Go check it out. So along the lines of creating a, a good mobile experience, uh, think about the thumb. So as you design your screens, the top left corner of the screen is hard to reach with a, a right-handed person for sure. 
And how in the world are you going to put the main navigation menu in the top left corner if you are actually thinking about this? So consider someone riding a bicycle and trying to select a new podcast item. Where are you going to put the button? They're going to have to stop their bike and use two hands if you put it in the upper left corner. So user interface is about knowing who your users are and when they're going to use your app. So fortunately, Google and Apple, the two main mobile application companies, have not left us in the dark. They've given us some pretty straightforward advice. So check out their human interface guidelines. And so I'm going to just scroll through here to show that they've got very good principles outlined here. And so they're basically stealing every lecture that I'm going to provide to you. So I'm just going to point you to them. And you can see that there is an entire book worth of material here to figure out how to do branding and colors and typography and how to use icons and navigation. So really, this is the resource that you should be looking for if you're building a mobile app for Apple. So Google has done the same favor for us with their Android documentation. So this is a developer page. And you can see that they have an entire book's worth of how to make a good Android app based on the principles of design. And so you can see that they have an entire course worth of material here to follow. So run from me now and go to the experts at either Apple or Google to see what they have to say. I can't believe I just told somebody to stop watching my videos, but uh, go ahead and check them out and see if you can learn something about basic design from the experts. So let's assume that you're not a very good designer. Well, you can just buy templates that are pretty good. They've already designed many of the features that you're probably thinking of. So find a site like this. So here is a, a design template for somebody who has a book app. And so you can see that there are screens to show you individual books and how to browse for books. What else do they have? Let's scroll down until we get to the next one. So if you're into a cooking application, so recipes likely, we've got ourselves an entire UI layout for most of the screens that you can imagine for cooking. Education, so 19 screens here. You get the idea. So each different type of app that you're going to see has got a template. So it's probably worth spending some money here or somewhere else where you can buy a full template and user design already designed for you. And all you have to do is adapt it to the specific uh, details of your app. So taking the time or investment to create a good user interface will help you in several ways. First of all, think about who you're designing for. Number one, you have a good idea for yourself of what the final product will look like. And not only you, but potential investors and partners are going to have a concrete image in their mind of what your app is. Also, if you hire a developer then, and they have a great user interface to start with, they're not going to have to make any decisions or inventions that is not in their area of expertise. And so developers are good at creating something if they've already got a pattern to follow. And so investing in user design is a great way to start. The next phase of the design process is to talk about user experience. And so check out the next video here about the flow and experience of a user in your app. Also, if you'd like to see the entire playlist for this, this course series, then check out the next link, which is a playlist of all of them. So thanks for watching and welcome to class. Hi, welcome to the business of building applications. In this course, we're exploring the business process of design and developing an application in a mobile field. So as you can see, we're in several different chapters of a course. So we're in section two right now, which is about designing an application. However, there are other sections that we're going to explore in other videos. So if you haven't subscribed, please do that now, and then you can join us for all of this material if this interests you. My name is Shad Sluter, and I'm a professor of software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University. And so if you're in my course, welcome. And if you're not, and you're just looking along, then please join us and receive a degree that will actually get you a really good career. So in this section, we're talking about application design. And really, there are four parts to app design. We're going to, first of all, or we did already, talk about which features that are essential in making a successful app. The user interface is about what the app looks like. 
In this video, we're going to talk about the experience that a user has as he or she is going through the flow and the execution of your application. We want to make sure that that is good because that's essential for retaining uh, users and making apps addictive. And then finally, we're going to talk about the principles of MVP, which is the minimal viable product that you would present to investors and to potential users. It's kind of the version 1.0 or the beta version of your app that makes you either confirm or deny that your app will actually work. So we're in the section called user experience or sometimes called UX. So how is this different from the user interface? Well, really the user experience is the, is the overlap of several different things. First of all, the design, which is what most people would think of as the user interface, the, the technology that is there. So what are the uh, actual interfaces, whether it's a tablet, phone, web page, virtual reality, or the third one is the strategy. So what are you trying to accomplish? And does the user actually meet those goals? And so that is perhaps what we would consider the experience of the user. So for us, we would consider it that's a five star or a one star experience. It has far more to do than the colors and fonts or the layout that you choose. It's the whole process of your application. So let's revisit a cycle that we talked about in the previous video. So as your user is going through these four sections, they are going to experience your application or the UX. So first of all, the application starts somewhere. So how do users find you? And then how do they get on board? How do they begin the process of becoming a registered user and active in your, in your app? Then the retention part is the addictive or the interesting or the engaging part of your application that keeps them coming back. Do you have something worth doing, in other words, in the retention stage? And then finally, referral. Do they invite friends? Do they have actions with other users? Is there a way that hooks new people to come in and repeat the cycle and of course then your audience grows? Then finally, somewhere in this process you have to figure out how to monetize your app without annoying everybody. So too many ads of course will ruin the user experience. Too high of a price and people might not even get in the front door. And so there's a balance of where the successful companies have learned to use experience and monetization at the same time and they of course have a great program. Now here is a previous uh, user layout that we showed in the last video on the user interface. So user interface are the actual views. Each screen could be considered an interface. However, the process of linking these together and the logic flow of the program is just as important as how clearly they're drawing. Now, the time bank here app is to uh, have somebody organize their time so that they can decide how much they're gonna spend on exercise or study or with their family or commuting or whatever. And so it's a great way for people to bank their time. I guess that's the, the, the theory of this app is that you can budget your time and use it like you would money. And so that's called the Time Bank app. So I don't know if it's a good app or not, but the, the process here is obviously done well. You can see how the user experience will begin and end and all the steps that are in between there. Now, what would make this even better is that if you put it into a process or a drawing tool like Figma or something like that, and you could test it out, you could click the app, you could watch the screens transition and then make some decisions and refinements based on a prototype. So you could think of the user flow is the process of how the user goes from the beginning stages to the end. So let's take a look at a, an example here of what might be a, a shopping experience. So the user opens the app, they do a search for our products, they compare several products. So your user experience might be to show a table, you know, a side-by-side -side comparison or a save to cart or a wish list or some way to compare. Help the user figure out what they need to do. Then of course, add to cart is what we want. Shopping makes makes the order and then make a frictionless way to pay it. You've probably seen that before. And then finally you receive confirmation and hopefully the Amazon guy shows up at your door and rings the doorbell and you're happy. And so the, the confirmation process outside of the app is just as good as the experience inside the app. So you can imagine that Amazon and people like them have spent literally billions of dollars making this user flow so easy and so obvious that now I see on my phone 
one click buy. So I don't even have to do the shopping uh, checkout process. Make it easy, make it fun, and then I don't even notice that I just spent some money. So let's revisit this user flow again, the experience of what's happening. So you can see that we have the four stages of our app experience, acquisition, activation, retention, and referral. And so there's a different label we could put on the person at each stage. So what's happening there? So our goal then is we would think about what's, in, what's happening and who the user is, is our goal is to make it easy for this to happen. We want the user to install the app. The next thing is we want it easy and obvious to register an account, which is why so many people just use the Google login or the Facebook login. No one likes to type in passwords and confirm their password. Retention is a, a really engaging or entertaining or something that is very useful, something that serves the need. And so we don't want to confuse or annoy our users in this stage. It's the core of our application. And then our goal here is for people to invite a friend. And so don't just say, invite a friend. Maybe invite them to play the game with you or invite them to share in a experience or to share a photo or somehow uh, cooperate. And so you want to make it natural in each of these stages. And so that's the idea and the thinking of user experience is you want to reach the goal in each of these stages without sounding contrived or overwhelming or annoying in any way. You want to make it the natural thing that the user wants to do. And then of course, if you're successful with all of these, what's going to happen is the cycle will continue and you'll have a virtuous cycle of new customers coming in by word of mouth. Now, the conversion rate is something that you would want to keep track of. So once you have an app up and running, you're going to think about what is happening at each of these stages. And of course, you're going to lose a few people along the way. And what you want to do then is find out where the choke points are. Where are people dropping out of this experience? And that's where you need to focus and refine what you're working on. So are people dropping out when they get to the checkout? What's going on? Are you having them create all kinds of uh, confirmations and credit card entries? Or is that process smoothed out and automated? And so you're, only you are going to be able to figure out where those problem points are if you've got data on how your users are acting. Now expand your idea more than just about your app because the user journey begins before the app happens. So they get an invite or they have some kind of a notice or they found you in the app store. And so you wanna make sure that that's a good experience. The in-app experience is how smoothly it runs during navigation, ordering or posting. And then finally, when you are done, does your app provide just entertainment while they're in the app or are they going to receive a pizza when they're done or what's the goal of your service? And so probably thinking about the beginning and the ending and not just what they're doing inside the app is going to help you as well. So a good exercise to make this successful is to create what's called a user empathy map. So you would identify your user and try to predict and live in their shoes. What does your user say? What does your user do? What is he or she thinking? And how do they feel about the experience at each stage? So let's take an example here of somebody that's ordering uh, a, a new item from a restaurant. What do they say? Well, obviously they said, I want to order food. Or maybe they said, I'm hungry. Or I don't want to cook tonight. And then what do they do? They open up the app, they browse the menu, and they do comparisons. So you can watch what they're doing. You can see how well that's working. But you can also say, I can try to imagine what the user is thinking. What are some of the important items? Well, they might say, when's it going to arrive? Is this expensive? Will this food taste good? Is it going to be cold, stale, soggy? Uh, are the people going to be rude? And so you can imagine that there's all kinds of questions that would be in that person's mind. And how are they feeling? Who are you dealing with? Well, you're probably dealing with hangry customers. People that want to order food and get it now are going to be impatient. Or they might be excited. They're going to say, oh, good, Chinese food tonight. I haven't had that for a while, and it tastes so good. And so this experience is far more than just coding and user interface. This is about how users feel about your program. And so the only way you can really know this is to talk to your users, watch them, observe them, measure them, and get lots of feedback. 
And so the user empathy grid will make your user experience far more successful than if you just assume a lot of these things. So qualitative user experiences are going to be things like this. Watch what they do. So literally you could put them in a lab situation or give them the phone and, and just observe quietly. Did they complete the action without any questions? Did they get frustrated? Did they have to ask for help? Did the user do the correct answer? Did they, did they or uh, thought they were doing something but a menu led them down a false path? Did the user misunderstand something? Was the menu not clear or was it hidden? Did they even not know that it was a menu? Or was the icon just a mystery to them? Maybe they didn't know it was an icon. And so all of these things that seem, you, that seem obvious to you as the developer are going to be measured. Did they have to try multiple times before they finally got it right? If, they, if the answer to any of these questions comes out wrong, then you either have to fix the app or just assume that a great deal of your customers will never come back. And so user experience requires you to watch and observe. And so here's a piece of advice that seems a little counterintuitive at first, but it says, don't listen to what users say, observe what they do instead. And so the idea is to observe carefully and watch to see if there are problems. So if you were to talk about a range of positive to negative user experience, you could put it on this pyramid here. So at the very bottom of the pyramid, we would say the application is useful in the fact that it does what it says. It works. Okay, so that's the minimum user experience we would want. It functions. Then the second one up is probably just as important, obviously. It says you need to be reliable. So reliable means not just that it won't crash, but also it's reliable in the fact that it's consistent. So one place where you would put a, a command is going to follow through for the rest of the application, or you do a process that is repeated in similar ways. Also in convenience, is this a natural and obvious and efficient way to do things? So I know in certain applications that I use, if I want to do minor things that require 15 clicks with a mouse, I get angry, I get annoyed. It's like, who designed this? Who used this? Obviously, they never tested it out. Is your experience pleasant? Okay, so that's getting pretty high now. Where people say, I actually like to use my app. It's attractive, it looks nice. I get a good feeling when I open it. And then at the very top, I guess we would call it meaningful, means that overall, it's a very positive impression. I enjoy using the app and I will be back. And so your UX is trying, of course, to meet the top end of this. So in order to achieve the goals of this meaningful and pleasant experience, let's talk about six principles that will help you whenever you're talking about making a positive user experience. Make it minimal. Find your way to do it without a lot of uh, extra trim. So remember the experience of the contrast between Yahoo and Google? Google is minimal. How about intuitive groupings? And so we think about the way you, menu, you, you organize your menus and your dialogue boxes and the clusters of things that belong together logically fit together. It flows naturally. So you don't have to tell your users to figure out what to click next. There's an obvious button or there's a process of sliding or, or clicking that's, that's going to be exactly what they expect. Make sure that the icons are obvious. Invent only new icons when there doesn't exist one already. So just use the standard icons that most applications use. Make uh, efficient motions. So in a, in a mobile application, think of your right thumb as the place that's going to do most of the work. Or if you're working on an application that covers an entire screen, uh, make sure that you don't have too many clicks or you don't have to move around too much. And all finally, above all probably, is consistency throughout. If you pick a plan, stick with that plan so you don't have to surprise users or confuse users from one part of your application to another. Now the next step in building this project is called the MVP or the Minimal Viable Product. So check out the video here that will give some principles on designing an MVP. Also, if you want to see the entire playlist for this course, uh, click here and you will see a class list of many videos. So thanks for watching and please subscribe.
Hi, and welcome back to the Business of Building Applications. This is a mobile app course for people who are interested in the business of design and running a service. So there are several options and several chapters that we're studying. So we talked about the motivations, and now we're in part two, which is about designing an MVP, or a minimal viable product. There are other considerations ahead of us, so if you would like to subscribe, you can see these as they come out, if this is interesting to you. My name is Shad Sluter, and I am a professor of software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University. So please join us in class if this works for you. Now, what we're going to talk today about is application design in part four. Down here at the bottom, we're focusing on MVP, which is the minimal viable product. We've already asked about which features we should include in here, what the user interface is like, and how to make a good user experience. So now what we're trying to do is come up with version 1.0 of our product that we can use to test out with users and show to investors. So that's called our MVP. So it's certainly not the most valuable player like you would see in sports, but the minimal viable product. So this term isn't my invention, of course. It comes from a book called The Lean Startup. And so you can see that it's a New York Times bestseller and a common basic idea in entrepreneur circles. So the term is defined like this. An MVP is the product that in the shortest time can create value for one or more users on a continuous basis. So some people have the idea that the MVP is like super basic and ugly and barely works. And others are saying, no, it's more of a, of a fully functional product that we can test out. And so there's a range of ideas of what people think is MVP. So what I want to do is to show you some advice and some principles that will lead you to a successful MVP and make your business work. So we've all got a list of features that we want to put into our app and we need to prioritize them. So the MVP are the core essential things that make our app work. Uh, the future ideas, we're going to call that version 1.1 maybe or 2 or 3, but we're going to leave those for later after we've proven that our business concept is successful we're going to see if users actually like what we made and if the investors can go along with us. And so the MVP is just to get us started. It's not really the full vision yet. So we've gone from prototype, which is kind of like the drawings and the wireframes, maybe something that you can actually work with, like with a, a clickable interface. A MVP is like somewhere in the middle and then a real product is still ahead of us. So we're in the intermediate stages now. So think MVP has limited goals and very close attention to how much it costs. Now MVP can be considered like an incremental process or it can be considered an evolutionary process. So the first one, as far as incremental, is not an MVP. So if you were to build a truck, it is not the process of building wheels, then frame, and then a body, and then assembling it because you really can't use the wheel by itself. Now, if you were to talk about MVP, you're going to say, we're going to build a transportation device that's going to carry cargo. Well, the first requirement is that our transportation device actually moves and can carry something. It doesn't go very fast and it doesn't carry very much. And the bicycle is a slight improvement on that. It goes a little bit faster. And of course, the motorcycle goes fast, but doesn't carry much. The idea is that we have a functional product at each, st each point of the, st of the stage of development. And so completely different than just building from the ground up and building foundation first and then building out from there. So how much does it cost to develop a scooter? Not very much. How much does it cost to build an entire truck? Obviously quite a bit. So our investment risk in the scooter stage is quite low, and that's the whole point. So if you were to build a service that does automated coffee production, you would consider an MVP like this. Uh, we want to know if the users like the idea of walking up to a machine, putting a quarter in, and getting a cup of coffee. Do people actually want that? Well, you could invent a robot to do it for you, and that would cost a lot of money. But if all you're interested in is testing out the concept, then literally you put a guy behind the cardboard, he makes the coffee and hands it through the hole. Do people like that? And you'd really don't know if they, how well they like it until you test it out. So it's a physical a demonstration of what an MVP looks like. So if people are having to place orders with you and you manually configure them and, and fulfill them, that's fine. 
Now, a good example of this process being manual is from the company Zappos. So in a previous video, I told you they ran an experiment to see if people would order shoes online. So that was a good question. So instead of building an entire warehouse and then running a business to answer that question, they simply put up a website that sold shoes. If somebody ordered a pair of shoes, they would take that email and it would go to the store and they would buy a pair of shoes from the retailer. And then they would put it in a box and mail it to the customer. Now, obviously they had no markup. There was expenses in doing all of that and postage. So they were losing money in the process, but they were able to answer the question, is our minimal viable idea really viable? Will people buy shoes online? And of course the answer turned out to be yes. And so they turned into a big investment and eventually were purchased by Amazon and you can buy Zappos online today. Now, the idea of trying to build a MVP relates directly to the user experience. So we want to get our MVP to the top of the pyramid, but not have a great amount of money invested. So here is a way to do it wrong. This is terrible, okay? So terrible is to say, I'm gonna take the strategy where I'm only going to build the easiest features, not the most important ones. And so we have a broad uh, part at the bottom of the pyramid that says, we have lots of useful things that we can do in our MVP. The experience is bad, but at least it works. So we don't wanna do that. So how can we get better than terrible? Well, we could get to the level that we'll call bad. That's not terrible. So what is bad? Well, bad says we'll take a slice and we'll get a little ways up the pyramid. So we'll have maybe one or two features, they work, but we don't really have that experience of what the end goal is yet. So we can provide some value. So we wanna do better than that. So let's go up one more. So from bad, we'll go to good. So good says, we're going to take a narrow slice. So we'll have maybe one feature that feature is both reliable, it's convenient, and it's very pleasant, and the experience will be good for that one thing. So the answer to the question is, which features capture the most value for the customer? And so it doesn't do much, but it does one thing very well. Now we can even do better than one step above this. We go from good to best. So best is we'll just skew the development a little bit so that maybe we'll have not two features, but one feature. That one feature is very good, it looks nice, the user experience was thought out, and a user can use the product. So they would like to have more features, of course, but the answer to the question is, which features best demonstrate the value of my product? And we make sure that that experience looks really, really good. And so we want to make sure that we can answer that question, that's the point of an MVP. So let's put it into writing here. So the MVP answers the burning question is, how will users receive your product? This is really a mystery until they actually have it in their hands and they can test it out. So do they yawn at your product? If they say this is really nothing special or it's boring, then you fail fast. And you might just decide at this point, not worth it. The investors flee, we abandon the idea. Bad idea. Nobody likes it. Or we could say that the users come back with a mixed kind of a review. They say, it's a nice app, but I would prefer it if it were slightly different. If so, then we know we have a, a roadmap for version 2.0. Or if we hit it right and we have a great experience and the users are excited, then we roll. And we can start adding development, advertising the thing, marketing, and new features are in the future. So implicit in this discussion is the idea of keeping the costs low. So your MVP has a, a, a relationship to its cost based on the number of features you put in. So keep that slice small, one good feature, and the cost of development is lower. So instead of spending $100 an hour for your developers, for each developer, to create features that are really not critical, then you keep those out. So there's an inverse, also a relationship to the amount of acceptance and understanding that your users are giving you. So they have a limited bandwidth of what they can give you for feedback. So fewer features means you get the right feedback from your users. So their understanding of what your app does is better when there's not as many choices. So lower cost and more accurate feedback on the burning question. 
So really, the question is, what features should be in our MVP? Answer that with three questions. Does the user need it? How simple is it to develop? And does it provide value to the company? And of course, we want those answers to be positive, and then we know which features are in the MVP. Now, does the user need it? That's our first question. Obviously, you have the core idea, so don't try to chase down things that are nice to have. So then the next question is, what does it cost to develop? So not only do you have to calculate the cost of your computers and the time that you pay for your developers, but you think of the opportunity cost. You want to get this business started. And so if you don't answer the question right, then you're probably going to be losing in on opportunities that you could be working on. Now, the last question is, does it provide value to the business? So the first value you can think of is revenue. So one luxury you do have is that you can postpone the development of the uh, revenue part until later. Because the goal is to find out if users like it and then get, it, get them hooked on it. And so don't annoy them with your ads. Uh, just see the, if they like the feature first. Now, double check. When you get to this point in your development and you have an MVP, you've presented it to users and they've given you feedback, ask yourself, am I developing anything that is truly unique? This is a double check. Do my users see it as a differentiated product? Do I think that it's going to be an improvement? Where are we going with this? That's the double check point. Now also keep track of your backlog because everyone's got these features that they are anxious to put in. We know that we're going to promise the people that they're going to be there and that's what your backlog does. So version two is going to have numbers uh, four, five, and six and version three is gonna have all the great things in the future. But we're not going to invest money in those until we know that features number one, two, and three are the ones that users will actually adopt. And so it allows the users to see the future and the developers can build something that they can adapt and extend and plan for in other versions. So now you've got your MVP in place, you've tested it with a few users, and you can answer the question truthfully now, is this a good idea? Not only do I think it's a good idea, but do other people like it, and will it sell? And so that is really the one goal that you have for an MVP, is to test your idea and see if it's going to launch. Now, in the next video, we're going to talk about monetizing and marketing your app. How do you get people to adopt it and use it, and how can you pay for it? If you'd like to see that, click the video that's up here on the screen. Also, I have the link to the entire playlist so you can see all of the subjects of the business of building applications. Thanks for watching, and please subscribe. Hi, and welcome to the Business of Building Applications. This is a video that will give you some ideas of how to complete an assignment if you were one of my students. We're in part two of, an, of eight chapters of a course, and this is about designing an effective app. And so this video here is going to give you some details on an assignment. If you were in my, in my class at Grand Canyon University, this is what I would expect of you. If you're not in my class, then you're, feel free to do the assignment, but you'll probably have to just put your things in the comments below. So what I want you to do in this assignment is to look at some design examples. And so when I say design examples, I'm talking about app design. This is going to look at some people that really did a great job on how they would build an app. So we're going to take a look at some people that know what they're doing and we're going to evaluate how well they've covered the basis and what we can learn from them. So I'm going to show you three case studies, three design uh, projects that are posted online that we can look at. And number one is about an app that would do pet food recipes. And so this uh, website that we're looking at for these examples is called uxdesign.cc. And so the first one I want you to pick out is this one here called a step-by-step -step guide uh, to the process of designing a pet diet app. And so this is their first page. I'll provide the link to this below. So this here is the, it doesn't exist. This app doesn't exist. This here is the, the layout. This is the sketch. This is the, um, the prototype for the app. So you can see that when you look at this web page, you're going to see that they started with this process of sketching out with a, literally a pencil and paper the wireframes, what the app's going to look like. 
and then you can see navigation links between it. Then the wireframes are a little bit nicer than just the sketch. It's done with a, a drawing program, and so it's a little bit easier to read. And then this user created an ins inspiration board. So they went to look at other apps that were similar to get uh, probably graphics and uh, color schemes and what they did for the, the look and feel. And then uh, here is a nice uh, design process. So I don't know if you do this or not, but iterations. So you're going to design something and you don't take the rough draft and just start implementing it. You create three or more things to look at. So that way you can compare them and judge based on what you've what you looked at from a distance. Or you can provide it to other users and get their feedback and pick the one that people seem to gravitate toward. So anyway, in this case study, you can see that the green one was uh, selected by the user to say, I think I did the best job on this one. So when you look at these three, which one would you pick? I'm not sure if I agree. Is three the best? Uh, it's kind of a personal preference. And then when they're done here, they have this uh, fully formed graphical user interface, they can see the whole app. Number two that I'm going to ask you to look at is a food ordering app. So once again, I'm going to take you back to the same website, which is the UX Collective. And in this case, the student created an app for ordering mobile, uh, mobile meals. And so the uh, steps here involved uh, maybe a few other things. Notice that they used what they called a user persona. So these are fake people. But these people are representative of the ideal customer. And so you can see that they have certain targets, that means their preferences, where they hang out online, a little biography about who they are, where they work, and how old they are, what they like, and what frustrates them. And so these are the ideal targets for this application. So that's called a persona. That's actually a terminology that you should start using. The persona, the target person for my app. Then we're going to have a process here. So this person not only thought about the user interface, but they are considering the user experience. So the user experience is how does the app work and how does the entire business work with the app? What's the user going to experience from the moment they open the app to the moment they pay for it or get their product? And so UX. Then the wireframes come next, just like the previous example. And you can see that they're designing uh, very detailed plans for what the app's going to look like. And then uh, they organized it. So more ideas from other users and more other apps. And then finally you get to this. This is a nice, clean, photo-ready app that doesn't work yet. It's just a user interface. But you could provide this to your ideal customer or to your boss and have a very good plan on what you're going to be building. So the third case that I want you to look at is this number three called the fitness app. So this fitness app is a UX case study again. So Fitter Me is the name. It doesn't exist in an app form as far as I know, but it does give you a pretty good idea of where they want to go. So this case study has a competitive analysis. So the competitive analysis will tell you who's out there already. So obviously Strava is like a huge market leader. Why are we building an app that replaces Strava? I'm not sure, but the competitive analysis is supposed to tell us why. Um, maybe there's some weakness or some specialty that we can exploit. So who's the target? So we've got this pretty broad range. We've got some segments of people who are going to be likely users of the app. Uh, we have some interview questions. So this is a great way to find out what is really happening in the minds of your potential users. Is, remember in the previous activity and the assignment that, that I asked you to do was to go and talk to your friends and family and present your idea of your app and then get feedback. So this is exactly what this person did here with the interview questions. So why would you want to use my app? What would you change if you could modify it? And uh, how much would you pay for it? How, much, uh, how, how likely on a scale of 1 to 10 are you going to use this app once it's released? And so remember, this market research will save you hundreds of hours and maybe lots of money because if you find that nobody cares about your app, then don't even bother advancing beyond. So next, this user created a persona and empathy map. So the empathy map is asking yourself, what does this person think? What do they experience? So how do they 
find uh, the process of uh, exercising right now? Is it frustrating to them? Are they inspired? Or you try to have empathy for them, not just in you know being a psychologist that listens well, but an empathy in understanding what makes them tick. Then we get into the wireframes and the uh, connections between them, so the site navigation. So they've got a pretty good idea what their app's going to look like. Now what I want you to do is, after you looked at these three in more detail than what I just showed you, I want you to write about what you learned. So question number one, I want you to notice a couple of things. That these case studies followed a very common format. There are certain ingredients in each case study and each design that they all addressed. So what are the common sections of a user design document? And then the second is some of these you might rate as more complete or more compelling than others. So which of these three do you provide or do you think what provides the best idea and the best guidance for an app developer to follow? So if you were their boss, which one would you promote and which one would you send back for a second try? Then the next question is that most apps in the stores hardly get any downloads at all. Clearly there's an app for every need, but there's not a need for every app. So based on the business ideas that are here, which of these three do you think has any kind of a chance of attracting a crowd? So are there uh, success in their future or not? So explain your answer. So what I'm asking you to do is not to design your own app this time, but take a look at other people's work and see if you can see success or failure in their future. So now let's move on to the second part of our observations. So let's talk about freelance work. So freelance app developers sometimes browse websites like Upwork or freelancer.com looking for jobs to bid on. So if you are seeing these uh, three apps that were uh, up for development, are there any one of them that you would be interested in bidding on? Assuming you were going to be paid several thousand dollars, you were going to be paid well for your time, which one of these apps would merit your time? And then explain why you would apply for one over the other. So you might have personal reasons such as it's uh, interesting to you or you think that this uh, person has their act together and probably has a clear vision or what's, what's your reasoning? So which of the three would you apply for if you were a freelancer? And then think about your own app now. So since you might not be a designer, a professional designer, you're probably going to imitate those that are. So using these three case studies, you're probably going to look at your own idea and follow the same format. Good for you because these are done in great formats. So these case studies are meant to be imitated. So which of these three do you think makes the best model for you to imitate in designing your own app successfully? So explain to me what you liked about it and why you would follow their pattern. Finally, let's talk about the deliverables. In this assignment, if you were in my class, I would expect a one-page Word document. And I would expect you to compare the app design case studies. Did I say four? I think I only showed you three. If you're not in my class, then go ahead and write the comments below in the YouTube comments section about which of these three cases you thought were the strongest and why you believe they are. I'm going to provide the link to the entire course, so if you'd like to see the playlist for the business of app design, please join me there. Also, don't forget to subscribe if this content is interesting to you. Thank you and we'll see you next time. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course where you're learning how to create apps as a business manager. So we're in part two, which is chapters on designing an effective app. And in this video, I'm going to give you an assignment. We'll call this activity 2.2. And the goal here is that we are going to try to develop what's called user stories. So when you're designing an app, you have to figure out what your users want to do. And so the background here is that our user stories are a prioritization of all of the features in our app. So it's a natural language description of every feature, such as, as a user, I would like to log in so that I can have access to the application. That's a user story, it tells me who, and what they want to do. 
So a user story is a short statement that is written from the perspective of the user. So for instance, you might say, as a role, I want to do something so that I can. So for instance, I might say, as a manager, that's the role, I want to see a sales report to be sent to my inbox every day so that I can track the success or failure of my team. And so that tells you a feature of the app that you want to build. So your app might not have any of the features that look like that at all, but that's an example of what a user story looks like. Now, once you've got a bunch of user stories, it's nice to put them into categories. And so probably a, sen a sensible way to do this would be put it onto some kind of a sticky note or a virtual sticky note. And then you and your team would get together to say, which ones of these are the best ones? And which ones are we going to leave till the future? So you can prioritize what things you need to do right away. So what you would probably think of is uh, essential MVP features first. So MVP stands for Minimal Viable Product. We'll get to that later, but the Minimal Viable Product is the first version of your app. It's probably not very scalable and it might not be perfect, but it's certainly going to tell us what the app can do. And you can provide experiences to the actual users and they can give you feedback on it. So for instance, in a previous activity, we looked at a case study of a user for a uh, pet recipe app. And so I put a feature in here that might have been in that pet recipe app. It says here, as a user, I want to search for recipes so that, for my pet so that I can find something appropriate for his medical conditions. Okay. And the reason why we would put that as a high priority is because in our interviews with our test users, our personas, we found that this was the most common request from our user surveys. So we would be able to identify what it is and give it a priority. Number two, they may have said, here's another feature of the app. As a user, I want to read instructions so that I can prepare a recipe was also common from our users. And we would also categorize it as essential to the core operation of the app. That's really what our app does. That's the main activity. How right, about the third one? Let's examine that one too. It says, as a user, I want to read about the ingredients that are in each recipe so that I can know what the health benefits are associated with the recipe. This is essential. It's a common request. But for the app to actually work, then the users don't really need that to see what the app looks like. We could put in some dummy data here and just say, hey, if, if this app were finished, then you would be able to see the contents of your meal. So we gave it a priority of one. Well, it, it'll eventually it'll hit the app, but for right now, it's not going to hit version number one. So here's some future version priorities. So we've pushed these away and said, maybe someday. So for instance, I want, a, as a user, I want to create a shopping list for the ingredients based on my favorite recipes. So we said, we're gonna put this in version 2.0 because of the complexity of the development. It sounds like we're gonna take some more time. It's also essential to the revenue model of this app because we're planning on monetizing the app by taking a cut out of every item that is ordered from Amazon. So if we don't include this feature, we won't make any money. So that's why it's essential. But remember, in the first version of the app, we don't have to make money. The first version of the app, we just have to prove that people like the app. So we'll, we'll leave that as a future version. Number two, I want to fulfill the ingredients on Amazon and the order. Yep, I mentioned, I want same thing here. Uh, we're going to take a percentage of the sales. And then number three, or the third item here, it says, I want to track my pet's weight. So maybe that's great, but according to the survey, we uh, asked our people if they ever wanted to weigh their pets, and, and most people said no. So we thought it was a good idea. We put it on the, ch on the list of things, but our users told us otherwise. So that's maybe an example of how you would prioritize user stories. So based on what you can do and what your users want you to do. So what I want you to do then in this assignment is to create a, a table. So write all the user stories that you can think of that your app will do, all of the features, and you write them in that I as a user kind of format, and then put them in a chart to say which ones are nice to have, which ones are going to be pushed off to future versions. So it's really just a table with a bunch of sticky notes. So that's your deliverable. I want you to create a Word document with a list of minimal viable product features. 
and then also put them in the future or the present categories. If you were one of my students, I would grade you based on the completeness of what the app looks like and how much thought that you can justify for each decision. Uh, if you're not in my class, then feel free to do this on your own as you're designing your own applications. I'll put the link to the course playlist here so that you can go back and see some of the teachings that are going to help you in making this assignment come true. So if this is good for you, then please make sure you subscribe for the channel, and I will see you next time in class. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course for people who are not only programmers, but also business thinkers. We're in chapter two of the course right now, which is called Designing an Effective App. And I'm going to give you an assignment. So we'll call this assignment 2.3. And in this assignment, what we're going to create are interactive user interfaces, okay? So in other words, we're going to create a small prototype, a demo of an app. So the background is that I want you to create something that is functional and something that you can put into the hands of your users to test out. And maybe you, for the first person, will be the, the first person to test it. So what this demo will do is it will clarify in your own mind how the app will work. You will find that there are some gaps in your logic or design, and this will become painfully evident by how it works. So you can show it to your potential users and business partners to see if you're on the right track. So to do this demo, we're going to use a program called Figma. So Figma is free, and so what I want you to do is to go log in at figma.com, and uh, get an account so that you can design an app. You can see in the background here that I started designing a mobile app and it's got two pages on it right now. So Figma is pretty cool. Uh, I want you to look at the tutorial pages to see how it works, but it's so simple. If you've worked with any kind of uh, Word or publisher or any kind of a page layout document, you'll, you'll probably understand that you can drag shapes and resize them. But then the cool part is you can click the play button and you can actually go through the app and see what the uh, navigation looks like. So here are the instructions that I want you to follow. For sign up for a, an account at Figma, and then uh, create a set of wireframes. So that's the uh, drawings of your screen. And these will each represent one of the actions in your app. So the actions are your user stories. And then connect them so that way we can see the navigation links between each. Then run the app and test it out. Make sure that you haven't forgotten anything and that it works like you expect. And then for you to submit it to me is uh, to be graded, I want you to do a demo and record the screen. So you can record it with something like uh, QuickTime or if you use Loom.com, you can uh, record your screen and have an, a narration that goes along with it. So the deliverables, if you were one of my students, I would ask you to submit a Word document with wireframe drawings. And in that Word document, you would have a link to say, hey, this is the video, this is how I demonstrated my app, and the prototype works, and I'll show you all the features in it. So if you're doing this without being one of my students, go ahead and provide links in the uh, comments below so that other people can see what you've designed, and maybe you can get some feedback from them. So thanks for watching. I'm gonna put a playlist link so that way you can check out all of the other items of this course. Make sure you subscribe if this is information that is valuable to you. And we will see you in the next class. Hi, welcome to this course here on the business of building applications. We're in a section right now called the business plan. So if you've been following me along, you can see that we have several ideas about how to make a successful business app. And so we're on part three right now, which is about the business plans, including marketing and monetization. However, you can see that there are other chapters in this course that we're going to cover. And so if you haven't subscribed yet, do that now. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach software development at Grand Canyon University, including mobile development. And so welcome to class. Now let's take a look here at what we're going to talk about in the next few videos. So we're on the app business plan cycle, which I'm going to just put into four different categories. We're going to talk in this section about your main business plan, and we'll put it in a format called the business model canvas. We'll talk about ways to monetize your app, ways to market and get new users, 
and talk about your relationship with investors if you're going that route. And so this is four videos about the business plan of your app. So now, if you're interested in the business plan, obviously you intend to make your app into a service or a product that people are willing to pay for. So the plan that we're going to look at right now is called the Business Canvas Model. So unfortunately, I can't take credit for the plan or the organization of this model here. So this comes from a book here called The Value Proposition Design which is a really interesting book. You should check it out. It's like a picture book with all kinds of ways to graphically show your strategies of how to make a business. And so this is by Alex Osterwalder, and you can see some of his uh, uh, people that worked along with him. So we're going to take a look at nine business issues that he identifies that you must clarify. So who are your partners? What do you do for your customers? What resources do you have? What value do you provide? Why do your customers love you? What channels do you use to either gain customers or deliver your services and products? Who is your customer and the profile? What cost will you incur and what streams of revenue will you support your business with? So let's talk about these individually. Now, for some reason, we can't just put these into nine different questions. We have to organize them into this plan, this board. And so it makes you look smarter when you have a way to organize your things on a board, perhaps. I don't know, maybe it makes it easier to remember. But anyway, we're going to follow the plan here, this uh, board. So the key partners is the first question. Who are your business partners? Who are your associates? Who do you need to survive and the relationships with them? What activities do you do? What is the core service that your customers look for you to provide? Then we have key resources. Now these resources can be things that you possess or things that you must pay for or obtain. And so this would refer to either the, pu the human uh, capital that you have or the data that you collect or any kind of product that you're able to manufacture. So value propositions are about your customers and why they think you are worth the money. So do you make their life easy? Do you provide entertainment? Do you provide a service that they can't live without? So the value proposition means why do people want to give you money? And so you better have a good one. Uh, a customer relationship can be, uh, the question is why do customers love you and why do they keep coming back? Or perhaps if your plan doesn't work so well, you could do the opposite. The channels refers to how you are going to reach your customers or how you're going to deliver your services and products. And so what are your channels of distribution or your channels of incoming customers? Also your customer segments. So it's ideal to have a profile, the exact age, the gender, the location, the hobbies, the problems. You have a profile that would tell you who uh, John Doe is and why he is your customer. And also there might be a variety of John Doe's that have slightly different attributes. And so you segment your customers to figure out which ones are happy and which ones need improvement. Also the cost structure. Would well, you have an ongoing process that costs you money? Do you subscribe to things? Do you have to pay people for uh, giving you services that you pass on to your customers? And so your cost structure is all about salaries and ongoing expenses. Then the last one is revenue streams. And so how do you make money? Are people paying for your app? Are you selling advertising? Are you getting commissions? And so those are all questions about revenue streams. And so there you have it. We've got the whole list here. And like I said, you have to put it on this board to make it officially your business planning board. I don't know if you need this board, but I, I thought about it for a while and I realized I actually do remember all of these questions better when I see these icons in the, in the layout. So maybe you'll, you'll find the same process. Regardless, these are important questions that you must clarify if you're going to have a successful business. And of course, you're going to find that if there's a weak link in your plan, that's probably going to require your attention and to make the process work better. So to make this uh, more concrete, let's take a look at an example application. So I pulled something out of the App Store and I think I was looking for discounted restaurant uh, coupons, something like Groupon. And I found this app. And it appears to have a number of users. I'm not even sure if it's used, useful in the United States or not, but I don't think I've ever used the app. But anyway, I wanted to pick this as an example of how a process would go to think about how you would uh, fill out this uh, business board. 
So we have to have concrete examples, right? So Eatago is a restaurant reservation app which offers time-based discounts. So that means probably discount of the day of up to 50% off every day for all of its 4,500 plus restaurants. There are no prepayments or hidden costs. Eatigo is 100% free, at least it is to you, the user, and it's simple to use, search, and, re and enjoy. So the idea here is that this is an app, but it's really an app that is a business. It's a service. You probably don't have to make the food, but you do have to provide a stream of customers to restaurants to be successful. And so here's some screenshots of what the app looks like. You can see that you're getting Groupon like uh, coupons, and you probably are going to be sent to restaurants that you're not uh, familiar with, and you're supposed to try them out. And of course, the restaurant is going to hopefully see you again, and they will become your favorite uh, place to eat. So let's take this example and answer some of the questions that will go on this business planning board. So let's start over. So we have this key partners. Now, if you were that restaurant app, Eatigo, who are the partners? Well, think of those 4,500 restaurants that are willing to give you the discount. So those would be probably the key partners. So I put down here restaurants, maybe caterers, food trucks, hotels, anyone that's willing to pay you to bring them a new client. And so your key partnerships here, you better make sure that you're really strong with these people and you are on good terms. Uh, if these things go sour, your whole business plan will fail. And so that's why they're called key partners. The second is, what activities do you do? So if you had to give the elevator pitch about this app, you say, hi, I am Shad, I have this app called Eatigo, and it, what would you say? Put it in one sentence, think about it. Well, here's what I put, so if you wanna see my answer. I said, we match people with places to eat. Now, there's a, there are other parts about discounts and things like that, but that's pretty much it. What are the key resources? What do you have to have or obtain to make this thing work? What makes your app valuable? Sometimes this is called the moat uh, around your castle. This is what prevents competitors from moving in and taking over your business. You have a protective ring. So what resources do you have that other people don't? Well, you can probably say, I have a lot of users. Hopefully you do. That's probably the most difficult thing of making this app work properly is that you need to have a critical mass. Once you have some people, I think that perhaps the data is considered a key resource. You have a user list with knowledge of their preferences and habits. So you obviously don't want to share that. That would be a key resource. Think of your employees. If you've got somebody that's out selling your product, if you're trying to get new restaurants into your uh, fold and into your collection, then your key resources would be the contacts, the salespeople that are trying to get new restaurants to participate. And so those are some things that I would say are key resources for this example. What is the value proposition? So think of it. What, what do people get when they use your app? Well, I can see two value propositions, one for the restaurant and one for the users or the clients. For me as a client, that's how I see it. Why would I download this app? Well, I get free food or I get cheap food and I get to try something cool, maybe a new restaurant I haven't seen before. And then the restaurants, what do they get? Well, they get a stream of new customers. So I would say the value proposition here goes two ways for this app. We get a cheap meal and the restaurants get a stream of new customers. Now Groupon, some time ago, was a hot item. It seemed like everybody wanted to use Groupon. Everyone was trying to uh, get new customers in through Groupon. And I think it's cooled off quite a bit. It was, a, it was an expensive proposition for the re retailers, for the people that were giving away their services, because they would get customers in the door one time and they never came back. And I think that the value proposition was rather low. But anyway, here's another example of an of a app that's trying to do the same thing as Groupon. Maybe they're more successful. So your restaurants have to have some kind of a, uh, a payoff in the long term. Of course, you give them the, the first impression, uh, the restaurant's job is to make it a good one. Who are the customers and why do they love you? So the customer relationships. So I would say 
that your way to make your customers love you is that every time they open the app or they turn on their phone, they get an alert that says, hey, there's a new offer. You get a constant stream of good deals and interesting places to eat. And that would make me want to open the app and keep it installed on my phone. Uh, you can also say the key relationships with your restaurants is that you have a steady stream of good customers. Now, I think some restaurants might argue that these are bad customers. Uh, a bad customer for a restaurant is somebody that doesn't tip, that doesn't pay, that only works with coupons. I know I'm certainly a bad customer when it comes to restaurants. I hate spending money. And so I usually look for rather inexpensive places to eat. So I would not be one of the target uh, users that a, a restaurant would be trying to get. Uh, here's another one. What are the channels? So the channels for delivering your product and the channels for obtaining new clients. So let's talk about this one. We would probably think about a steady stream of people downloading and trying our app through social media. So if you go viral, that's great, where you have recommendations from your friends. But to get to that point, you're probably going to invest a great deal of money in acquiring new customers. So people will probably see an ad on Facebook or maybe on TripAdvisor or Instagram or maybe they're Googling restaurant names. So you're going to have to spend some money to get their attention. And so the channel is going to be rather expensive at first, trying to get enough people to try out your app. But I would think that those are probably good resources for getting new people. What are the segments? Like I told you earlier, I probably wouldn't fit one of these. Uh, but here, here are some segments that I would see are likely. People who travel. You know, you're in a new city and you don't know where to eat. People that eat out a lot, obviously. Business lunches. And maybe you're trying to target somebody that has an ex expense account at work. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, people that have expense accounts probably don't worry about 50% off deals. Maybe that's not a good customer segment. There's going to have to be some research here. Obviously, I'm guessing at where their customer segments are. But people that eat out and like a variety of food are likely going to be good customer segments here. Let's talk about the cost structure. Where are you going to be spending money? We are probably going to be spending money on ads. You're going to have to be able to collect new clients. You're going to have salaries if you have people working for you. And so I'm just going to put down here Facebook and Google are likely going to be cost structure items that you are concerned about and any salaries that you have to pay. So where do you make money? You're giving away uh, coupons you're probably going to have to think about your revenue streams as coming from the restaurants themselves. Uh, it's not likely that I'm going to be a customer that pays to install your app. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Costco seems to be able to bill people for shopping at their place. I don't understand that. Why would you want to pay $100 a year or whatever for a membership to go into your store? Um, usually I think of memberships as where I get something uh, value, not I don't get to pay you money. But anyway, maybe you have such a good deal on the app that people are willing to pay a subscription fee. But I would predict that the most likely way that you're going to get this is that you're going to take a cut from every reference that goes in the door of the restaurant. So either you collect fees from the restaurants or you have a subscription for a pro premium model on this. And so if you look through all of these, um, is it nine different items, you're going to have the basic structure of your business plan. Far more than just coding an app, isn't it? You have to think about your customers and your relationships and your costs and your revenues. So this business plan should be challenged by yourself, by your critics, by people that look at you, by investors that might want to be interested in, in starting your company. You might be able to sell this to your employees as well. But you better have a clear idea of your business plan. So in the next video, we're going to talk about monetization. So how do you make money, different ways that you can get an income stream. Also, if you'd like to see the entire course playlist, I'll put that link here. And don't forget to subscribe if you're interested in the business of applications.
Hi, welcome to this course here on the business of building applications. In this video, we're going to talk about the monetization that you can do and strategies for making an app. There are other chapters in this course, so if you're interested in taking a look at these, you can also check out the playlist that I'll put a link for. So we're on part three right now, which is on marketing and monetization. However, you can see that there are other chapters coming up. So make sure you subscribe and join us in class. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. So come along. Now let's take a look here at our app business plans. Really, that's the subject here. We're doing four videos right now that refer to our problems that we're going to have to face here. So in the previous video was about the business plan, which is called the business model canvas. In this video, we're going to talk about monetization. Say that twice. And then the next one is marketing. And then following that, we'll talk about working with investors. So right now, monetization, there it is, is trying to figure out how you can make money by people paying for you on the app or maybe showing you advertising. And there's a multitude of ways that we can do this. So let's get right into that. So first of all, before we do that, let's talk about the app stores and the type of customer that you're going to get on each of the phones. Really, you know, there's only two types of phones out there. There's Android and iOS. And let's compare them. And you'll be surprised at how much more money that goes to people or from people that run an Apple phone. So first of all, revenue in the billions. This is talking about app revenue. And you can see, obviously, it's growing for both companies. But iOS rakes in a huge amount of cash in comparison to Google when it comes to their app stores. Now, this is not quite fair because uh, this includes China. And uh, Google doesn't sell apps in China. Apple does. And so that's another whole story. But anyway, you can see that China will be a very big part of that market. Now, the second is about the subscriptions. So subscriptions are things like Netflix or an annual fee that you would pay for the use of an app. So not just the download, but an ongoing thing. And as you know, likely, there is a 30% cut that these stores take from you if you're selling an app or any kind of subscri subscription on it. So if you download Netflix, it'll be strange that you cannot actually subscribe to Netflix in the app. You have to do that on their website. And of course, there's a good reason. They don't want to give 30% of their revenue to Apple or to Google just for the privilege of getting you as a customer. So you can use the Netflix app, but you can't process any payments through Netflix. Now, as I'm making this video, Epic Games and Apple and Google are all in court fighting this out because uh, they f Epic feels like this is a very unfair model. But, um, you know, it, it, the, at the first, it seemed like a very good plan where you didn't have to pay for boxing up your app or running a store and selling CDs. And so that was uh, the original impetus for 30%. Now, let's take a look here at the uh, markets. So the countries that are involved in the largest number of dollars that are spent on apps or on subscriptions. So you can see China is by far the biggest market, not too surprising since there's over a billion people there and they probably all have iPhones. The United States, of course, a fairly large country. Uh, Japan, Europe, and the rest of the world, I guess, are the third, fourth, and fifth uh, people on the list here. So think about who you're targeting and uh, maybe that would in impact on what kind of an application you're trying to sell. So if you want to reach Chinese people, make sure you have an Apple app. If you're not interested in that, then make sure that you uh, target the countries of your uh, choice here. Now also think about the value per user. So if you were to take the total revenue that is being spent uh, through each type of phone and divide it by the number of users, you'll get an idea that the iOS user will spend about $56 a year on this and the average Android person spends some six dollars so why is there such a vast difference well you can probably see at the very beginning when you filter out the cost of the phone people that are willing to spend a thousand dollars on a phone probably have more disposable income so you probably know me as a rather cheap person i use android phones and i use an apple computer so i'm not i'm not an apple hater but i probably am not a $56 a year customer either. 
The value per app sale is also quite dramatically different. So the average person or the average app that is sold on iOS is larger in, it, in its cost compared to Android. Also, take a look here. This will probably explain a big difference of the two markets. So this table shows the amount of market penetration for each of these uh, platforms. So iOS mostly is in developed countries, richer countries, and Android has a dominant market share in the developing world. Not surprising since the price of the phones are dramatically different. So let's put some graphs on the screen just to give you a picture. So as you can see, the UK is roughly 50-50. Germany, um, mostly Android. The United States is one of those exceptions that has a great deal of iOS users. Uh, Canadians are about 50-50. Japan is similar to the United States with a dominance of iOS. So it makes sense that Japan and the United States are rather wealthy countries. China, the biggest market, has a rather small section of iOS. However, uh, based on the population, there's probably just as many or more iOS phones in China that are being used as the United States, just because they are approximately four times the population of the country on this side of the world. Also, take a look at some of these at the lower end. So I'm going to pick some large countries that have uh, lower or middle income. So India, perhaps just as big as, uh, as China as population, has almost no iOS users. And then if you look at Indonesia, uh, another massively populated country, you're going to see a domination of Android, and uh, Nigeria at the end is, is just the same. And so the, the, the point here is that if you're targeting wealthy countries and wealthy phone users, then it might make sense for you to target your iOS audience first. If you're uh, not really caring about if they pay for your app, but you're more targeted at the actual service, then of course this is not as relevant information. Uh, let's take a look at the competition though. Just one chart here that shows um, an approximate, this isn't any statistical thing, but just to let you know that if you think you're gonna crack into the top 10, uh, your chances of becoming one of the super apps in the time usage is probably about as likely as you are going to become uh, a movie star or an NFL quarterback. So just plan on finding a niche and uh, working with that. And so check out another video here. I'll put a link on it for uh, finding a niche and comparing your competition so that you're not crushed by grand uh, ideas that are just disappointments. Now let's take a look here at uh, some statistics that come from Google. So I borrowed these from these slides from Google Research. So here's one statement that they, they make here to, to temper your expectations. Half of the people that use applications have never ever paid for an app. <laughs> Not too surprising. Most people just want free, right? And so why do people actually pay for an app or subscribe to a service? Well, here are the top reasons. Number one, it had the content I wanted. So my prediction is on this survey, it was probably Netflix that most people decided to subscribe to or Disney Plus or something like that. So you might be a, a sports fan and willing to pay for ESPN or whatever favorite movie channel you are on. Those are content is king type of applications. Uh, the next one down, it says here, uh, it offered features and functionality unavailable on free alternatives. So I would say that's a pretty unique app. If you can design something that nobody else provides for free, that's pretty good. Uh, I want an ad that is, uh, app that is ad-free. So you can annoy your people so much that they finally pay the dollar to get your commercially free app. That's, that's one way you can get paid. Uh, there were no free alternatives, seems unlikely, and the app had good reviews. And so I would say if you would probably compare yourself to most others, you would, you would say these, this is a reasonable list of ways that people are willing to pay for your app. So when you think about monetizing your app, do you have such a strong set of content or value in your app that it doesn't exist in other places, then you might be able to charge subscriptions or you might be able to 
uh, have people pay you. So that's some food for thought. Now let's talk about revenue models because there's lots of ways that people make money when they're trying to uh, create an app. So it's not just about selling your app. And so I put together a list here of about, what is it, six or seven of ways that people can make money as an app developer. And so let's go through each of these. So first of all, the first is you could just charge money for your app. Now look at Minecraft. That's one of the most popular apps on the phone of any type. And you can see that it's $7.49 to buy. Now no one in their right mind is going to pay money for an app that's no good. But everyone knows, or in their target audience, knows that Minecraft is a really cool game. And they're willing to pay it. So it's not common to do this. It's for a niche market, uh, people that need this or really are liking your service. And it's good for complex or unique app that no one else has. So if you can build the next Minecraft or something like it, then go ahead and put a price tag on it. Now the next item is advertising. And so this is pretty much what you can think of as games, right? I mean, every game that I've played shows me super annoying ads. It works well on the ad model only if you have a huge number of users. And so if you are the lucky few that get a, uh, a viral app that everyone wants to play, you might make some money on an, on an ad. However, if you've got a very narrow audience, which is probably the more recommended route, uh, find your audience and, and close in on the ideal customer, that is not a good candidate for advertising because you don't want to annoy the few people that are really your true fans. You want to find some other way to charge them money. And so advertising revenue might be great if you are Candy Crush, but uh, for everyone else, not so much. Uh, the freemium is probably the uh, best model that you can think of. So it's the most popular model for making money. It's more profitable to do freemium than by selling your app or by putting ads on it. And also, you can create quite a large audience because everyone gets to try your app for free. And then if they bump into features that they really want, they might be willing to pay you a subscription or a fee to get it. And you can be guaranteed that people are pretty satisfied with the app. If they've tried it, they use it, and they're willing to give you that extra freemium part, then you've got a true fan. And so I would recommend that if you're contemplating a business model, think of freemium as the way to go. So there's a free service, there's the standard, and then of course the premium. And so don't give away all of the great features of your app at the beginning hide some of those that are going to be critical but still um, give the user an experience to try it out and so i think almost all of the apps that i've paid for have been through a freemium model now think of e-commerce and you're trying to sell items so whether it's amazon or ebay or etsy or somebody like that you're going to have to have a massive business that will actually sell things and so good luck in competing against amazon uh, E-commerce platforms, however, is a little bit different. You don't have to be the store. You can be the store that connects people to stores. And so think of eBay. You know, then eBay doesn't sell anything. They just connect people. Uh, offer up. It's like Craigslist, but on an app form that people like. Uh, Hotels.com or Orbitz or any of the travel services. Airbnb, of course, is the biggest hotel business in the world, and they don't own a single hotel room. They just link you with people that have rooms. And so an e-commerce platform is a great way to connect buyers and sellers, and you take a cut or a sliver of the transaction fee. So just this past week, I took a vacation and rented a car through the app called Turo. Never tried it before, but it worked. Uh, a guy met me at the airport, gave me his car keys. I borrowed his car for a week and paid him, uh, it was 300 and some dollars. It was it was 40% um, off of what the car rental company was willing to charge me. And it worked out as well as anything that you would expect at Airbnb. So uh, think of a service that people need and uh, people that are trying to sell something and you get in the middle and take a snip of the uh, the credit and of course your profits will grow as your user base grows. Subscription models of course are the content people. So Netflix spends billions of dollars a year to get their own movies and so you know you're willing to pay your your monthly fee. 
uh, uh, language apps seem to be a great subscription model because people can't learn a language in just uh, a week or a month even or maybe even a year and so if you're doing a real good service that requires constant use then of course a subscription makes sense so I put on here Spotify I'm a customer of them all trails I mentioned before in some of my previous videos where I want to find hiking trails and get maps of where I'm going and, and I'm willing to pay for an annual subscription because it's a valuable service to me so think of ways that people are constantly using your app and you provide information that changes over a time or there's a, such a vast amount of information that they, they can't get it all in one go. And so that might be a good model for you with subscriptions. In the last category we have our in-app purchases. So these work really well with games. So you know when you tried Farmville many years ago uh, you could play for free but then it took forever to grow your crops. Here's a list of games that are super profitable and all of them are free to play but cost you money if you want to play it quickly or advance to higher levels and so game makers have figured out that once you have people addicted to your game they'll sometimes pay anything even if it doesn't make any sense to continue on so you can see that they're selling $99 $100 for pokey coins would you really pay $100 for an app not likely but somehow, if you're addicted, you're going to pay uh, $99 for a bunch of virtual coins. Go figure. If you're interested in learning how to market your app, then watch the next video, which is called Marketing Your App. And if you'd like to see the entire course playlist, I'll put that link here as well, so you can see the business of applications. Make sure you subscribe and join us again for class. Thank you. Hi, in this video we're going to be talking about the business of building apps. More specifically, we're going to be talking about marketing your app and collecting customers. So in this unit, we're talking about the business of building applications. We're on part three, which is on marketing and monetizing. So if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do that to go back and see the other chapters in this course. So uh, my name is Shad Sluter, and I teach software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University. And so join me for class to see all of these topics and we'll learn together. Now in this video we're talking about the app business plans and so there are four sections about planning your business and we've already looked at two of them. So we're on part three right now which is about marketing. So how do you collect customers? How do you get their attention? And uh, we'll talk about retaining them in a new uh, video in the future but we want to get them in the door. That's really what we're dealing with here. So marketing your application. So marketing is not just the idea that it looks cool, but we have to reach the right people with a value proposition that makes sense and it's authentic to them. And so what I'm going to do now is show you some discoveries that Google provided me. So the slides that you're going to see here are from Google's market research. So take this with a grain of salt because they think that search engines, of course, are the only way or the best way that people should work with. But they have some data to support up their, their, their claims. So it says here, apps are often discovered outside of the app store. So it's important that you have a good description of your app. There's no doubt about it. You should have a clear uh, selling point when people find you in the app store. However, people usually hear about you in some other way. And so family, friends, and colleagues are the most important way that you can collect new people. So in another video, we'll talk about making your app addictive and why it works when you have people making recommendations for you. And so that'll be an important part of your app design is making a share button or an invite button where people are required to join together to do something on your app. And so personal recommendations are your best tool for gaining new customers. However, you can see that there are others that are just uh, worthy of your time as well. So making a good company website, having a good description in the app store, and search engines can work somewhat as well. But those main two categories at the top are what we should consider our vital information. Now, search is a driver in app discovery. So it says here, one in four people use search engines to find an app. 
which makes sense. You're looking for a solution to a problem. And of course, Google is there to collect your ad. Now, search is, is uh, more effective in certain categories than others. So here are three. So tra travel and technology and local apps. So apps that are considered local, I suppose, for your own city or something like that. So technology is good for search. So for instance, you say, I want an app that can free up memory on my phone. I'm gonna go to Google, that's the first place I would look for. Uh, travel, of course, I'm trying to find a destination and there might be a tour guide for the city that I'm going to or something like that. And so a niche market for targeting people that are doing searches about it. And so you can see the rest of them are not quite as good for your search results and in, in collecting new customers. So think of the app that you've got, your dream app that you're trying to build, and see which category it fits in here. And then you can decide whether or not that Google search or buying ads on Google will be a main strategy in gaining new customers for you. So you'll be the best judge on deciding if that is a good channel. So think about the uh, factors that influence the download. Why do people click the button and install the app? So here's some of them. So why do people install? Well, believe it or not, search ads are effective in, in driving app downloads. So a search ad is perfect because you know the, what's on the user's mind. You, you, you've seen what they've looked for. And if you can target that, then it's the same, same strategy that, that we've been using for decades now with uh, targeting relevant ads to users. Uh, I can't believe the second one here, though it says banner and graphical ads inside of apps. That must be uh, skewed because you get all these, uh, when, you, when you play a game, right? You play a game and you get ads, they're for other games. Which makes sense. If you're into games, you'll probably download another game if it, if it looks fun. And then the others are different ads for website ads and video ads. So I think it probably goes without saying that if you know who your users are and you know what apps and things that they're already looking at, you can probably uh, cross-pollinate. You can probably get them to jump over into your market as well if you already know that they're in an, an adjacent market. And so look for competitors. Uh, interests and uh, fun, okay? Recommendations for others. So. Why would you want to install? Here's, the, here's another factor. So recommendations from others. Uh, number two, or the second one on the right here, is familiarity with the company and brand. This makes sense because let's say you're, um, let's say you're talking about an airline app. Uh, you, you booked a flight with American Airlines and now you know that you have to check in with an app. Well, you're gonna, you're gonna choose their, their app, of course. You're, you're, you're their customer. So this isn't so much about acquiring new customers maybe, is, is serving your existing cu customers better. So does your app provide something that their website doesn't? And so I'll provide you a link with another question about why would you choose an app over a website? Because you might not need an app at all if your website's doing the job. And so there's some other factors. Here is probably the most important, is about price. And so in a previous video, we talked about how you can monetize your app and free apps with a freemium model where you have certain features that are extra money is far more effective than trying to charge money for the app up front. Because when it says here, factors important, 82% uh, say price, that means free, right? Uh, price means no price and people are not going to pay you money for an app that they've not really tested out. Uh, get good ratings, of course, that goes without saying. People with bad ratings are just going to scare away new users. Uh, the description, you better have a clear description and good screenshots in the App Store, otherwise people will probably not know what they're getting. And then the others are reviews. So most users expect their apps to be free, but that it is also determined on the category. So check the top app out, uh, technology apps. So I can think of recently, I paid $10 for an app, for a technology app. I had a, um, an app that would allow me to extend my desktop screen to my, um, my tablet. And so it was like having a second monitor, kind of cool, using, using the USB cord connection or even a Wi-Fi connection. 
So I think I spent $10 or something like that. And I'm not likely going to spend $10 on most apps, but that provided me with a, a portable second monitor. And for where my kind of work, it was great because I'm carrying my laptop to different classrooms and working in places that are not my office, or at least I did before the COVID uh, scare. And so I was willing to pay $10 for a technology app. So if you've got something that is solving a technology problem, that might be a good fee that you put on it. Uh, however, at the bottom, you can see the other extreme is gaming. People will probably not pay you for your game. Uh, they want to play free games because 12-year-old kids don't have a lot of money. And for them, a $2 fee is going to be a, a game, game breaker, you know? It's not going to happen. And so make sure that you know your audience. So the next step in your business process is probably talking about investors. And so the next video will talk about pitching your plan. If you'd like to see the entire playlist for the business of applications, I'll put this link on the screen as well, the business course on building apps. My name is Shad. Make sure you subscribe and come to class with me again. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the business of building applications. So this is about mobile applications and the business plans that go with them. So we're in a course that has several units and we're on part three right now, which is called marketing and monetizing your app. So you can see that there are other topics that are here. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, make sure that you subscribe and you can join me for class on other occasions. My name is Shad Sluter and I teach software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University. So welcome to class and please come again. So we're in the app business plan area right now, which is talking about money and how to make money. And so we're in part four, which is at the bottom here of this grid, the investors that you're going to deal with. So some of you will never get to the investor stage or probably will never get there because this requires a lot of momentum in your business. So go back and talk about your business model first and how you plan to make money before you ask other people to help you out. So investors are kind of scary. It's a whole new field that is beyond what most of us computer science people are good at. I mean, we're building things that are built out of bits and bytes and user interfaces. And now we're talking about managing money and partnerships. So why do you want an investor? Well, maybe you don't want an investor, but if you do, you have to have a good reason. So here are some of the reasons. First of all, you have to expand what's already going and you don't have enough capital. Maybe you need advertising to grow your, your market or you have development of a new phase of your business and you're going to need some investment to help you there. Or these partners will have networks that will help you out. So there are a variety of ways where you would want to bring somebody in. But there are, of course, drawbacks. People don't just give you money. They want a segment of your company. And so if you give away part of your company, you no longer own that. And you lose equity. So you may start off with 100% ownership of your company. But by the time the investors are done, you will be a minority owner of your own company. You might even lose control of your company. They won't like the way that you're running it. And since they have the cash, they make the final decision. And of course, there's always the possibility of conflict. I think the most uh, famous example, at least from my world, is Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple, or the co-founder of Apple, was fired from his own company by the board of directors. And uh, of course, the people that fired him nearly drove Apple into the ground and were basically a bankrupt company and they asked Steve Jobs to come back. So unless you're Steve Jobs, you probably won't get that second chance. But anyway, investors have a lot to offer, but they come at a price. So the stages of growth though are maybe so far away that you're not even ready for that. In the first stage, usually most companies are in their what they call the bootstrap stage. You look at your own money first, and so you mortgage your house, or you max out your credit cards, or maybe you were just born rich, but you have to have your own funds. And then the second is you ask your friends and your family to help you. And of course, you give them a share of the company. And you say, hey, for 10%, give me $100,000, and you can be a billionaire in 10 years. Maybe, maybe not. But you have to have people that really believe in you. Because you can't really uh, sell your friendships 
unless you've got some some pretty good plans. So you can have some potential for problems. Uh, business incubators are probably going to be in one of the stages where you're thinking about growing. So you've got a product, uh, you need a you need some office space, you've got some employees now, and you got to have some uh, some space. And so governments usually are pretty nice. They give you these incubation centers or these business uh, uh, playgrounds, or I don't know what you would call them, but these these uh, low cost and early stage kind of growth. They might even give you grants and give you some free money if you promise to hire people. So where I work at Grand Canyon University, we have a place called Canyon Ventures. And so if you if you've got an app or if you've got a business, please contact uh, my employer. They will give you free office space, uh, literally no rent. Uh, they will give you access to internet and technology and, and, and advice. There's only one caveat, is that you have to hire my students, which is a great deal because my students are really smart, right? They uh, know how to program in different languages and, well, I've taught them everything I know. So if you hire my students, the university gets the benefit that they think is value to them. But you get free rent and you've got yourself a great environment where I don't know, there's at least 50 companies now working in the business venture area, and a lot of them with, uh, are dealing with technology. And so you are networking as well as getting some free uh, office space. Uh, venture capital is eventually going to come where you've gotten a certain stage. You, your company is working now when you get to this stage, and angel investors are willing to give you large amounts of money, millions perhaps, if they have some questions that they can answer. So if you ever watch Shark Tank, uh, these are usually the venture capital kind of stage where people have some track record to prove that they're making income. And then far into the future, when your app really hits it big, then most people have what they call an exit strategy where they lose control of the company, but they get a couple of billion dollars out of it if they're lucky. And so they want to be bought out or maybe the company is unique and will stand on its own and will become a public company. And so you have your... IPO or your initial public offering and you sell stocks and so the idea is you want to be a partial owner of something really big than to be a full owner of something really small. They say it's better to have a slice of the watermelon than to own the entire grape. I guess that's the analogy. And so those are the stages of your investment and the growth of your company and where you're going to get your funds to make it work. So let's give some examples here of some apps that really hit it quite big. So you might remember, if you're old enough, that Instagram was its own company and it was growing quickly and Facebook bought them. They could see that they were a rising threat. And so for a cool billion dollars, Facebook quenched that problem. Tumblr was purchased by Yahoo. Well, just recently Yahoo was being sold by, I think Verizon is their latest ownership. And Tumblr is no longer part of Yahoo. Anyway, it's an old, old, old business. But they paid a billion dollars at one point for a, this web app. Uh, Skype, famously purchased by Microsoft for $8 billion. And uh, Microsoft somehow missed it. Uh, Zoom became the thing in the COVID era of working from home. Uh, Microsoft and its billions couldn't compete. Uh, I don't know. Is Skype that good? Or maybe not. Now, WhatsApp was purchased by Facebook for $19 billion. Facebook obviously has way too much money that they can just buy their competitors. I predict that in the future, the government won't be so keen on letting them buy everybody. Uh, that starts to look like anti-competitive behavior, if you ask me. So most investors are thinking about this kind of a long-term payback. They're, your business is going to grow really well and some other wealthy company will hopefully buy you. And that's when they get their money back. And so everyone gets rich in the process and hopefully the app continues on working as well as it did before. Uh, large companies have a bad reputation of destroying good products just because they were competitors. But anyway, the owner gets the cash and hopefully the workers still have a job after the merger occurs. Now, if you talk to investors, they're going to have some very specific questions. So these are some of them. Are you committed to your plan? So they're judging you just as much as their product. Are you a trustworthy employee? Because if they give you a large chunk of cash, 
they're investing in you just as much as your idea. Are you skilled enough? Do they think that you're a competent owner of the business? Uh, they obviously are not going to invest money in somebody that will squander it. How much money are you spending? That's a huge question. You might have a million dollars of revenue, but if it costs you a million dollars to create that revenue, your company is really at zero. And so cost cutting is very important to investors. How fast are you growing? Investors don't want to see a 5% annual growth in most companies. That would be for a mature company. But a startup has to be at rocket level acceleration because they expect to see huge returns because many times businesses don't work out. How, how do you compare to the competition? So do investors already own something or stock in somebody else that is your direct competitor? If so, then there might be conflicts. Uh, who else is invested? So you might come and ask for help from an investor, but you've already sold most of your company to other investors. And so they're going to come in and be a minority voice in your company. They might not be interested in that. How about this? Will you be profitable? Of course, that's the whole bottom line, isn't it? And then finally, how much of the company are you willing to give me? And so this is a, is a struggle. Do you really want to give away control of your baby to somebody else that just sees it as a dollar sign proposition? because you are emotionally invested in the idea that you created. So I'm not really a business expert, so I, I'm probably not the best authority to talk about most of this, but if you've, if you've watched the pitch on uh, Shark Tank, you get the idea. People have a story of who they are, what value they create, and how successful they currently are. And so some of the usual questions that I just went through here are the same ones that you get from the panel of judges on Shark Tank. They want to know, how profitable are you? Uh, what's your expenses? Uh, what, what's your story? Who else is invested? And, and things like that. Once again, uh, as I mentioned, at Grand Canyon University, as probably most other universities, we have these panels of investors that are willing to take a look at companies that even our own students are working on and give them help and support and investments and guidance. So find out who is doing this kind of work in your local area and attend the meetings and watch other pitches, and maybe you can get some help as well with your own business plan. Now, if you want to design a product that is truly addictive, then there are some principles that we can go through here in the next video. If you'd like to see the entire course playlist for the business of apps, I'll put that link here as well. And if you haven't subscribed, make sure you do that now. Welcome to class, and keep watching. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course for people who are not only developers, but also designers. So we're in the part three, the chapter three of this course, which is about marketing and monetizing our app, or you might call it the business plan. And so I'm going to call this assignment activity number three. So what are we going to do in activity three? We're going to write a plan that will tell us how we're going to make this a viable business, who our relationships are with, how we expect to get money, and what our expenses will be. So the background of this assignment is I want you to identify those things, key relationships and strategies to make your app work. So if you remember from a previous lesson that I have, uh, I talked about this diagram here that is going to tell you about all of the different parts of your business. So this is called the BMC or the Business Model Canvas. And so it identifies all the key partners, key activities, key expenses, how we are going to make our business run. And so in one page, you have a business plan. So here's the instructions. Following this model, I want you to create a one-page summary of the plan for why your application will be a viable business. Make sure that you identify the key relationships and the customers and the revenue streams that you are going to have in your business. So then what I want you to deliver to me then is a one-page document. So this can be a Word document that has the plan and make sure that you hit all of those high points. So if you haven't seen the video on the BMC, then go ahead and check out the playlist. And if you have seen it, then get right ahead and start it on your thinking process of why your business is a viable business. I would grade, grade you based on how thorough you are and how thoughtful it, it includes all of these different uh, items. So if you need to include details, then please do. So if you're not one of my students, of course, if you're trying to create a business, then I recommend that you create a plan that you can uh, uh, talk to yourself about as well as with your partners. 
In any case, I will put the uh, course playlist here so you can see more details and the other chapters that we're talking about, and I will see you in the next class. Hi, and welcome to this video here that's in a series about the business of building mobile applications. And we're in a class right now which is going to have several chapters. And so we are on part four right now, which is about building customer loyalty. So if the other topics here look of interest to you, then make sure you subscribe. Uh, my name is Shad Sluter, and I teach computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. And so this is one of the courses that I'm involved with. So if you like this, please subscribe and make sure you come to class with me. So what we're talking about today is building customer loyalty. Or you might call this making your apps addictive. Depends on how you want to phrase it. But the idea is that we want to retain our customers and make our app successful. So why do people abandon their apps? So I have a few slides here from Google that will help us answer those questions. First of all, there's an opportunity here. So if you're like me, you're probably going to build apps that fit this category, that they never get used after the users create them. So there's a fantastic art in making an app that's addictive or loyal. And so we want to find out what some of those principles are. Customers frequently never use their app for more than the one time they're forced to. So you can probably relate. I've been on airlines where they force you to download an app to get a boarding pass, and I'm probably not gonna fly for a long time, so I just delete the app. So we don't want users to treat our app as a necessity. We want to make something that's attractive and even addictive. Why do people quit using your app? Well, the number one reason is probably obvious. They get bored with it. It's the same old, same old, there's no variety, so why bother? So they just kind of lose interest. Or perhaps they had a need that they wanted to fill and your app did that and now it no longer is necessary. And so those are some of the main reasons why people would abandon an app. So Google in their research says that sometimes we can reward users for coming back to an app. So a coupon or a discount or some kind of bonus content. And so when you get the alert on your phone that says there's something new or something valuable, they'll probably open the app again. So what we're looking at in this series is how to make those things happen. Uh, if you're into a category that is about sales, then of course discounts are going to be a, a big deal. But if you're just in an app that's meant for entertainment or education or some kind of social media, there might be some other ways that you can make them come back. We have two goals, really. Goal number one is that eventually you want to have an internal trigger that when they see the icon on your phone, they are going to want to open it for some reason. It's the first to mind solution. So I have a question for you here. When you have a question, what's the first to mind solution that you think of? Well, it's Google, of course. Google it. What else would you use to find an answer? They have successfully planted themselves, in my mind at least, as the solution to this problem. How about this? You're alone and you got your phone with you. What do you do when you feel lonely? Well, you're probably going to Facebook or Snapchat or some social media item, or maybe your email or your texting, whatever it is, the solution here is to kill the pain of being lonely. Boredom. So when smartphones were introduced, uh, somebody I remember once told me that we will never be bored again. So it doesn't have to be just games. Um, sometimes looking at your favorite news site is a way to kill boredom or casual games. How about this? Number two, your customer loyalty goal is to try to create a compulsion. Okay, now we're getting into some gray areas here about either your app being a loyalty app or being addictive apps. Well, addictions here are actually a case. Uh, here's one. Have you ever heard anyone say this? I have to harvest my strawberries. Uh, this might go back a few more years than you're used to, but I remember Farmville was an addictive app where people had to plant crops and they couldn't leave them alone. But here's one that's probably a little more up to date that'll always be in our consciousness. I posted a picture and I went back three times to check how many people liked it. So we're pretty much addicted to being liked. How about this one? Just one more episode. 
And so whether it's YouTube or Netflix, there's more content than we'll ever be able to consume in our lives. And we just seem to keep watching. How about this one? We have a dilemma, as I've already raised, is if you're going to try to design your app to be loyal or addictive, we have a responsibility. Hopefully what you're building is something that is socially redeemable. It's worthwhile. And so you're not here just to say, I want to make money on my app. Hopefully you have a higher purpose in your business plan than just to create money. Maybe you could have it a little better when you say like this, I want to encourage people to practice healthy behaviors. So let's say your app is to help people learn a foreign language or with their math tutoring or lose weight or to be able to save time or to connect with friends. Those are all great goals. And so if you make somebody a loyal user in something that is a worthwhile cause, then of course the morality of addiction is, is pretty good. However, if all you're building is something that will take people's time and money, then shame on you. How about this? Let's go to the hook. This is a model that we're going to follow through, a proven strategy that has been studied to figure out why people keep coming back to the apps that they do. There's four items. First of all, there's a trigger that causes them to enter the app. Then there's an action, which better be simple and it better be engaging. Then there's the variable reward so that the app doesn't become boring. So every time you open up the app, there's something interesting and a little bit unexpected that you are wanting to see. And so that way you're more motivated to return to it. And then finally, you have to have something from the user, something that they have to do, such as save their place, save a file, build a reputation, or something that they invest in and so that they feel like they have to keep coming back, otherwise they've abandoned some of their work. And so this idea of the hook literally comes from a book called Hooked. <laughs> and you can see the subtitle is How to Build Habit-Forming Products. So once again, habit-forming products can be a bad thing if all you're doing is hooking people on destructive behaviors. So before you try to make your app so addictive that's, that you're hooking users, Make sure that it's something that's worthwhile doing. So let's review this hook. There has to be somewhere to start. You can't just put people on the circle without a beginning. And so the external hook is really where we're going to begin. So this external thing causes a trigger. And then that comes to the action. Then that goes to the variable reward and the user investment and hopefully re-triggering again. So we need a trigger to get us started. So how did Facebook become a 2 billion user app? Well, they had to start somewhere, and so they made it a cool thing. You're not going to be able to immediately launch a very popular app without some investment, which is why companies require a bit of money to get started. So here's one way to do it. You can just buy Google Ads. <laughs> I kind of probably are going to regret this, but I put into my Google search, find a car loan. And of course, you can see that there are no organic search results. Every single thing on here is an ad. And uh, I bet it costs quite a bit of money for those people to be placed so high. So anyway, if a person has a need, they're going to go to Google and search for that. This is probably a way that you can start people on your app. What is the need that your app serves? Buy an ad. And you can acquire customers through paid ads. Of course, this will be expensive at first, but really there's no shortcut to getting new people into your app. Well, once you've got a few people, another way to get customers and to get them hooked or the initial acquiring stage is to have your social connections. And so you're hopefully going to be able to send an announcement or a text or an email to somebody from a respected friend and they're going to invite you to come. And so you can acquire customers through friends. Maybe your app requires that friend to comment or to play a game with you or to share a picture or something, but we want to be able to make the growth organic because you can't pay for Google ads for very long. Then the next item is once you've got an app and you've got it running, they're going to forget about it. Your users will install it and ignore it. And of course, you better have a good reason for them to come back. For example, in this case, it says, hey, two items in your shopping cart are on sale. Well, if you're a shopper app, 
and you installed it at one time because you wanted to save money, this will probably bring you back into the circle. And so this is all examples of the initial hook, the part that gets you going. So we want to re-engage or to engage new customers. So let's summarize the start. So we can either do a search result or we can have a notification from a friend, but there's another way, probably the most effective way of all, other than these mechanical and artificial ways. We want to do it naturally. We want to create an urge inside our user's mind to be either the first solution that comes to mind or a solution to a pain or a problem. And so this is called an internal trigger. So an internal trigger doesn't require any money. It's what we want to get to. That's our goal. We want our users to have that feeling that they have to open your app. So you look at your phone, maybe when you're bored, and one icon kind of jumps out over all the others. So in my case, uh, Instagram's a pretty common one. I want to open it. I'm curious, what's there? But what's the real reason that that app is in my habit cycle? Well, there could be this fear of missing out. I want to know what's going on. What are my friends up to and what's happening in the world? Or I have this problem where I always want to seem to take a vacation. I want to travel. And so what a great app. I can look around the world and find creative hikes to take in cities and beautiful places that I haven't been yet and I want to go. Or maybe you're more into the social connections with these social apps and you're lonely and you want to know what your family or your friends are doing. Well, any way that you look at it, an app like Instagram has an internal motivation. It's the trigger. Just by being installed and showing up on the desktop, you're going to have a trigger to use it. So how do you trip those internal triggers? How do you get to that part? In a previous video, we talked about the five whys. The five whys can bring you to the root cause of something. So why would Julie want to use email? So that she can receive messages, of course. The second why in the list brings you a little deeper. And why would she want to receive messages? Well, she wants to share information quickly. Why would she want to do that? Well, she wants to know what's going on with her coworkers, friends, and family. Well, why does she need to know that? See how the whys just keep piling on? She wants to know if somebody needs her. And why does she need to do that? Because she fears of being out of the loop. And so there is that deeper need. She fears something. And we're going to meet that. And that will become an internal trigger if we can solve that. So that's the orange bubble. That's what we've looked at is the trigger part. Now let's talk about the action. So if you want to make an addictive apps, what do we have to do in that action stage? So the action is the main activity. What do you do with your app? Do you show pictures? Do you share coupons? Do you do something? So that better have some features. That we'll call our app experience. And if you get that right, then people will have that feeling of wanting to come back again and again. So in the action, there better be two principles here that are met. First of all, it has to be easy. And then the second, it has to be something motivating. It's emotionally satisfying. It's cool. I like it. And so those are pretty broad and pretty hard to define, really. So let's talk about some examples. So if we were to say we want to have uh, an ingredients to look at what causes an action, we would say that there has to be three ingredients. There's the motivation, the ability to do it, and a trigger. Now we've talked about motivations and triggers already. The action part, the part that you're trying to program and that your users are engaged with is number two. How difficult is your app to use? And like I mentioned, it better be simple and it better be kind of fun. So take a look here at the uh, percent of ease of use, we'll call this, compared to the number of users that are actually using the product. And so you can see Pinterest in the top right corner is really easy to publish something online. And if you look back in time, uh, the other ones are slightly more difficult. And so the idea is make it so easy that the users can't not do it. So how do you measure effort? Well, you can measure it in several ways. You can say it's time or it costs money or it's thought 
in consuming, it's difficult to understand, or you might do something that would be embarrassing, and we'll call that a social cost, or it breaks the routine, and that makes it more difficult. And so the resistance to making your app action happen goes up if we increase any of those ingredients. If it takes too long, if it's too complex, if it costs too much money, or if you're going to embarrass your users, they're probably not going to do it. And so we want to keep all of those things to a minimum. Now, just a simple design in your app can make that difference. So think if you were going to show a list of pictures. You could do it with the results of an infinite scroll so that the user has nothing to do but keep moving their thumb and see what's next. So that's kind of the Instagram approach. Really, no one ever reaches the bottom of their Instagram feed. However, if you were to break it up into pages and just showed 10 pictures per page, you would have a natural break and people would stop after one or two page links. And so that's a real simple design of making it simple and easy to use. One term that you'll hear in this, in this kind of a conversation is the idea of frictionless. Frictionless is usually uh, about buying things. So Amazon famously has the buy with one click button. That's pretty frictionless. They've got your credit card saved and you don't have to think too much. Or in your case, maybe your app has a, a registration screen. Well, don't do the one on the left. You don't want to make that too much time or too much effort. Just have them sign up with their favorite social media account. And so we've talked about the trigger and now the action. So keep the action simple and have something interesting to do or something useful to do. Now the third one that most apps use that are very addictive is something called the variable reward. So that's the third item in this list. So what is a variable reward? Well the reward is the emotional response or payback that you get from using your app. But the modifier is we want to make it variable so that way it is something that we would classify as cool or new. Let me give you an example. So Pinterest is an app that has a variable reward. I opened up the Pinterest page today and took this screenshot. I had no idea what I was going to get. I look across here, I see a craft, it looks like some photos, some poetry. Wow, talk about variability. And the neat thing is, if you, want, if you open an app like uh, Instagram or Pinterest or Facebook or YouTube, you never know quite what's going to be there. But you know you will find something. So here's another picture. So I went to YouTube.com. This is just the front page. And you can see that the YouTube algorithm knows pretty much who I am. I'm interested in technology. I like hiking. But I have no idea why I got this drum line or I got this guy that is... Um, uh, failed cash-in transit heist, uh, whatever. It's just something that is kind of interesting. So check your YouTube feed out and see if they are meeting your variable reward need. Of course, you probably remember, if you've uh, studied this in psychology at all, that variable rewards can reinforce behaviors and cause habits to form. And so the experiment was to give pigeons a reward. If they would tap a button, they would get a seed. They could get something to eat. And so the birds certainly learned how to do that. But then they taught the birds that if they tap a button, they would get a seed only on certain occasions. And it was like a slot machine. It was random. Now the birds formed a stronger habit when they had to tap on the button that never gave them consistent results. And so the uh, habit was stronger when they weren't certain if they were going to get what they wanted. So if it was consistently giving them every click of the button, uh, it wasn't so interesting. But a variable, that was very interesting. And so humans are not a whole lot different. So why do people sit and look at a stupid game that all they can do is press a button and watch pictures? I honestly don't get the idea of slot machines, but a lot of people seem to like them. They are doing variable rewards. Now, if I offered you 80 cents for every dollar that you gave me, you would soon stop that ridiculous transaction. But if we had it variableized, we don't know exactly who's going to win, then you would keep at it. Now, B.F. Skinner, a great psychologist, of course, in behavioralism, talked about these three types of variable rewards. So what kind of classifications are these? We got the tribe, the self, and the hunt. 
So let's re reinforce this with what our apps can do to meet these emotional needs. So first, we'll talk about the self. Okay, what, the, what does that mean? So in your reward, you're going to have some kind of a self-promotion. You've reached a new level. You've unlocked a new feature. You've gained a certificate. You have accomplished something that makes your own capacity greater. And so we'll call that your self-reward. There's also a reward that we could classify as the hunt. So finding something that's really cool before anyone else does. And of course, Pinterest looks to me like a great hunt app. So I'm not sure what I'm going to find there, but I will probably find something. And so there's a variable reward on this one called the hunt. Or here's another one, the variable reward of the tribe. And so sometimes when you make a post, you can only hope that you'll get a million likes on it. Wouldn't that make you feel warm and fuzzy? To say that I picked something that was cool and everybody liked me. Or maybe you're more into the technology, like with Stack Overflow. You answer a question or you post a, post a question and people vote reward points, reputation points. And so who doesn't want to be known as a smart programmer? And so that is a variable reward. You never know what quite you'll get every time you participate. So we've covered three of the four. The last one's coming up here, which is called user investment. And so this one's just as important as the other three. So what is user investment? Well, it's something that you contribute and it makes the product more valuable. Some people would call that the Ikea effect. And so Ikea, of course, is the company that sells furniture in a box and you have to put it together. So first of all, it's cheaper that way. They don't have to assemble it, but you also have to take a little bit of pride to say, I built the desk. So here's an example of an app that would have user investment. So you play this game called Garden Scapes for a while, and uh, probably you're planting vegetables in a garden. And virtually you've gone through three seasons of harvest and now you're quitting the app. And as soon as you close it, it says, hey, stop. I want to help you. You save your progress. You've invested your time. So don't just throw it away. Or maybe uh, you're in your airlines and they say you just took a flight and we'll save your travel miles and you'll come back. So that's the idea. Uh, here's another one where you can have a collection. So you're under some kind of a uh, music play or a video play app and you create a list of things that you like. Well, of course, that's a user investment. When you use the app, and the more you use the app, the more it becomes part of you. And that becomes an emotional attachment. Or maybe something a little bit like uh, this is from LinkedIn. So you start using LinkedIn, you put your profile up, your job experience, and then you stop. Well, they present this to you to say, hey, you're making good progress. Uh, we're almost to this next level. Level up if you can just add a summary of your uh, portfolio or put a photo on it. And so they make it a game so that you can make different levels. So your user investment is going to increase the people's emotional investment in your app. And they're more likely to return if they know they've already collected something and invested the time. It's the same principle that we have here when you have a frequent shopper card. Um, I'm more likely to go back to the a restaurant if I know that I'm just one punch away from a free meal. So here's, here's a kind of a statistic that I think is very telling. So 71% of users will stick to an app if you can get them to use it three times or, or more. So you look at that, 71% uh, is pretty high. So if you can get them to use it more than once, you're on the right track. Three times seems to be a pretty good number. So make sure that there's at least three reasons for them to return to check on something. So our goal here is to reach the habit zone. So the habit zone is going to depend on two factors, it looks like. So the frequency of your app, of course, the how often they come back, and the usefulness of your app. So even though they might not be on your app every single day, if it's something they really need, they won't forget about it. So I'll give you two examples here. So Google. Google is something that we use multiple times, many times a day. And it's pretty useful too, actually, but they're uh, one of the most addictive or we'll call them loyal app user apps that we can find. The other we'll call Amazon. So I don't shop on Amazon every day, but I'm sure some people do that are watching this. Uh, I wonder if you could put in your comments below here of 
What's the most uh, number of purchases you've ever made in a single day on Amazon? And I think of the poor delivery guy that comes here every time I click buy. Well, that's the model. And so the idea is that your app should have either something so useful that they can't forget about you or something that is easy and frequently used. And that will help you become part of the addictive app. Now, once again, let's say that with great power comes great responsibility. So make an app that actually is useful and is something that people should come back to. So don't just do an app because you think it's going to make you money. Make something that will make their life better, and then you will have a good conscience about why people should come back and use your app again. In the next video, we're going to talk about which tools that you should use to build an app, whether it's for cross-platform or single app platform. Also, if you'd like to see the entire playlist for this course, I'll put a link here for the course playlist. So whichever, I thank you for coming, Make sure you subscribe and join me again for the next class. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course for people who are not only programmers, but also business analysts. So we're in section four right now, which is called Building Customer Loyalty. And this is a video that will help you through an assignment that I'm going to give you. If you were one of my students that I am teaching at Grand Canyon University. So in this assignment, the goal here is for you to demonstrate that you understand Hook. So what is Hook? Well, the background is that in a previous lesson, we said that Hooked is the process of retaining loyal customers, or in a more cynical way, how to make your product addictive and so that your customers are stuck with you. So the process of Hook was these four steps. We had trigger, action, variable reward, and user investment. So I'm not going to reteach all this, that was in a different video. So what I want you to do for the assignment then is to demonstrate to me that you understand how this hook process works. So I'm going to ask you, if you are one of my students, to write a paper that summarizes these four steps in the hook process, and of course provide examples when appropriate. Then I want you to look at your own phone and look at the apps that you most commonly work with. So as you describe these four steps in the hook process, I want you to provide examples of where you are being hooked. What are the features of the apps that you currently use? How are they related and how do they map to these four steps? So obviously, if it's something you use frequently, it's something that makes you a loyal customer, maybe even an addicted customer. So the deliverables that I expect to get from you, if you're one of my students, is to get a one-page summary of the hook model, telling me about the four steps. Make sure that as you do, that there are examples given from real life in your personal experience where you have seen hook. So if you haven't seen the other videos, I will leave a link to the playlist for the course so that you can go and see what the information here is. If you are not one of my students, you can probably put in the comments below in the YouTube section of where you have seen these places of hook happen and why they are effective in your life. So in any case, make sure that you subscribe because this might be a valuable information to you. At least I hope it is. And if you're uh, coming back, I will see you again in the next class. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course for people who are designing applications and the business decisions that go with them. So there's multiple chapters in this course, and we're on chapter four, which is about building customer loyalty. In this particular video, I'm going to talk about an assignment. If you were one of my students at Grand Canyon University, this is what I would ask you to do for homework, activity 4.2. And the goal here is to apply the hook process to the design of your own app. Now, if you don't know what Hook is, make sure that you go back and look at the previous videos. Hook is the process of making an app work well so that way you become a loyal or maybe an addicted customer. So what I want you to do now is to go and review the business plan. In a previous assignments, I asked you to create a, a business plan which includes your relationships, uh, your revenue streams, and your costs. And I want you to take a look at uh, the app that you designed and all of the user stories that go with it. So you will notice that when you have your user stories in a chart, 
that there may be gaps of things that you um, didn't include uh, of the hook process. So think about this way. Hook is the trigger, the action, the re variable reward, and user investment. So like I said, that's been taught already. So what I want you to do is with an assignment, I'm going to have you to create a table. So I'm going to show you a table in just a second. So you can either do it on, from scratch or copy the one that I give you. And I'm going to ask you to review all of the features in your app and see if you can add some new ones that would increase your customer loyalty. For each new feature that you add, tell me where it fits in the hook model. So for instance, if there are four different things in the hook model, such as trigger, action, reward, and user investment, then which of the features in your user stories map to those items? And most likely there's going to be some gaps. So what I want you to do is to add new features. So for instance, you might say you forgot to put in here, as a user, I want to share some feature of what I've done with other friends. So that may have not been in your user stories yet. Or you might have something like, as a user, I want to be able to save my progress so that I can come back later and continue where I left off. So that may have not been in one of your user stories. I'm just suggesting that those are two likely items that you would put in this chart. So the goal here is to review all of the user stories and see if you can fill in some gaps where you have not made your app very loyal, friendly, or addictive. So if you were to submit this to me as your teacher, I would expect to get a Word document that would have this table in it. And in that table, there would be improvements and new user stories that are mapped to those four items in the hook model. So if you'd like to see the entire playlist for the course, I will put that here so you can go back and see what the hook model is and the other items for building apps are. So if you're one of my students, I will see you again in the next class. And if not, please subscribe and join us. Hi, welcome to this video where we're talking about the business of building mobile applications. And so we're in the middle of a course which has got several chapters. And so if you like what you see here, make sure that you subscribe. We are on chapter five, which is choosing the right tools for your mobile application. So in this unit, we're going to be talking about what technically you can do with a phone and maybe what works better with a mobile website. So my name is Shad Sluter and I teach computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. And I'm glad you joined us. So make sure that you subscribe to catch all of these and we will become better programmers and better business people as a result. So in this section here about our business tools, our application development tools, we're going to have three different things to look at. First of all, since it is a mobile application course, it seems strange that I'm going to say in this video, why you should not build a mobile application. There are some reasons why it might not be a good idea. In the next video, we're going to be talking about the companies and applications that utilize mobile apps in a very effective way. And then finally, we'll talk about cross-platform mobile choices, what languages and frameworks are best and popular today. So right now, though, I'm going to give you five reasons why it might be a better idea not to build your mobile app, even though you may have started with the assumption that you need a mobile application. So why would that be if the teacher is teaching a class on mobile applications? It's because there are some pretty good alternatives when you compare what you can do with a standard web browser and what you can do in a mobile app. So compare these two pictures on the screen. Which one of these looks like a better experience for the user? So the point is, they're hard to distinguish. So you're at a store, you can browse the catalog, you can see all the products, you can add something to the cart, you can check out, you can use your credit card. Almost everything that you can do on the mobile app, you can do on the, um, on the website. The website is designed to look good on a phone. That's why it's called a mobile first design or a responsive design. And so maybe your phone app isn't really a necessity at all because we can deal with a lot of things when we have just a mobile uh, website. 
But let's talk about some reasons why you would think that a mobile app is required, and then we'll go to the reasons why you might want to just uh, go with a website. Reason number one, you need to have high performance. So if your goal is to build something that is uh, graphically intensive, and like a game here, then a mobile app clearly is the choice because you will never be able to create the same performance in your web browser, such as Chrome. Now the second reason is you probably should consider what phone features are available, and if you need them, then you build an app. For example, if you need to scan something, you're going to use the camera. Also think about the other features of your phone. It has a GPS sensor, so it's location aware. It has an accelerometer, so it knows when it's moved, so you can tell if your phone is being shaken or if it's been turned around in 360 degree space. Uh, the camera obviously is something that a mobile app will be better at than a website. And then there are other accessories. So for instance, think of if you plug in some kind of an external uh, blood pressure reader or some kind of a credit card swiper, those are going to probably need a mobile app, a native app and not a website. So that's probably the biggest reason you would want to choose a mobile app. But if you haven't thought of those, if those are not in your scope, then this is a reason why you shouldn't need a mobile app. Let's talk about push notifications. So what is a push notification? Well, that's the alert that shows up on the phone that says, hey, there's something new, come back to the app. And so if that's important to you, then you can probably use a mobile app and not the uh, website. So you would probably be able to send emails to customers or text alerts. Uh, but if you want to have the pop-up message, then a mobile app is what you need. Also, the value of the icon itself. So when you have an app installed, you own a square of real estate. And if you're really lucky, the user will give you the front page. So that in itself might be enough reason why you would build a mobile app. The user will come back. They don't have to remember your web page address. So those are good reasons for a mobile app. But let's talk about if you would not do the mobile app and you would just make the responsive website, why would that actually be an advantage? So here are some reasons. First of all, mobile apps don't show up in search results very well. Web pages do. And so when people search for a topic on Google, they're going to pick one of the first few links, probably the first three, definitely the first page. And so you want to be able to design an, a web page that is optimized for your keywords, your niche audience. And so a website is a better uh, attractor of search results. Also think of the probably the cost of your mobile application. And this is a very technical reason. One code base. So a one code base means that you have a single server that adapts to a mobile phone, to a tablet, to a desktop, and that all shows up in the Chrome browser or whatever browser the user chooses. The single code base is super important because you either hire another programmer or you split a programmer's attention to two different code bases. Essentially, if you have an iOS app and a Android app and a website, you have three applications. As a business person, you're trying to reduce cost and a, having a single team or a single developer that is focused on a website instead of having three different developers or three different teams, you've cut your cost in less than half using a single code base. So I would say that is probably a powerful reason for a startup to focus on just a mobile friendly website. You don't have to have so much code and development cost. Also think of the technical problems. So every time there is a update to the operating system on Android or iOS, you're going to have to make sure that your app conforms to the new features of the, uh, of, the, of the operating system. Sometimes there's new requirements, sometimes there's permissions that need to be gathered, and you need to go in to your code of your app and update it. And if you don't, you're probably going to have this occur. You're going to have application crashes and people will hate you and give bad feedback. Now, if you build a website, this rarely happens. Now, if a website works on one client, it's likely going to work well on most clients. Now, there are exceptions to that, and you can certainly create a website that crashes. There's no doubt there. But I'm saying that there are less problems with keeping a website up to date 
than there are keeping three or more different versions of a mobile app. Here's another important reason for cost. There are no fees when you build a website. So you would know that uh, apps such as um, the App Store and the Play Store charge you a commission for every transaction inside of your app. So if you're selling virtual goods or subscriptions, uh, they're going to take 30% of your, of your profit or your whole charge, not your profit, but the whole price. And if you, if you make a transaction on a website, uh, no problem at all. They would just uh, not even see that. This does not occur for uh, physical goods. So Amazon is not paying 30% to Apple for every time you buy a uh, item from the Amazon store. But this does apply to subscriptions and virtual goods. Here's a term called instant updates. So this refers to also the technical problems. If you uh, have to update an app, you're going to annoy the user. It takes a few seconds. Uh, sometimes it's automatic. But if you're doing an update to a website, the user doesn't have to download anything. Just the next time that they visit your web page, the uh, changes are in effect. So there are both advantages and disadvantages to choosing a mobile app versus a mobile-friendly web page. In the next video, I'm going to show you examples of eight different companies that really nailed it when it came to designing their mobile app. If you'd like to see the entire playlist for this course, I will put that link here as well. Make sure you subscribe and come back to class with me. Thank you for watching. Hi, and welcome to the Business of Building Applications. This is a series of videos, this for a course that I'm teaching, and we're talking about the business process and the management and design of applications. You can see that there are several chapters that I'm going to cover here, and we are on number five right now, which is focused on choosing the right kinds of tools for the apps that you're building. So if this looks interesting to you, make sure that you subscribe. My name is Shad Sluter, and I am a professor of software technologies at Grand Canyon University. So please come to class with me if you like this kind of thing. These are the other topics that are ahead of us, so there's still more to come. Now let's get right to the point here. We are talking about the app development choices. In the previous video, I said several reasons for why you shouldn't build an app at all, which is kind of a strange thing for a class on building mobile applications. So check that one out if you haven't seen it. Now we're going to focus on this one, this video, about several examples of apps that really nailed it. These are good products. These are companies usually that make an app worth your while. And then we're going to talk about cross-platform apps in the next video. So right now we're talking about nine mobile apps that work. So these are things that actually are worth your download. What is not on the list are a lot of things that you would probably already like as apps. So for instance, this, this example here shows a store where the mobile experience is very similar to the, uh, uh, the app experience on a, on a Chrome browser. And so really there's no advantage of building a custom mobile app for this. So for instance, Amazon, you can do all your shopping on Amazon right through their mobile uh, website. And so uh, it might be a good idea to have the app, but not necessarily. So what we're going to focus on here are people's apps that really require you to have a native app. Let's start with the banks. So banks have done a great job of eliminating the need for the bank itself. And so you've seen commercials where you can do all of your banking online. You just take a photo of it and the bank will process with that photo. Also, it's good for alerts. And so banking has become clearly not just a computer item where you can add and remove and transfer funds, but you can make payments, mobile payments, you can deposit checks. And so the bank app that you have on your phone is likely a good use of your technology there. Now, I'm going to put McDonald's in here. Uh, now, I could probably substitute the McDonald's app for most, uh, f most restaurants. Uh, this is just one that I happen to use. And uh, there's a couple of reasons why I picked it. One, you can reduce your uh, time through the drive through like in half. You don't have to pay for anything. It's already pre-ordered. Also, they give me uh, all kinds of uh, uh, location-aware kind of uh, ideas. So I know that the GPS is watching me, so it knows my patterns. So I included it here as an effective mobile app that uh, I use on a regular basis. The next app I'm going to put on here is no surprise. Uh, a lot of people would expect Lyft 
or that other company, Uber, we would might put in there. Uh, why is this a good mobile solution and not just a web solution? Well, I think the GPS is pretty important here. We have to know where we are and where we want to go. And so the, com the computing there is pretty high. The graphics of the map have to be good. And most importantly, we have to know the GPS location. So I'm going to include Lyft as one of those apps that is transformative. Uh, without a phone, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. And so this is a great example. Now, I didn't include Uber. Um, I have a long memory of companies that I would consider evil. So, so just check the, the news from several years ago about why Uber might be an evil company. So the next company up is Walgreens. Now there's probably other good pharmacy apps out there, but we'll just pick Walgreens because, well, they're famous. So what can you do with an app that you can't do with a website? Well, first of all, you can refill your prescription with a scan. So your, your phone has a camera and they've built the app right there so that it, it'll recognize which bottle you have in your hand and it will connect to your account. Also with Walgreens, you can have telemedicine so you can talk to the doctor or pharmacist without an appointment, perhaps standing right there in the store or as you uh, are on the way. Maybe, hopefully you're not driving and talking, but the Walgreens app is going to eliminate the need for a lot of uh, time consuming work. And you can't do these things in a regular website. So that's why it makes the list of a successful company app. Ikea comes up next. So you remember Ikea is the company that will sell you uh, furniture in a box and you have to assemble it. So what does their app do that's kind of interesting or unique? Well, they have a 3D modeling tool which is based on the technology that's in your phone, like uh, augmented reality, and uh, what's called LiDAR, which is the uh, kind of a radar system using light waves. And uh, you can place furniture in your house and take a look at it. You can paint your walls and wallpaper your house virtually, and you can see the results as you move the phone around. So literally, you spin around looking at your phone, you see the room, and then you have uh, pictures of uh, items of furniture and accessories superimposed over the picture. So a great tool for selling their products. Uh, I don't really know if this is effective as far as increasing sales, but I liked it because it was the cool factor. So maybe that will just allow people to look at uh, IKEA's furniture more often. So personally, I haven't used the app, but I just think it's a great idea. Uh, L'Oreal is a makeup company, of course, and what are they doing that requires a mobile app? Well, you can try on their products. You can put lipstick on or makeup of any kind. You can style your eyes. And it's a virtual kind of an augmented reality experience as well. So this is kind of an Instagram or Snapchat uh, idea, but they're using it to sell their products. And you can see that you can probably click the buy button and uh, you'll be happy with your results, even though you haven't actually tried anything on. Here's an app that probably is just picked out of uh, a classification of many, Golf Shot. So what is Golf Shot? It's a program that allows you to see around yourself. So if you uh, select the golf course name that's in the list, they have all the measurements to the green, to the shortcuts, to the sand traps, and uh, it's kind of like having a caddy that knows the course extremely well. You can see ahead of you. Uh, other similar apps to this I've seen as a Peak Finder app where you show uh, the, the mountains that are around you. It tells you the mountain name. It literally points to an arrow to the peak and says, like, this is Long's Peak in Colorado, which is 14,520 feet tall. And in your golf game, people get pretty serious about golf, right? They want to make sure that they have the proper information. And you get a map of the course that you're looking at. It tells you a little dot on the map where you are, how far you are to the green. And so, once again, this is a great example of an app that requires a native app. It won't work in a website, so download the app. It'll be worth your while. And I predict that rich golf people are going to spend a little bit of money on an app if it'll improve their game. I mean, for goodness sakes, they buy all kinds of expensive golf carts, golf clubs, and clothing, so why not invest a little bit in your mobile app as well. Vuforia Chalk is my next candidate for a great app. So what is it? It's an app that you would use for the remote expert. And almost all the examples that you would see on their website and other uh, propaganda that they show, 
shows a person who's a, a field technician is this person. And he's looking at something very specialized. And you, you can see that superimposed over the picture where he's working is somebody else that is drawing on the, uh, on the tablet. So the technician might not be familiar with this piece of equipment. And so the numbers there say plug in here, disconnect number two, attach number three, and it's an augmented reality solution again. So a collaboration of people looking at an object, even though they might be thousands of miles away. So some years ago, I was involved in a construction project where uh, we were in Mexico and the experts were in Boston. And literally, we were trying to use video chat and cameras. It was It was okay, but... This would have been better if we could have had this uh, augmented reality where we would see and touch and uh, communicate in real time as if we were both looking at the same thing. And so that's a great solution. Obviously, you can't do that with a website only. Health monitoring apps are a big category, and it seems like Android and Apple and Google and, and Apple have already given us some great tools. But... There's probably a niche available for others. So think of uh, gadgets that must plug into your phone. So in this case, we're measuring the uh, oxygen in your blood. And you can't do that with a camera. You can't do it with just a fingerprint sensor. So there's this physical device that plugs into the phone. And as soon as you have a physical device going through a USB cord or some other communications, you're not going to do that with just a website. You're going to have a native mobile app. And so I know that like credit card swipers would be a good example of this. So people that are in a food truck are going to be charging you with a credit card, not with a machine, except for, except for their phone. So another infamous example it was the uh, company called Theranos. Uh, look them up in the news. They're another one of those evil companies that I would refer to in my, my long-term memory. They had a plug-in item to a phone and they claimed that they could replace an entire laboratory with a drop of blood on a microchip, and the app would take care of all of the tests. And uh, it was a little bit of a overpromise and a, a lie, a straight lie. And so the founder of uh, Theranos is in trouble and in criminal court because of her actions. So these are companies that have built apps that are great examples of why you need a mobile solution and not just a website. In this next video, we're going to talk about ways to create cross-platform applications. And so that will reduce the amount of code that you have to write. If you'd like to see the entire course playlist, I'll put this link up as well. And make sure that you subscribe. So welcome to class and come back for some more mobile application development. Hi, welcome to this course called Building Mobile Applications. We're talking about the business problems that are associated with building mobile apps. In this video, we are in part number five, which is right here about choosing the right tools. So we're going to be focusing on choosing the right development tools for a cross-platform mobile solution. If any of these other topics are interesting to you, make sure you subscribe and come back to class when these are available. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University in Phoenix, Arizona. So let's get started on our topic today. So we are talking about development choices that are about cross-platforms. We've already asked the question about should we build a mobile app? And then we've talked about some companies that really nailed it with a great solution that was mobile. And then now we're here on the cross-platform issues. So let's get started on examining what languages, what tools would work best for your company. So really there are three types of language development tools that you can work with when you're talking about mobile development. First of all, there's native code. So this is the um, Android Studio, this is Xcode with Apple, and so you're creating code that is running specifically for that phone. Also there are ways to create web pages that are called responsive design. And so if you're a good web developer, you should think mobile first. And you might not even have to create an app. 
And the third category, the most uh, involved here, is hybrid apps, using technologies that were originally designed for web pages, but we've adapted them to work on phones. So let's first of all talk about the native apps. So if you're going to work on an Apple or an iOS phone, you're going to buy a Macintosh computer and install Xcode. This is the platform for phones as well as tablets. Xcode is like Visual Studio, if you've worked with that before. It's an integrated development environment. Also, the languages that you can pick from if you're developing in native for Apple, you're going to work with Objective-C or Swift. Now, Swift looks a lot like you would expect in JavaScript or Java. Objective-C, well, it looks like nothing else. Uh, maybe COBOL? I'm not sure. But Objective-C is certainly out of favor for most developers these days. Now, if you're working with Android, you're going to be building a native app as well. And their program that is uh, for developing apps is called Android Studio. So Android Studio looks kind of like Xcode, where you have layouts and then you have coding sections. The languages that you're going to be working with are going to be either Java or Kotlin. And so Java, of course, is super popular. It seems like uh, developers have been working on Java for decades. And so if you've got Java skills, then you're ready to go with Android with uh, learning how the libraries, of course, work. But you're ready to program. Now, Kotlin came along just a few years ago, and apparently it is more efficient. You get right, you shorter code, and it's developed specifically for Android. So the disadvantage, obviously, is you have to learn a new language if you're developing in Android. Now, what are the advantages of choosing a native app over some of the other technologies that we're going to show later? So, first of all, if you want to have the best user experience possible for your um, app, then pick native. It's going to run and look like you expect an app to run. It's a real app. It's not some kind of a kludge. Now, the next one that you might say is not necessarily how the app looks, but it's how Apple and Google treat you. They can tell when you submit an app to the store um, how, what, how it was built, what platforms did it run on. And uh, I've been told that you get a better uh, rating, you get higher uh, reviews, and more likely to be promoted on their store. They uh, want users to have good experiences. However, the uh, disadvantages are, are pretty big too. So if you are a developer and you're building in native apps, you will have to learn multiple programming languages. So for some of you, that's not a problem. You've already got your languages in web development or other app development, and you're ready to just adapt them to Android. So if you've already figured out how to program in Java, uh, you're ready to go for most of the skills that you'll need for Android. And of course, Swift is very much like either of those languages, so you're probably not going to be uh, choking on that. However, if you are a brand new developer, if, if you don't really know how to code yet and you want to build a web app, then native apps will be the hardest choice of the three. So uh, a big problem that businesses seem to face when they're developing native apps is that they're actually creating double the work for one app. You have to create an Android version and you have to create an iOS version. And that sounds easy if all you're doing is creating a simple app. However, apps can be complicated and require lots of planning. So you're going to have to design your app twice. You're going to have to build uh, two different testing plans for it. You're going to have to deploy to do two different uh, platforms. You might have two development teams that are working on individual parts of your app. And uh, also you have to maintain your app. So when things change on your phone, you grow up to new versions, your app is going to have to be modified as well. And so it is double the work of just creating a single platform app. So the second way that you can think of when you're trying to serve your mobile users is just to not build an app at all. Just pick a web page design that is responsive. So I think almost every web page out there these days is using mobile first in their design. So you look at a page and you on, on your phone and, and you notice it looks different than the one that you see on your laptop. And your tablet is somewhere in between. These are common web technology design patterns that front-end designers use these days. And so it's not really an app, but it serves the same purpose as maybe uh, what an app would do. Your business has to connect to customers and uh, make your page do both mobile and web. And you've got yourself a solution. So what are the advantages for just using web for mobile? Well, obviously you don't have any extra coding. You don't have to figure out how to create a mobile version of your company app. You just make your web page function for them all. Also, 
it's somewhat simpler to just create your web page. So HTML and JavaScript might all, all be what your, your web page has involved with. So I know that most web pages have Java and C Sharp or PHP or Ruby or some kind of a back end that is really doing the, the server work. And of course, that I wouldn't want to discount your, your development there. But you don't have to worry about compiling a web app, do you? And you don't have to worry about publishing it to a store or promoting it. You just make sure that it has good Google results or your um, typical web page SEO and you're ready to make your mark. So what's the disadvantage of using just pure web pages? Well, apps work better. Uh, on phones, they can, uh, a web page can be slow. And uh, obviously it's not available offline. So if your mobile users are out of range, which they frequently are, your web page just won't work. So you're also missing out on an opportunity to promote your company if all you create is a web page. Uh, the App Store gives you visibility. You can attract visibility, you can attract customers, you can get attention if your app does well in the web store or the App Store. Also, uh, web pages don't do everything that you can with a mobile app. So think of using your camera, your GPS, your uh, accelerometer, and things that are more uh, native and you will not probably get as good of an experience if all you do is a web page. Now the third category brings us into kind of a, a middle ground between those. It's called the hybrid apps. There are three ways to create a hybrid app. The first one we're going to look at is a web view. The second is compiling an app that will be cross-platform compatible. And the third is using something called JavaScript Core, using JavaScript to create native apps. And so let's take a look at these together. First of all, if you're thinking about a web view app, the technology that's probably at the core of this experience is called Cordova. Apache Cordova is an open source project. And you can see from the diagram that it takes a usual web page using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then it does its little black box conversion, and poof, out comes an app that you can put on the web store. It runs on Apple, it runs on uh, Android, and what's that other thing there, that square? Some kind of another third, um, a mobile tool, I guess. I'm not sure what that platform is. But you can make your cross-platform app using just your web technologies. So the advantages of working with that are that it's simple. Uh, if you're already a web developer, then uh, Apache Cordova will make your app uh, out of the code that you've already built. And there's only one code base. So you create one app and it will compile to any of the platforms that are out there. You can publish your app to the App Store, however, it's not going to be as maybe popular as the native apps. You don't have to have an Apple computer, by the way. I think that should be said that if you're, if you're programming an iOS, you're probably going to have, well, you, you have to have a Macintosh to run Xcode. So what are the disadvantages? Well, web view apps look like web pages, and they're just trapped inside a picture frame. And so they will work offline, but they look and feel like a web page. So you're kind of cheating, really, when you're building that kind of an app. Here's an innovative uh, technology. This company called Xamarin has built a nice niche for themselves. They will take a C-sharp program written in Visual Studio and compile it to work with native apps. So it doesn't use Java, it doesn't use Kotlin, it doesn't use Swift, or what's the other? Objective-C. It uses C-sharp, a Microsoft technology, a Microsoft language, and compiles into the native app that you're looking for. So you have one code base to work with, and you have just one language to work with. So the advantages are pretty good. So think of you're creating native apps. You're not trying to shortcut anything, and you have used only one code base. That's probably the biggest reason that people would use Xamarin, is that they only have one version of their app that they have to compile. So they keep track of all the errors in one place, do all the testing in one place, and do all the design in one place. Just one code base. That's a great advantage. And then, of course, it's one language. So C Sharp is a very popular language. Professional developers use C Sharp for everything, and so corporations have already got a good army of developers that can develop a web app, or I'm sorry, a mobile app, using the language they already know. Uh, there's one disadvantage that I can think of is that Xamarin apps uh, compile somewhat larger, sometimes double the size of a regular native app. Uh, that has to do with something of how the runtime libraries are attached to the app. But 
Xamarin is a good choice and uh, it might work out for you if you're already a C-sharp developer or your company uses C-sharp and uh, his other apps. Now, JavaScript code is the third type of hybrid that we looked at here, or we're going to look at. And really there's only one big name you have to worry about. It's called React Native. So React is a framework that is used to create web pages. It's super popular. It seems to be like everyone's using React these days. It's really JavaScript with some extra twists in it. And it creates these super fast, responsive web pages that are uh, updated in partial manners. It's, it's really the best way these days to create a uh, web app. That with Angular. Those seem to be the two types of uh, web app technologies. But we take React from the web world and now we have adapted it to the um, native uh, experience in a app design. So it will not just render, uh, React will render objects to a screen, you know, like forms and buttons and things. But you can use the same technology to render native controls to the screen. So React DOM is what you would use with when you're trying to create a web app. React Native is what you use when you're trying to uh, compile for a phone. So the advantages of React Native are that you use the same skills, again, that you did as a web developer. So if you're a web developer using React, you're ready to go and you're ready to learn how to use React Native for mobile. Also, you have a single code base again. You only have one version of your app to test and to deploy. And so React Native is a great choice for cross-platforms. Cross and the key is that the native app performance is there. The apps are really indistinguishable from the native apps, even though they're written in JavaScript. And so it's a great bunch of advantages. And so for the disadvantages, well, I really couldn't think of any. If you're already developing in, in C Sharp with uh, Xamarin, and just keep going with that. Or if you're working with Java and Android, maybe you're fine. But a lot of people are saying, uh, I've already got web development experience. How do I get into mobile? Well, React Native is your best choice. That's the easiest step for you as a web developer to get into mobile developments. There's also another category that you could think of is that game engines such as Unity and Unreal, really the two main competitors in this, in this market, are both able to export their projects to both Android and iOS. And so you can think of there are multiple platforms you can export to an Xbox or to a PlayStation, but Android and iOS are mobile platforms that they can work with. But uh, game engines are not just for games either. If you want to create a virtual reality application or an augmented reality application for training purposes or for some kind of a advertisement, then uh, Unreal and Unity are probably going to work better than trying to build that uh, app on um, Android Studio or something like that. So game engines aren't just for games and they work great with mobile. Now before I end here, I want to mention two other technologies that are emerging, or at least they're somewhat popular. First of all, Kotlin is the language that Google prefers instead of Java, and they have a version now called KMM, or Kotlin Multi-Platform Mobile. And the idea here is that you create the majority of your application in the Kotlin language, and then you rely on the front end uh, differences between iOS and Android. And so this is fairly new in 2021, I believe. And so honestly, I don't know much about it other than the fact that it exists and Google is pushing it hard. Now, you would think that Google has their mind made up on what their multi-platform solution is, but check it out here. So if you go to flutter.dev, you have create faster apps and all this stuff. And look, it's also made by Google. And so Flutter is a framework that uses the language called Dart. And its purpose is to create these multi-platform language uh, uh, apps as well. And so both of these, I've seen great reviews from people out there that are more knowledgeable about this stuff than I am. But I certainly have my own doubts in my mind is, what does Google think? I mean, they have two solutions and they're promoting both of them and they both try to accomplish, it looks like the same thing. So, those are probably interesting uh, questions to ask. Well, let me give you an experiment here. So I'm going to open up uh, Indeed and type in the word Flutter. And you're going to see that there are uh, uh, literally seven jobs. Seven jobs. And uh, some of them are about React Native. So this tells me that 
I wouldn't recommend this solution for a business that's going to depend on a technology that literally hardly anyone uses. Now compare this with what if we put in React Native, and I'm still in the Phoenix area, what comes up? We have 65 jobs, so that's literally a 10 times amount of uh, mobile development talent that's out there. Let's see what CMM looks like. Uh, we're not going to get a single result. So this is telling you what is not available. People don't use this yet. And this is 2021 when I'm making this video. So let's just search for web developer to get a context of uh, what this compares with right now. So there are 399 jobs in the category of web developer. Of course, that's going to be uh, a lot of different technologies, but you can see that mobile is kind of a niche, and then a smaller niche than that is uh, going to be React Native, and then Minuscule is going to be Dart and Flutter, and then even smaller is KMM. So take that for what it's worth. If I were the business leader, I would probably not go for these technologies where you literally cannot find any job postings. Let's just do one more search here. I'm gonna search for mobile developer and see what kind of technologies people expect out there. So I'm going to find a, t a company that I recognize here. So U-Haul, okay. U-Haul is headquartered here in Phoenix. Let's check out what their requirements are. What kind of mobile technology and platform are they up to? Okay, this tells you what we want. Uh, so Android development, they want Android and they say Java. Hmm, how about that? So they're not using the most uh, up-to-date language. Let's go and check to see what some of the keywords are in their job description. So it says here, object-oriented, uh, we're gonna do MVVM, MVC, so those are design things. Uh, Android networking, such as REST services. And I don't see anything here about cross-platform. It says here, native applications. So they're not even interested in uh, cross-platform compiling. So I would recommend that you do some searching around and see what other companies in your area are looking at. U-Haul uh, might be an exception here, but I doubt it. I think that a lot of people just don't do the cross-platform solutions. They're just not meeting their needs. They're willing to spend the extra time to get a native. So looking at this, you can see that cross-platform solutions are not the first thing that comes to mind for some developers. And it's probably going to depend on who you already have on your team. If you have expert uh, language skills in a certain area, or if you're willing to take a risk on some new emerging technology. So that's gonna be up to you and how tolerant you are for risk. In the next video, we're going to be talking about the back end and where you store your data. So that's really about the full stack solution. And if you want to see the entire playlist for all of the topics on the business of building apps, check out the other link. And please join me again for class and happy mobile development. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course for people who are business designers and working with mobile apps. We're in chapter five in this section here called choosing the right tools. And in this video, I'm giving you an assignment. So we'll call this activity 5-1. And so in this activity, what I want you to do is to make a comparison of the current available dev tools. So we're talking about languages and frameworks and cross-platform and all of the other solutions that I've mentioned in a previous video in this course. So the background is that you will create a comparison with the applications and the languages and the frameworks that go along with them. What I want you to do is to identify what you think are the advantages or the disadvantages of each of them. And so for a moment, you can ignore the opinions that I provided to you in the video and come up with your own. What I want you to do is to do some searching. Go find out the experts that are out there. And so I recommend a Google search such as search for Xamarin versus React Native versus Flutter versus Kotlin. And you will likely discover some other tools that I have not mentioned, but those kind of versus searched key terms are a great way to find the blog articles that will help you out. So I want you to search for Google Trends as well. Trends.google.com, I think it is. Search Stack Overflow and look at their annual surveys of, of developers. Look in Indeed or Glassdoor or GitHub and find out 
what's going on in the world and what the trends are for each of the languages that you're considering. So these sources that I mentioned here provide impartial data points and statistics, not just some person's blog opinion. And so I want to know if the solutions are mainstream, which is means that they're being used in the real world by real businesses. So it's a good idea that you do a limited search. So if you search for anything in that was published in the last year, you're probably going to have some pretty good up-to-date information. So you don't want to pull something from 2003 and because back then there was obviously different requirements and different trends. So read blogs, read Reddit threads, and get a variety of viewpoints and opinions. So this is a research project based not on academic journals but on real programmers. So when you're done, I want you to uh, collect all of these uh, viewpoints and I want you to give me a summary in a table that looks like this. So the first column is to tell me which framework you're looking at. For instance, we could put React Native in there. And then advantages. So what makes React Native popular? Why do people love it? Or why do people avoid this? That's, uh, of course, the contrary. How many people are using this tool? Is React Native showing up in job search postings? Or are people just dreaming about what they think should be actually used? And then how long has this been around? Because, of course, age doesn't necessarily justify why a solution is good. But if you're picking something that was just invented yesterday, then maybe it's not quite ready for you to build your business on it. So if you're one of my students, this is what I would expect you to send to me. I want you to have a Word document with a table. And on that table, you're going to have all the development tools and describing the benefits and the items that I just showed you a second ago. So that would be a way for you to summarize what you've learned. And I would grade you based on how complete your table was, how well you're able to summarize what's out there and look for some factual data points to back up your opinions. So if you're not one of my students, make sure that you subscribe so that you can get the rest of this uh, course. I will put a link to all the playlist here so that way you can see some of the lessons that I've built. And if you are one of my students, I will see you again in the next class. Hi. And welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course that is supposed to make you a better designer and app developer. So we're in section five right now, which is called choosing the right tools. If any of the other sections look interesting to you, make sure that you check out the course playlist so that you can get all of them. In this video, we're talking about an assignment. So I'm giving you homework if you're one of my students, and we'll call it activity 5-2. In this, I'm going to ask you to provide a recommendation for a development solution. So in a previous activity, we've created an app design. We have an idea for a business. We've got some wireframes. We're ready to program, but we're not quite sure what languages we need to work with. In a previous assignment and a previous video, we compared several different platforms, whether they were single platform or cross platform. There's a lot of choices out there. Now, based on the recommendation that you provide me, I want you to think about the facts that you discovered and provide an application that fits your needs. So not necessarily the most popular one in the world, but the one that affects you the most. So your team will have unique factors that may lead to recommendations that other teams do not have. For example, you yourself are an expert, let's say, in C Sharp, or maybe you have never programmed before. I'm not sure what your factors are. Maybe the people that you are working with already have something in mind. Regardless, there's going to be a justification for why you choose a certain programming language and a certain development platform. And so really, that's the goal of this assignment. So here are the instructions. I want you to write a one-page document. Word document's fine. And I'm going to ask you to make a recommendation on which language, frameworks, cloud services, and databases, and other tools that you think would be appropriate for your app. And make sure that you provide a rationale behind it. And so that's why I would grade a good, good paper versus a poor paper 
is based on how well you're able to make the application. So you might recommend a different solution than another student, but you probably have good reasons to. So here are the considerations. If you choose a cross-platform solution, it's probably because you're trying to save money or save time. Make sure that that is actually true before you make the recommendation. So don't just go on what might be true, but there provides some evidence to make that uh, a real conclusion. Also, something might be brand new, but does that make it, quote, better? According to some people, yes, the newest thing is best. But businesses have to support a product for many years. And so if something disappears, you don't want to be stuck with a product that was abandoned by Google. Also, this implies that you're able to find employees that are able to come and to leave and hire new people that can come under your team. So make sure that you have something that is relatively popular. A business can have significant investments already. So sometimes it's better to follow your company's direction that's already been laid out for you. So even though you might be a Java fan, your company's using something else. So whatever it is, don't be um, too different from what's already been laid down. So what I expect, if you are my students, I would expect you to send me a one-page document, a recommendation for which language and frameworks and databases and cloud platforms that you would provide, why you would choose those, and the justification, of course, is a business case. So if you're not one of my students, you can put your own recommendations in the bottom, in the comments below, to tell me why you prefer one platform or one solution over another. And if you're not one of my students, please subscribe so that you can get in on the rest of the course. Now, I will see you in the next class if you are following along. So thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome to the business of building mobile applications. This is a course that talks about some of the issues that you're going to face if you are trying to create an app and a business that goes with it. So you can see there are several chapters that we're going to be looking at here, and we are now on the section called Full Stack Considerations. So if these previous videos look interesting to you, then go back and look at the playlist. And of course, please subscribe if this is relevant to the types of projects that you're working on right now. Here's the other two that are coming up, and I welcome you to join. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. So let's take a look at the first topic here on this section called choosing a database. So this is really a full stack consideration. We looked at the front end frameworks that you can use for building mobile apps in a previous video, and now we're going to talk about how you store your data. So we're going to divide this up into four sections, types of databases that you can choose from. Each of these has its advantages and disadvantages. Each were designed to solve specific problems. So depending on the type of application that you're trying to create, you're probably going to select one of these four. So we're going to talk about the purpose of each of these and how well they scale. In other words, how they go from hundreds of users to millions of users and which ones are going to work well for you in the end. The first one that we're going to talk about, the first type of database, is SQL. Now SQL is the most common and the oldest, most established and wide known type of language there is. So SQL is not really a database, it is called a structured query language. That's the type of commands that you talk to the database with. And so if you know any programmers that have worked with databases at all, they will probably understand these kind of commands. So if you want to select data from a database, you do something like this, where you say select the type of data that you want, and you tell it which table the data is stored in. And the computer will return a list of data for you to put into your application. So here is what it looks like in uh, Visual Studio. And you are going to, uh, in this case, we are going to create a table of employees and insert some data into it. And so this is the interface that you would look like if you were on a SQL server. Also, SQL servers have arrangements. So they put data into tables and they link those tables with relations. And so a SQL server is sometimes referred to as a relational database. And so you can see that in this case, we have an order system where each order is associated with a customer and each product is associated with each order. And so 
This is a very important part of the design of an application. If you haven't taken a course on SQL and uh, databases, then I recommend you do. In the uh, degrees that I teach, where it's computer science and software development, this is a fundamental class that we do early in, this, in the student's career, and we use SQL databases throughout all of the applications that we create in their experience. And so you likely will do the same thing in your job if you are a software developer. So here are some popular titles. MySQL is the first of the category here. It is uh, free, it's open source, it's used by pretty much everybody, and we use it in our classes as our primary database. Postgres has a few more features and people that use it really say they love it. Microsoft SQL Server is also used in our courses and of course Microsoft is a major player in any software development. Oracle was the major giant that started the whole uh, corporate database structure and people kind of love to hate Oracle but it's still used by large businesses everywhere. The next type of uh, server that we're going to talk about is the NoSQL server. Now, NoSQL also refers to not only SQL, so it's not just the opposite of SQL. The most common way that you would create a NoSQL database is to store your data in documents. Now, this is an example of a document, of a user. And if it looks like a JSON text file, that's because it is. And so that's the way NoSQL documents are, are structured. You have properties and then you have values that go along with them. So there's no tables, there's no joins going on here. It's very simple. And so there's a few advantages to that and also some drawbacks. Here is a second one. We have user of Susan and the first one was Mortimer. Now you notice the difference here is that not all of the data is the same. So in this case with Susan, you notice that we are able to have a status called active and it's a Boolean value of true. So in a SQL statement, you have to fill in all of the data for all of your users. The columns are very closely defined. They are static. They are very restricted, which makes the computer work well with it. But sometimes your business problems change and so NoSQL databases allow you some more flexibility so you can have different types. In this case we have Vicky, a third user, and you notice we don't have very much data on her at all. Now we could add that data later or we could delete data from her, but the idea here is that a NoSQL document is more flexible. Here's what a SQL statement looks like, or a select statement, I should call it. A select statement in a NoSQL database. So we have db.users.find, and then we put in another JSON object, and the results come back and look something like this. So this is an example from a MongoDB database. And you can see that the results are easily translated into a web server or any kind of a application that can parse JSON. Here's another example. We're trying to do a query from a list of users. And so you can see that there are a variety of pieces of data in the user object from strings to integers to booleans to arrays. So uh, NoSQL is very flexible in the type of data that you throw at it. And it works very fast if you're just going to read and write lists of data. So let's compare these two different types of technologies. So this is a structure of a SQL database on the left. You can see that a database is composed of tables. Each table is made up of rows and each row has multiple columns in it. So that is a correspondence to a document database where we have the whole thing, which is a database. Each table represents a document collection. So, for instance, in the tables of your database, you might have a collection of users. Well, we still have a collection of users in a NoSQL database. The rows represent each user, and so in the collection, each user is a document. And then for each column, such as the name, ID, age, weight, serial number, or whatever properties you wish to assign to a user, you're going to have those referred to as fields in a NoSQL database. And so the two components are both there. They're just organized and named slightly differently. Let's also talk about the contrast here between a SQL database and a NoSQL database in some of the design. So as I mentioned, NoSQL databases are very flexible. You can change them later. 
But uh, in SQL, you have to think about many of the decisions that your application is going to need right up front. And that's a process called normalization or a normalized database. So you have relations between tables. And the advantage of a SQL database is that you don't duplicate any data. If you have a user's table, there's only going to be one place where the user name is stored and the age and his ID number and, and so forth. And so there's no danger that you're going to have duplicate records of a single user. And so you're guaranteed to have good data. So a SQL database will never have duplicate data if it's designed right. Now, on the other hand, on the other side, we have denormalized data when we talk about a document or a NoSQL database. We're going to be talking about lists and you're going to have a lot of data duplication. So the amount of storage space is going to be larger, but that that disadvantage then turns into advantages when we come to the number of seconds it takes to uh, run a query. Let's do an example here. So let's say we have a blog application where a, like an Instagram, people post a picture and then they put a comment. And then afterwards, we hope that other people come and rate your photo and put comments on it. And then you can reply to them and you have a whole comment thread. And then maybe later someone else comments again. So a pretty typical example of a social media app. Now, would this be easy to develop in a SQL database or a NoSQL database? Well, we actually do this in one of our classes. We create a blog app and we use a SQL database. But let me give you some uh, suggestions here of maybe why or why not this is a good idea. So let's take a look at if we had this data for our blog app and we had it in the, the data was stored in a SQL table format. So I have a users table here on the left. You can see there's an ID number for each user and a name. On the right side, we have the comments table. And so each comment has an ID number and it's associated with a link on the ID number of the user. We have the date and the text. So if I say, I want to get all of the comments for a particular photo, I would write a statement that looks like this. So this is a SQL statement that says, I'm going to select, or I'm going to pull out the data from two different tables. And you can see I have a mixture of table names. So I have the comments table and the users table. Then I'm going to join them and I join them on a common number. So you can see that the ID number of Jerry is 1002. And over in the comments table, you can see that there's a user ID number for that comment, which is also 1002. So we know that Jerry is the person that posted this first comment. And so we're going to pull these two together. When you're done, you're going to have a joined list. So this, this table here is a generated table. It doesn't get stored anywhere. It's just created every time we want to pull data from the database. And so then this is produced uh, in a, a nice sequential format that we can use our, uh, in our application to print to our web page. So the pulling together is called joining. So I'm going to pull together the ID number from one table. I'm going to pull the name from the other table. I'm going to pull the date and the text. So joining tables literally means reading twice. We're going to read from the users table. We're going to read from the comments table. We're going to create a list in the computer's memory and then provide that to the application. So you can see that the strategy here will, will create a uh, more CPU time. All these joins require uh, processing, but we only save the data in one location, so we save on disk space. Now let's go back to the same blog app and let's see how it might be designed and implemented using a NoSQL database. So it's the same comments. We've got a photo and we've got a bunch of uh, comments. So here's what the data would look like. So first of all, in our database, we would have likely a list of users. And so you can see a bunch of JSON objects. It's the same data, but now stored in a JSON format. Now, what are we going to do for the comments? We're going to produce uh, maybe another collection called images. The images will have, each image will have an ID number and probably a string to tell us which photo is saved to the disk. And following the image ID, we're going to have the uh, comments. And so you can see that the comments is a list of lists of no more JSON objects. So each list is going to have some duplicate data. You notice the word or the name Gwen appears twice in here. So we're saving Gwen's name into the comments. Now that's a horrible misuse of the normalization rules that most students learn in SQL programming. 
and so we're breaking rules. We're duplicating the name Gwen. Uh, however, there is an advantage for doing that because when we go back to the application, we don't have to do any joins. We can just say, read the list sequentially. There's no computing to do, just read and print. And so that makes it very fast. Now the disadvantage is, let's say Gwen changes her username. Now Gwen has been printed in our database, let's see, twice here, it could be a million times. We would have to programmatically go back and search for all of that duplicated data and rename Gwen to her new username. So that's a bad thing, obviously. So read sequentially is fast. Uh, duplicating data saves time on the CPU, but it requires extra programming and oversight to make sure that your data is in a good format. So let's compare these two here because these are the two most common database technologies that you're likely going to choose from. So SQL is what we would call structured. If you know what your data is going to look like, then SQL is a good choice. If you're not quite sure what your data is going to look like, then NoSQL is a more flexible alternative. Uh, SQL databases are more difficult to scale, and we'll talk about scaling here in a minute. But scaling means going from your first hundred users to the first million users or records or whatever it is. So a large database is more difficult to handle in a SQL server. Also, we have the, uh, I've mentioned, no duplication of data. So only one copy of each record is stored in the database, which makes it easy to keep track of what the username is, for example. You can change data in one location and one location only. So that's very consistent. Um, if you have a lot of updates going on, and you, let's say you're changing records, and you uh, have only one copy of that record, then obviously it's a one-time operation. If you change a piece of data that is duplicated a million times in other locations, every time you do an update, it's going to be thousands or millions of updates each time the user creates a, a change. SQL, SQL databases are very good if you have lots of uh, joins going on to say, I want to collect a little bit of data from this table, that data, merge them together and create a new list. And NoSQL is not so much uh, in as far as the document store goes. And so why would you want to choose NoSQL then? Well, it's faster. Uh, you can also scale it largely. And it's really quick if you're just doing a lot of reads. And so you're going to have to analyze your business process and your application to decide which type of technology fits better. So rule of thumb, the default in my choice, maybe it's just because I'm old, but SQL is the first choice. And if you can't use it with SQL, then you go find an alternative. And I have some data maybe to show why that is a good way to think. Here are two popular NoSQL databases. These are the document store databases. So MongoDB by far is the most popular. Uh, Firebase by Google is used as a real-time database, which has some other advantages. So if you are looking at a database, your uh, application automatically triggers every time there's new data coming in. And so it's some things that you really can't do without uh, doing a lot of uh, programming loops. Let's talk about another database called a graph database. It's a different type of feel altogether. So if, you're, uh, if you've taken any courses in um, algorithms and data structures, a graph is a perfect way to model a lot of data. So on a graph, you have things called nodes. So each node kind of represents a record. So let's say we have a node called a person, and we'll give that the term, the label. So this node is a person. The properties of a node are just like the columns in a, uh, in a table. So we can say that Gene in age 39 is this person. So you could imagine lots of different properties going on. Now we have different types of nodes. So let's make a application that keeps track of movies and who likes the movies. So in this case, we have a purple node that says the name of this node is Star Wars. So we can then put relationships between those. So this person likes the movie Star Wars since the year 2021. So that's a relationship. So there's three pieces of data here, not just two. The, the, the link itself is another record. So it keeps track of either a one-way link or you can have a two-way link. 
Well, then that, let's take a look at the uh, idea of linking these because in a SQL database, we already have relations. We have links between tables. That's what it means. It's a relational database. So it works well if you only have to worry about one, one depth of your relationship. So like, like for instance, this user created this list of comments. Perfect. It's a one depth one step depth of relationships. And so there's no reason to create a graph database if that's all you're doing. However, if you have more indirect relationships, like you want to know in a movie how many people were actors, and then you can also ask in the actors how many different movies were they in, and then you could start to get more complex to say, did they like their experience? Who liked the, who liked being in the movie? Which actors did not like the movie but were not in the in the uh, in the actors list? And so when you start to get these multiple questions about who was where and what they liked and who's related to who and then who are your friends of your friends, then you start to get very complex, and that's when a graph database starts to make sense. So here's an example of some real we'll call it empirical data. So Neo4j is a graph database. It's the most popular, I believe. And here is an experiment that was made uh, some years ago. So we have a uh, depth of queries going on here. So you can see on the left column, we have depth of two, three, four, and five. So the depth means who is a friend of a friend. So that's, that's what we're asking here. But now when we get to this six degrees of separation kind of a question is who is the friend of a friend of your friends of your friends of your friends and now your uh, traditional database is no longer a good solution. So you can see that they asked that question. Who are your friends, 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 friends? And where do we go for the time computation? Well, you start making joins and other joins and stacking on top of other joins and you can see that SQL has an exponential time uh, frame here. And so by the time we had the depth of asking who are your fifth degree friends, uh, the MySQL database didn't even finish its computation in an hour of, of work. Now compare this to the graph database, Neo4, and you can see that it is a very fast linear um, time requirement. And so literally in two seconds, they could ask to the fifth degree who your friends are. And so same computing platform, same amount of memory and all that. And so the algorithm itself of how the database is designed is su superior when it comes to that kind of a question. So if you have a social media type of application that has these strange queries that can ask about relationships and very flexible types of uh, questions, then maybe Neo4 or other graph database uh, technologies is for you. Now, this is obviously the suitable solution for this kind of a situation. So we have friends with and who likes who. You can see the graph going on here. So if you have many relationships between records and you're going to be asking questions on a regular basis, uh, for instance, Facebook, uh, how in the world can you recommend friends when you have friends of friends going on, then this is probably the, the right tool for you. So let's take a look at LinkedIn, for example, here. Uh, this is an image that is about types and the relationships on LinkedIn. And to me, this is just asking for a graph database solution, because as you can see, the profile has different groups, different companies, companies that you like, companies you follow. Uh, and so they're able to provide job recommendations to you based on what's in your a resume, and then who, uh, who you like and where you follow. So this would be very difficult to compute if you were using a standard SQL database. So here are two recommendations if you're interested in looking at more about this. So Neo4j seems to be the market leader, but I'm going to put Azure Cosmos because it's a Microsoft tool that is used on the cloud, the Azure uh, cloud service. And so they're going to be pushing that if you're using their service. Here's another kind of database called the full text database. Now, full text sounds exactly like you would expect for a search engine. So let's say you're Google and you're trying to index every page on the internet. 
and somehow when you type in a keyword search they give you instant results so what they do is they have this inverted index set up so for instance if I'm looking for the word fantastic I don't have to go search through the entire collection of documents that was already done for me instead I get search results that are based on document numbers and so I will have a list here of document 1, 499, 284, and 942. Those are the documents that contain the word fantastic. And of course you can probably weight that with better search results by pushing those numbers around based on the number of times the word fantastic was used or whether it was used in the title or whether in the body of the text. You get the idea. So that you have an index of where the words are in your documents. And that works exactly like the index that you find in the back of any textbook. You're looking for a specific term, the index will tell you which page number it is on. So that is like the Google search of your book. It tells you where you will find the terms that are of most value to you. So a full text index is going to be the kind of solution if that's the problem you're, you're facing. So Elastic and Splunk are two database technologies that you should explore if that's your kind of a problem. Now the next section here is how are you going to scale your database from your first 100 users to the millions of users that you're likely to encounter. So let's start with an example here, a very concrete example of Kevin Sistrom who is the co-founder of Instagram. Let's hear what he says about his app. And before you knew it, we actually had overloaded our system, and it was a very small, naive system. It was a single computer in a co-location space somewhere in L.A. Everything was on one computer? Yeah, it was, it was nothing more exhilarating than seeing all those people stream in and nothing more crushing than then seeing you know, people posting on Twitter or on their blogs and saying like, oh, another startup that doesn't know how to scale. Like, oh, like so clowny. We were both, I mean, at that point, like running on zero sleep for two days, just devastated. And I was like, this is it. We built this great thing and we totally messed it up. So if you get so lucky that you're going to have an Instagram-like problem, then you're going to have to do some solutions. So I looked up to see what kind of technology, what databases that are being used in Instagram. They started off, obviously, with a small server, and they have since completely redesigned their app. And so you can see that their technology that they're still relying on is a SQL database, and Cassandra, which is kind of like a MongoDB. It's a document storage. And it's allowing them to have both relations and the ability to scale horizontally. Now, let's talk about your goals here, your short-term goals, if you are building a startup and your first version of your app. You're probably only going to need to worry about your minimal viable product. And so scaling is something to think about down the road, but right now you are interested in proving the concept. Does your application appeal to users? And so you're only going to have to talk about 100 or 1,000 people for your first version. Your working version needs to be something that literally just works. And so scaling is important to think about, but not to invest too much time now. Build your first version as a rather simple architecture. We're trying to get something put together quite quickly, fast development. And so don't worry about the scale yet. I mean, it's not a bad idea to think about how it's going to scale, but don't scale it. Scaling now is much easier than it was 10 years ago, so you can at least plan for it, but you don't have to make your first version scalable. Now, here are some consider considerations. Will your application have unbounded growth? If you're building an internal app for a company and you know that your company has 5,000 employees and you'll never see any more than that, then obviously there's no worry about unbounded growth if you're just having a few records. However, if you're collecting a terabyte of data every day and adding it to your database, then you're going to have a problem. Now, we're going to scan or span multiple servers if we have a scaling issue. So you need a technology that can be split into pieces. Is there going to be a high volume of transactions? For instance, if you're creating a database that has an IoT device thing where you're recording, let's say, the, uh, the heartbeat and blood pressure of every user every five minutes, your scale of volume is going to go exponential. And so, yes, you will have a scaling problem. If you have those kind of issues, then I would recommend that you think about a NoSQL solution because they scale 
much easier. And MongoDB is the first to mind when, for in, in, in my ca categories when it comes to a NoSQL solution. So when you talk about your MVP app, you're likely going to be thinking about maybe some limited number, a small number of records. It doesn't have to be hyper fast. It can handle interruptions. You can, you can shut it down to do backups, for example. Uh, your expertise, you want the most common solution available because you're going to be hiring people. And the usual first to mind solution is MySQL. So Mongo and MySQL are the first two things that come to mind. As a matter of fact, those are the only two solutions really that we focus in on our college students. So when I'm teaching new programmers how to develop an app and they've never seen a database before and they've never written a query, uh, really MySQL and Microsoft Server are the two solutions that we work with most of the time for SQL. And then Mongo for a more advanced, we would call it, maybe our junior level or senior level students to see something else besides SQL. And we don't even branch off be to be beyond those two because they're very common and they meet a lot of needs. But let's talk about scaling. Let's say if you are trying to do scaling, you can have either two choices. One is called a vertical scale and the other is a horizontal scale. So this is vertical scaling. We start off with a small server. It says here we have about a $3,000 computer. It has one terabyte of storage maximum and we can handle about 500 concurrent users before it starts to get slow. And so we invest $3,000 and we host one server. Well, then our application grows. We have uh, a constraint. And so we just buy a bigger server. We add more memory and more storage and a better CPU and things work great. But you can see that the cost then is no longer 3,000. It is $50,000. We have a hard drive, then we have multiple power supplies. It's a pretty nice server. And then the maximum server that we might be able to afford is a million dollar computer. I guess we're getting into small mainframe size here now. And as you, as you know, mainframes were built to handle large amounts of data. But there's a limit to how big you can build that mainframe. And so that is vertical scaling. And so you can see that when we get to a certain size, uh, we have to wait until a newer computer is invented. Our scaling in vertical format only goes so far. And you notice the cost starts to es escalate too, because as you know, when you buy a laptop, uh, you can get twice the processing and twice the storage, but the price isn't just twice, it goes in an exponential format. So most of us buy computers that are 80% of the market maximum at the time because, well, that's a, a reasonable cost uh, performance trade-off. So just for kicks, I went to find out what the biggest things that you can buy are right now. So what is the largest hard drive available on Amazon? So it looks to me like 16 or 18 terabytes is the maximum that Western Digital is selling right now. And what's the cost here? Uh, a 16 terabyte hard drive right now is $600 and free shipping. Now, what if you want to get a bigger one than that? They actually create these things called a RAID set. So RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. And so there are multiple hard drives in a box. And so even though you might have a 36 terabyte drive, literally you're getting multiple drives. And so there's a physical maximum that we have at any point in history. And history has always told us that we can never get enough storage space. And so this particular hard drive is $2,600. And so you can see the cost starts to get kind of high. Now there's a better way or a different way, let's call it, of scaling. So instead of scaling by buying bigger machines, we can just buy more machines. So that's called horizontal scaling. And that requires some coordination. So we build a server and then we have a server manager or sometimes called the master server. He's the traffic cop and he controls what's going on. The other servers that are being controlled are called slaves. And so we have this master-slave relationship. Now, if slavery doesn't ring true to you, then we've got other terminology. We'll call this the conductor or the primary server or the source server or the coordinator or the traffic cop. Anyway, the idea is that we have somebody who is managing the other servers and those can be called followers or secondary servers or replicas or nodes so it depends on your type of terminology but we have something that is controlling other computers 
And so that master server is obviously an important piece in this uh, scaling system. So you can see in the configuration I've set up here, I bought three servers and they contain uh, two uh, servers that actually hold the data. So one server is used just to coordinate things and the other two hold the data. So what does that do for us? Well, we could have multiple servers that are the followers and they all are controlled by the master. Now, as you can see that the cost here does not increase exponentially. We don't have a million dollar computer anywhere in this list. So we have seven computers that are storing the data of six. So we have one computer that is overhead and the other ones that are actually doing the work. Now, there is no technical barrier then to the size that we can add. So we probably will find some number that the master is able to control, but that's pretty big. So we could add a master computer that is massive and then lots and lots of small ones that are the followers. And that's when you get these server farms, we call them, these data centers where you have this hardware that's in the shelf that is relatively inexpensive. It's completely re replaceable and you get the scale of manufacturing to bring the price down. And so these data centers can be the size of football fields and you put them near a source of uh, cheap electricity and in a place where you're not going to have earthquakes or floods and you have literally data warehouses for Amazon or Microsoft or Google humming away. Now, you have a problem. So what happens when one of these servers fails? Obviously, we don't want that to happen. We're going to start duplicating the data then. So let's say this server is going to store a file. Maybe it's a large file. We're going to then make some copies of it. So let's take three copies and the master server is going to choose three locations in our data farm where it's going to put that. So in this master computer, we're going to have it keep an index. So the index, it looks like I'm using uh, number one, three, and five. If we start counting at zero, then one, three, and five is the location of this file. So why do we duplicate it? Well. Obviously, if one piece of hardware fails, then we want to have that uh, respond by uh, maybe making another duplicate somewhere else. And so we have some redundancy. Also think about how you could read the data. Let's say file uh, server number one, the first one here, is busy. Then we can read it from another location. And so the hard drives uh, never really get maxed out as far as having an amount of traffic. Now, in practice, what we also do is we, we take data and we split it up into blocks. So let's say we have a huge video file. And we don't want to store that all in one location, do we? No, we, we create segments. So we split the file up maybe into three pieces in this case, and then we make duplicates of that. And now we have nine pieces to spread around our servers. And so the segment can be put on different servers, so that way it's load balanced. The server can have uh, a maximum storage space and the CPU both shared. And then we take those segments and we scatter them according to some algorithm to the entire collection. So now we have two things going on. We have redundancy, so one server can fail. And also we have the uh, a load balance so that no one server has to do all the work. So let's take a look at an example of a failure tolerance. So we have uh, three different servers that are all serving a file. Now, one of these has a disk failure and it shuts down. And we've got a problem. The alert then is sent to the master traffic cop and he says, take this one offline. He looks in the index and says, where do I have this file? Well, I see that it's still stored in two locations, so we're good. Now, I'm going to take that file and I'm going to duplicate it and put it on another server. So it selects one according to its algorithm, and now we're back to three. So the fault tolerance is there to keep us well. Now that works with files. Let's talk about how you would be able to split up something like a SQL server. And to scale a server horizontally is difficult. It's called shards. So a shard is a way to split up your data. So in this case, let's talk about a read-only shard. So a master shard is pictured here on the left. So we have a table of users, 
and we know that these uh, users are going to be updated very infrequently. People don't change their address very often. And the uh, application might read from those user tables very frequently. So every time we create a new order, we want to pull the user data. That's, a, that's an example. So if read is the constraining action, then all we need to do is make duplicates of each table. And that's a read-only shard. And so when a request to read a user comes in, we can uh, just get it from one of the shards. So let's say we have an example of where we want to write data. We have an update or we add a record. Now that is going to then replicate that data to the shards. And so that way we have a, um, a way to spread it around. Now when we have a read data, we would have a scheduler program and then we would select one of the shards that is not very busy and give him that job. And so then we would read from one of those three. Now replicating shards increases the database response time, or the performance I should say. So if you're reading data from a lot of different uh, tables, then just spread those tables out, make replicas of them, and then the least busy will respond to your request. It's not very scalable for write operations. And so sharding is usually thought of in a different way, where we split up data. So let's go back to our data set, and we'll talk about how we would shard this when we have millions of rows. So your performance of your database is suffering, and you realize it's because you just have so much data. How are you going to do it? So we're going to shard that. So we, we're going to start with our entire data set. And we notice that there are ways that we could split it up. So in this particular data set, we can see that there are 50 states in the United States, and we have roughly uh, spread the users across those 50 regions. So we could create a separate data using a shard map. So let's say we split up the dates, uh, the states from 1 to 50, and now we start to uh, split it up. Now, in practice, you can do a range like this. You can have a range of zip codes, for example, or a range of state names. We could also do a hash value. So we could hash a name and then put them in a particular range based on the hash results. Or you could come up with your own scheme. So somehow we want to equitably distribute these around. In this case, we're going to put everyone in the Iowa region in shard 1. And then shard 2, we're going to make another table called users. And that will be for the Illinois people. And then shard 3 will hold all of our Ohio uh, users. So now the data table no longer exists in a single location. It's now spread over three servers. So theoretically, each of those three now can grow to the maximum size of hardware that we are allowed to provide to it. So this here is our shard collection. So now when we have a read operation, who are we going to ask? Well, let's say we have a request that comes in to say, where's Wendy? I want to get all the records that are associated with Wendy. So we ask our master shard map. Wendy is located in Illinois. Which server do I need to ask? And the response is, I found Wendy in Illinois, which is shard number two. Okay, so now I'm going to ask the same question. Where's Wendy? And I'm going to select all of the records associated with Wendy. And I go to shard2.users table to get that data. So there's a two-step process in getting data. Now, you can see that there's a lot of programming going on here. So we have shards and we have different uh, load balancing techniques there. So SQL sharding, we'll call it. It does allow the scaling of horizontal uh, growth. We can add servers. It requires extra programming and some extra requests that go on with the process. So here are two solutions for MySQL. Galera Cluster is a uh, SQL, MySQL solution for sharding data, so you don't have to do all the computing yourself. And then, uh, I think it was 2016 or so, where MySQL 8 now includes something called group replication. And so it does the same process, where you can shard different things. Now, in my opinion, that scaling a MySQL database is kind of like trying to squeeze a square peg into a round hole. MongoDB was designed originally to scale horizontally. It's very easily to split up a document. Uh, you don't have to worry about fragments being uh, separated. And so even though sharding works with SQL, 
uh, it wasn't designed to work that way in the beginning, and so perhaps not the best uh, design in the long run. So now it's your decision time. So I'm going to present you basically with two different solutions. Uh, you can choose a SQL solution, and then you can also pick from a NoSQL. Those are really the dividing line. So what are the factors there? So consider, first of all, what you already have in your organization. Uh, are, are you already using SQL in many of your other projects? Maybe it's a good idea just to continue on with SQL. Almost everybody that programs in any kind of database already knows SQL. Mongo is a common skill, but it's not universal. And so as I mentioned, at the university where I teach, everybody learns how to program in SQL, and they do it pretty well. Uh, Mongo is something that we add on as a second choice, uh, and I wouldn't call them experts at Mongo, and that's probably common for a lot of systems. So the most common tools that you can work with, both of them are free, are either MySQL or MongoDB. Now let's take a look at some practical uh, statistics from your area. So I did some Indeed searching for uh, job postings in Phoenix, where I live. So I just typed in job postings that have the keyword SQL in it. And you can see that there were 1,482 jobs that referenced they want SQL. And so you can see the first one says a Java developer. Not a surprise that you need SQL. How about this? Searching for NoSQL. And the number of jobs that re reference NoSQL drops to 253. And they still want a software developer, and uh, NoSQL is par apparently part of the job description. Let's get specifically, let's talk about MongoDB as a solution. 116 jobs, and then MySQL references 218 jobs. So if you didn't catch all that, here is a graph that shows you, or a table that shows you all of these. So you can see that SQL is a super common term. People are using it all the, all the time and everywhere. And NoSQL is, is not dead. I mean, it's not insignificant, but it's certainly less. And so if you wanted to see that visually, you can see that SQL is way ahead as the most common solution that most people think of when they're building software applications. So when it comes to cost, though, uh, really, it's not a big deal. Almost every database solution has a free option. Linux servers means that you don't have to pay licensing to Microsoft. However, your cloud hosting is going to be where the cost hits you. So the amount of storage space and the amount of computing power that's being used in the cloud is going to affect you no matter which of the solutions that you choose. Uh, at the beginning, though, remember that if you're choosing single server solutions, you're probably going to be okay for your first version of your MVP. Now, the next consideration that you should think about is how you communicate. So REST APIs is an important topic that you need to understand about building mobile applications. Also, if you'd like to see the entire playlist for all of the considerations of building apps, then I'll put that link here as well. Make sure you subscribe, and thank you for joining me in class. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course that is designed for people who are doing business case studies on application development. So we're in the part here called full stack considerations, which is about choosing the right types of storage. So activity 6-1 is an assignment. So if you like homework, then you've come to the right video. So in this, I want you to evaluate the various types of data storage that are out there. So we're looking at database design. So this refers to SQL or NoSQL databases or some of the other. Now the background here is that I've already given you a lesson on the different types of databases that are somewhat popular. And so we can just say that we know that various types exist. So while they share the same goal of storing and retrieving data, each of these different designs was solving a different problem. And so the goal here is for you to be able to identify that. So as you go through the course readings that I provided or the other videos that I've made in this course, that I want you to research these categories of, of databases. So there's a relational database, a document database, sometimes called NoSQL, and then there's a graph database, and we pick search engine. Now, there might be others out there that you will discover along the way, because there are certainly more than just four types of databases. So what I want you to do then is to summarize what you understand about each of these. And so tell me the strengths of each type, 
and the weaknesses, and if you want to include history about when they were developed and who fixed, who created them and what they were trying to fix, that would be great too. Provide examples of applications that would be appropriate for each of these types of databases. Of course, they're designed for some specific purpose. And then finally, think of the app that you're building or you're designing in this course. And I want you to then make a recommendation for which database or maybe a combination of databases would work for the particular app that you're working on. So you have to understand how these app or these databases are, are designed and who they're supposed to help and then make a choice on which one would probably work for you. So if you're one of my students, I would expect you to submit this to me. Send me a Word document. Send me a paper that explains the strengths and the weaknesses of each data storage technology. And so since there are four different categories that I've mentioned here, I would expect at least four, four paragraphs, probably an introduction and a conclusion. So then the final is not only to tell me what the four differences are, but which one you think is going to be probably appropriate for your solution. So if you're not one of my students, you feel free to put anything in the comments below that tells me about your experience with these types of databases. Which ones do you use that are somewhat out of the ordinary? Do you have a strong preference between MySQL or Mongo, for example, and why would you choose that? So if you'd like to look at the rest of the course, I will provide a link to the playlist here. And if you're one of my students, I will see you soon in a new class. And if you're not a student, please subscribe and come back as well. Thank you. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course that's about designing and running a business with mobile applications. We're in part number six, I believe, which is the full stack considerations. And so we're thinking about storage and online services. This is an assignment video. So if you like homework, then you're at part 6.2. What are we gonna do here? I want to make this assignment an exploration of API services. So APIs are application program interfaces, or people might just call them online services. And so in a previous video, we talked about several different things that were available from Google and Microsoft. And we want to make sure that we're aware of what things are out there. We don't have to reinvent the wheel in many cases. So APIs provide data and communications and computing for us. For example, Google Maps is an API, and you'd be a fool to recreate an entire map application since there's one already available that you can just insert into an existing app. So what I want you to do is to demonstrate that you understand how they work and which ones would be appropriate for your app. So in a previous video, we've already designed an app and now I want you to see if there's some features that you can utilize and make it better. So as I mentioned, Microsoft and Google have a lot of different APIs that are open and free. And all you have to do is sign up and configure them. So these services range from a variety of things such as maps, speech recognition, and artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to elaborate the entire list because there are literally hundreds of APIs that companies like Microsoft and Google are providing to us. So what I want you to do then is to examine the app that we're building and designing in this course and see if there are any opportunities for services that are out there that we could utilize. So write a one-page paper with a recommendation for which, if any of the services, the API services, would be appropriate for you to include in your application. So make sure that you justify your decision. So I don't want you to choose Google Maps just because you like maps. If your app has something to do with maps, then of course, Google Maps makes sense. But don't pick an application just because it's interesting. Make sure that it satisfies or supports one of your business goals. So if you were one of my students, this is what I would expect you to send me. I would ex expect a Word document that's probably about one page and it would list any of the services that you would find useful on Google or Microsoft or some other similar service and why they would be appropriate to integrate into your application. So if you're not one of my students, then feel free to leave in the comments below which APIs have been useful for you in your apps. If you'd like to see the entire course playlist, I will provide a link to that so that you can see some of the videos about the business of building apps. 
And make sure you subscribe if you haven't, because this could be useful information to you if you're an app developer. So thanks for watching. Hi, welcome to the Business of Building Applications. This is a course for managers who are trying to create applications in the mobile platforms. So the chapters that we've covered so far in this course include all of these topics that you see on the screen. In this video, we're talking about hiring the team. And so we're going to be talking about development roles. If any of these topics look interesting to you, make sure you subscribe and also go back and check the playlist for this course. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. So welcome to class, and I'm glad you're here. Now we're going to talk about dev roles, mobile development in particular, and so we're going to t talk about forming a team and presuming that you are going to be probably in the hiring role manager, or if you are the startup founder. Who are the people that you are going to want to work with you? So you're going to have these four here. You'll have a product manager, a designer, a front-end developer, a back-end developer, and there could be more roles, but we're trying to keep it small here to save some expenses. So we're going to focus on these four. Now, you don't necessarily have to have four people. You might have just you, and you have to do all the roles, or you might find some people that can do multiple things. Hopefully you can, and then you can save some money. So let's talk with the first one here, a product manager. So a product manager is probably somebody that's got some senior skills. They've done this before. It's not their first application. So their goals are pretty much this. Number one, they have to figure out what problem they're trying to solve. And so this famous picture here about the project and what it was described as, what it was implemented as, and then finally what the person wanted is uh, the tire swing. So if you haven't figured it out yet, most of the videos in this course are for you, the project manager or the product manager, and your goal is to do some of these things, figure out what has to be done. The second thing that a product manager has to do is execute. Make sure that we have a plan. We know what things we're working on first, which ones are most important, what the users want, what the users should not see, and we'll move this plan forward. Also, we're going to measure our success, and this pretty much works with testing out our application with our users, our focus groups, and our early adopters, and then we're going to modify our goals. So everything in this course so far has been pretty much a product manager's kind of work. So look back at the chapters in the playlist and to see what your job is. So I did a quick search and picked out one of the roles that was advertised currently here. I live in Phoenix, Arizona, and AAA was one of the items that came up when I searched for a PM or a product manager. So what do you have to do? Well, here's what they say. So you have to man manage and monitor for defects, uh, uh, monitor ex enhancements to existing systems, identify customer needs, uh, solicit input, meets commitments made to customers. In other words, you have all the responsibility, but you don't do the work yourself. You direct a team, you get the resources applied to it, and you know what's going on, and uh, you make sure that you get the resources applied to what you uh, want to do. So what do you have to have? Well, they want a college degree, it looks like. They pick five years plus experience. So you know their product manager is not going to be the first thing that you do out of college. Uh, you're, you're going to be scrum certified. So you're looking at looking, uh, managing teams, sprints. Uh, you're doing the agile software development kind of a role. And then it also says that we want uh, expertise in SQL and proficiency in programming. So they want a experienced developer that now is stepping into the manager role. So this is probably your most senior member of the team. Now let's take, take a look at the next item that I identified as one of your team members is your product designer. So a product designer is going to be the person that makes your product look really good, obviously. And so user interface is the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to a product designer. This is a person that has some artistic talent, maybe has a degree in product design, maybe a degree in fine arts. The second thing is called user experience, and there's a slight difference there. So the user interface is what it looks like. The user experience is how a product acts and, and feels to the customer. So navigation, as you can see what's being drawn here, is the logical flow of how you get through an app. 
But user experience can be broader than just what you see on the mobile app. So for instance, the last time you ordered anything through Amazon, you had a user experience. Uh, your user experience was that the app worked well, you clicked buy, and somebody really hustled hard to get that product to your door. They rang the doorbell and by the next day you were happy. And if you didn't like the product, you could return it without any cost. All of that is a user experience. So it's not just the bits and bytes on your app, it's the process of how the business works. And so user experience, of course, is a pretty critical item if you want to keep your customers. So what is a qualification for somebody who is a designer? So not just user experience, but we're, we're focused in here on, on more of the designer people. So you can see their goals. According to Peterson Technology Partners here in Chandler, Arizona, they're looking currently for a designer and they want this person to create storyboards and wireframes and user flow diagrams, create prototypes and interactive designs. Sounds a lot like what we did in an earlier activity in this course. Uh, also, we're going to be thinking about thinking methods to construct concepts that can be tested and validated with users. So remember in a previous uh, edition of this course or the previous lesson in this course, we talked about finding the niche for your product. You build something, you show it to your users, and if they don't really care about it or they don't care for it, then you don't include it. So this is what they mean by testing out your hypothesis with a group of uh, potential users. Um, actively participating in discussions and workshops with key, key stakeholders. So the point here is that the design is a pretty early part of the process of building a product. And crappy designs just make a horrible first impression. So whether you have a full-time designer or you purchase the services of, an, of a contractor, a designer is uh, an important part of your job. So here's some qualifications that they say, let's get a bachelor's degree. They didn't mention what kind of a degree, but uh, where I work at the University, uh, Grand Canyon University, we have an entire degree called web design, and they are artists first and uh, programmers second. And so I've actually taught some of those courses. It's pretty interesting when I uh, ask my students to pull out a piece of paper and uh, draw some diagrams. I expected, like most of my courses that I've taught before, that like in math or in programming, uh, people might have a pencil, might not have a pencil. Well, these designers not only had a piece of paper, it was a, it was a tablet, a square tablet of high quality drawing paper. They had a dozen pencils of different shades of gray and of course colors. They had rulers and protractors and the work they did was three-dimensional and shaded. It was, it was like, if that is your approach to taking notes or making a concept come to your mind, then you're probably a designer. Uh, most of the time, though, I'm teaching courses on how to manage database connections and how to do encryption and security. And, and honestly, friends, in my course, you know who you are. Uh, you can't even draw a square with right angles. So there's a skill here for people who have this innate artistic talent and they like to use technology. So some of the technology that you'll be working with, of course, is CSS, which is a design language. Uh, SAS is a kind of a quasi language that helps you better with CSS. Adobe products such as Photoshop and Illustrator are probably things that you have memorized and work with on a daily basis. Their experience level they're asking is they want somebody that does some UI and also UX, which is the user experience. And so there are some qualifications for a person that you want on your team. Now we're going to have two developers here. We're gonna split this role into front end and the back end. So let's talk about the front end. So the front end is probably somebody that is a JavaScript expert. They're going to be able to build a web page that looks nice. You might call if this you might call this person a designer. So your designer and front end developer might actually be the same person. So that's kind of typical. I've met a lot of designers that are very good at programming in JavaScript. So there's certainly an overlap there. And so here's some of the tools that you'll see front end people working with: CSS, JavaScript, 
And then these two frameworks, Angular and React, seem to show up all the time. So pretty much you want a React expert if you're looking for a front-end developer. Now, we're in mobile systems here, so what I put on the screen applies to web development and somewhat to mobile development. So mobile developers are going to be working with the uh, framework of your choice. And so uh, check out a previous video that I made for how to pick the right framework, which will depend on who you hire then for your front-end development. So your back-end developer, this person is going to be creating the uh, logic, the business sense, and the databases in the background. So you are probably going to be able to pull this back-end designer or developer from other types of programming. So you don't have to be a web, um, a mobile developer per se to be a back-end person. You'll probably do similar things uh, in other applications. So front-end is, of course, the user interface, and the back-end is how you manage the data. So those are the common splits. Now let's revisit these developer roles. So I've mentioned four. We have the product manager, the designer, the front end, and the back end developers. However, we've left out some things. So there are roles such as who's going to test this thing. So frequently you expect your developers to be able to do their own testing. And that's a good thing. If you're the manager, you're going to ask those questions in an interview. Not only can you write code, but tell me about your experience with testing frameworks. How about security? Uh, we, don't, we can't afford a security expert or a security team. So once again, you might be asking your front end and especially your back end developers, what do they do about security? What are some of the practices they follow and maybe some of the examples they've built in previous applications? If you don't know anything about security, then um, of course you want to hire in that expertise. What about sales? What about marketing? Of course, those are not even technical roles, but you're going to have to have that. Maybe that's your expertise and what you're trying to get done. So a pretty obvious question should be about yourself. Which of these roles are you good at? And hopefully you are the product manager, first of all, because that's the uh, business of building apps in itself. But if you can do the other things, then you're well ahead of others. Now, a common practice that uh, you might find in some entrepreneurs is that they are the product manager role or the marketing expert. And they really don't know how to code or program. So from experts that have done this and created their own startup applications, uh, the usual advice is learn to code yourself so you can at least build part of the application and you can talk intelligently to the people that are doing the core work of your app. Because if you're ignorant on that, you are flying somewhat blind and you'll be less effective. Now, here's one way to look at it then. If we had all of these four, what's the cheapest way to fill these roles? Well, there's you. <laughs> so can you do all of them? If so, then you can maybe grow slowly, but you're on the right track. How about these? What's, let's see if we can do some outsourcing or replace them. So let's start with the designer. So a designer is not something maybe that has to be continually managed. It's a one-time thing. So maybe you could outsource the job or do it yourself. Or if you have a front-end de designer that is also your front-end developer, then you've got that one covered. Or you could buy a template. So See if you can get rid of one of these or two of these roles. Here's another way you can combine things. So the front end and the back end developer can combine into what's called a full stack developer. So if you have one experienced programmer that can do both the front end work and the database and business logic in the back, then you've saved yourself an employee. So by the way, if you're looking for employees, come to Grand Canyon University because what we're creating here are full stack developers. So they uh, understand various languages such as C-sharp, Java, JavaScript, and PHP, and several types of databases. So there's a commercial to hire my students. So there's your roles. Now, the product manager, we're going to leave as you. So that is probably a key position that only you can really do well. Now, here are some principles that probably should apply. Thinking about getting a, let's, let's assume that you're in a small company. If you're in a big company already, then this might not be a big deal. But uh, remember this, that employees are your very best assets, but also their most expensive parts of your business. Uh, employees require work to manage. And so startups need to keep the management simple and costs low. So 
A lot of small teams don't even have an HR department, for example. So at this stage of life, I've been in several different roles, including the technician and the manager and uh, now as a, as a professor. And so some of the principles that I would put out there is work with a small team with people that you really, really trust and appreciate rather than trying to get a big team. Um, be very careful and very deliberate on how you hire. Make sure that you get good recommendations. Check the references. Don't take a risk because hiring the wrong person is a painful and costly mistake. And so you'll save yourself a lot of stress and the stress of somebody else if you put the person in the wrong role that maybe they don't really want to be in. So in the next video, we're going to talk about how to create a job requisition, how to identify the actual experiences that you need to hire. If you'd like to see the entire course playlist, I'll put a link here for how to see all of these chapters. Make sure that you subscribe if this is valuable information, and thank you for coming to class with me. We'll see you next time. Hi, and welcome to the Business of Building Applications. This is a course for people who are interested in creating businesses that work with mobile applications. Now, in this course, there are several chapters, so if any of this material looks of interest to you, make sure you subscribe or go look at the playlist for the channel. Now, right now, we're in this section called Hiring the Team, and so we're focusing on the skills that you need and how to manage a project. And so let's talk here about the differences between mobile development and web development and the skills that are involved. So this might mean that you are either looking at it from the perspective of the manager who is trying to find a competent mobile developer, or perhaps you are more in the career path of becoming a developer and you would like to compare the differences in what's required and what kind of benefits that you can get. So first of all, let's talk about the overall market of talent pool that there is. This is a Stack Overflow survey result chart from 2020. Every year, Stack Overflow, the website, asks their users about themselves and about their preferences on, on development tools. So one of the first questions is, what do you do? And so you can see that a great deal of people classify themselves as developers on Stack Overflow. And uh, they say that they are either back-end, full-stack, or front-end in their main categories. So those three main uh, groups there are probably web developers. That's usually the de default de uh, expectation. And you can see down in fifth place at 19% that they consider themselves a mobile developer. So it's a minority of a job market, but certainly not invisible. Obviously, all of us use apps. And so this is going to kind of steer the decisions about where you would get your talent pool. First of all, let's talk about the need for why a company would want a mobile application. So let's th take a scenario where you are an established company. So we're no longer talking about making a startup out of thin air with a mobile app. So you're, you're a, a business that sells products and you probably have stores and you have a lot of employees. The people are going to find you through a web search, probably through Google. And then people want to come back to your company again, and so returning visitors are likely going to back to their website. And then finally, we have what we call our regular customers, the frequent transactions, and they're going to install the app. So we go from Google to website to app. And so if we were looking at the company called Expedia, that's probably how it would happen. They would search for cheap airline tickets. Maybe Expedia is a search result. If the uh, customer is uh, liking the service, they come back to their website and then they use it so often that they get a better performance with an app. So my, my point here is that the need for a mobile app for a company like Expedia might be really in third place after they get their website going. So here's how it looks then. We have contact with new customers through your web page and you retain your customers through your mobile. Now, you might say, I want to choose mobile in my uh, application development career or in the, solving my business problem because of certain things that only phones can do. So for instance, you're trying to build a virtual reality app, well obviously you need a device like a phone. How about a phone app that is GPS aware or has augmented reality, such as a self-guided tour of your uh, neighborhood? 
Or maybe you have a map app and you're going to require Google Maps. And uh, a gyroscope with a game, of course, is going to be hardware driven. Or maybe you have some kind of a camera specific app. More than just taking photos, you might be scanning images or working with barcodes. And then finally, uh, augmented reality is a cool tool that allows you to look around an environment and place objects such as a new piece of furniture or apply makeup to your face. Or in this case, as you can see the example, you can see examples of uh, signs, virtual signs that appear on the street. And so all of these would probably guide you to hiring a mobile developer or to developing a mobile solution rather than a website. Now, look at the contrast and overlap of where you would learn how to do this thing. Most people, when they start making themselves into software engineers or software developers, they would probably learn how to make things on the web. So, since that's the most common medium that most of us work with. So, this big bubble here represents all the skills that you would need for a mobile, or I'm sorry, for a web developer. Now we have another overlap, which is mobile development. Now I'm not quite sure how much there is an overlap, probably more than I drew here, because everything that you learn in a good software engineering degree is probably going to translate right into mobile development. So maybe I could have overlapped at least half of that. Here's the point. More people out there in the job market are already skilled in web development, fewer in mobile development. Uh, web languages are similar to mobile technology. As a matter of fact, some of the cross-platform cross tools, such as React Native, are best learned first as a mobile, I mean, sorry, as a web developer, and then applied to the mobile environment. And they apply so well that a React developer can probably pick up mobile development in React Native quite easily. Uh, many businesses can then just find their mobile development talent right within their walls. They don't have to go out and hire a mobile developer. They just need to train their existing team with a few new skills and away they go. So consider that. Based on what you need on your team, whether you're hiring from scratch or you already have some people to work with, you should know that there's overlap in these skills. So the trends that seem to go this way are we have native apps as the uh, first choice for building a, a mobile solution and then what, what we would call cross-platform apps which focuses in on JavaScript sometimes and so native apps were the first and the 100% only solution and of course if we have any alternatives to that that's going to eat into that market and then the cross-platform solutions seem to be on the rise now, I put here JavaScript apps, so that refers to React Native, probably. There are other multi-platform tools, such as Xamarin, which is all in C Sharp, or um, Kotlin, using um, cross-platform compiling is somewhat cross-platform. Uh, Flutter and Dart uh, is another combination. So just putting JavaScript here is kind of misleading, but the idea is that the trends are trying to get cross-platform solutions. And a lot of that looks like web development. So if you're a native app developer, you're going to know Android very well or iOS very well, but um, they're very independent. If you're trying to do cross-platform work, you're probably going to also know quite a bit about web development. So anyway, that's the trends I see is what the market is trying to do. And I don't know if the Cross-platform solutions are always the best, but that seems to be where we're trying to go. Now let's talk about the skill levels and the complexity. So on the left side, we have web development at the very beginning. If you've never done anything before, you can build web pages quite easily with a tool such as WordPress or maybe Squarespace or something that is just as easy to use as a desktop publishing tools such as Publisher or maybe even Microsoft Word. Uh, going up from there you can call yourself a web designer so you start to learn a bit more about CSS, uh, some JavaScript, and then if you try to get to the full stack you have the database in the back end. And so that's kind of the progression that I would teach my students and probably you've learned as well if you're on that path. In the mobile development it seems like we skip that first stage. There might be some tools out there to create mobile apps without code, but 
uh, I don't really know how successful they are. So most of the time when I teach uh, app development, we jump right in with somebody that knows Java and we start working with uh, pretty complex code. And then finally you get to the top end where you have the full stack again in a mobile app. So my perception, I could be wrong, maybe you could correct me if you put these uh, corrections, of course, in the comments, is that there seems to be this bottom rung of the ladder that is missing on the app development side. So more than likely, if you're in app development, you've got more skills than somebody that is just beginning with coding. Uh, this was reflected in some salaries. So on the left side, we have uh, what I searched for in, I think it was um, indeed.com. They said an average salary on the, in the United States for an Android developer was about $120,000 and slightly less for the software engineer, which is more general and probably focused on web development is, is the majority of their work. So you get paid more as an app developer, probably because, as I said, the difficulty level is a bit higher and your skills are probably a bit more advanced. So the conclusion then, uh, your mobile app, either you're an established business or it could be that you're just starting directly with a mobile solution and trying to launch your startup that way. I mean, Instagram, for example. Uh, you use a mobile app only if you need some unique capabilities. Most of the time you can build an app without building an app. You can build a mobile friendly website. So a responsive design website can get orders and pre present information to your customers quite easily. And so you might not even need a mobile developer. But if you have these unique capabilities in a phone and you want to use them, then you'll obviously need to make a map and make an app. Uh, more challenging for beginners and then better pay. So that's the column for mobile. The case for web development is that it's more widely utilized, so you're going to find people that can work on your projects and you can hire them. If you are a web developer, you're going to have more choices to pick from. And also, if you decide you want to begin in one or the other, then I would probably recommend that you start as a web developer if you're a beginning programmer. And you can transfer those skills later to mobile after you've uh, maybe got a year or so of experience. In the next video, I'm going to help you with the Scrum and Agile process. And so that way you can manage a team using today's most common methods. If you'd like to see the entire playlist for this course, I will also put that link here. So make sure that you subscribe if this is good information to you, and we'll see you next time. Hi, and welcome back to the business of building applications. In this course, we're talking about the management and the business decisions that go behind creating an application, whether it's for your business or for a startup. But it's about mobile apps and the process that is used. So we're in this section here called hiring the team. And so we're going to, in this video, talk about managing your team and using the agile software process. If any of these other chapters look of interest to you, then make sure you subscribe so that you can come back and watch them later. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach software development and computer science at Grand Canyon University. So welcome to class. So we've got one more section ahead of us, and then we're going to move on to other greater things. So right now, we're talking about managing the team with Agile. And so Agile is a software development process. So sometimes you're going to hear in your life the letters, the SDLC, the Software Development Life Cycle. And so this goes from the concept of an idea all the way to where you retire a piece of software and no longer use it. So the SDLC is a way to bring sanity into a complex process, trying to bring some structure into managing something that frequently fails. Right now, there are two basic ideas for how to manage any kind of an engineering project. Waterfall is the traditional method that's been used for centuries, and Agile, well, it's the newest name for a process that is incremental. And so Agile is preferred and probably has some good reasons to be preferred in today's market. So here's what the m previous method looks like. This is the waterfall methodology, and you can see where it gets its name because one step of the process is completed and then falls into the next. 
So in a waterfall methodology, you try to imagine all of the details of your product up front, and you would design a very comprehensive guide to how to build it. And so you really create it twice in your mind, once in your uh, idea and then second on your paperwork. And then you give it to your engineers and they develop it. Now the, the design then, of course, is structured, it's static, it might be what you want, but it might not be as well. And the risk is that if you have left out any details, they never get addressed. And so this process leads to expensive dinosaurs that people abandoned. And so waterfall methodology, though it sounds logical, in practice it has some issues. And the issues are is that we're trying to do all of our thinking about the product up front at one time. And we don't usually do a very well, good job of that. So in comes the second type of software development, which is iterative. We develop a feature and then test it out and show it to our users. And incrementally, we increase our product. And so this has been proven to be more successful in the long run. And to get that process working, we use the process called Agile. Agile or Agile Scrum, because Scrum is a meeting, a name for a meeting that we do on a regular basis in this process. So really, it's Agile Software Development. So what we do with Agile Software Development is we start with a project backlog, which is kind of like the waterfall technology, where we say, we've got a pretty big picture of what we want their app to do. We list all of those features. But we don't implement them all. We just implement the first one, or maybe two. We create what's called a sprint backlog, which is a short list of things to do. And then within two weeks to 30 days, we do a sprint. And then finally, we have at the end of a short period of time, at the end of our sprint, we have a product that works. We can test it out. Now, it only might be the title screen and the login, but at least we get a view of what the, the, the design is. Uh, so it's a very minimal product. It only has a few features. But we can show that to our users, and then they can decide if we're on the right track or not. And if we're not, then we've only wasted two weeks of time, or we can make adjustments so that we can make corrections for the future. To make this work, we do a few principles. One principle is called self-organizing your teams. You put people together, and they have their specialties, but we give them the autonomy to work as a small group. And so this grid here might show you how you would organize an entire company of agile teams. And so you can see that there are four people or four teams and each, uh, each person then is got their own thing. So if you, you might have a bigger team than four, but usually small teams work best. So you can see the specialists, specialty, such as somebody that's in the UI design, somebody's a software developer, it looks like we might need some data modeling, maybe a database expert. But the idea is that we try to come up with these little pods of people. Now, when you come up with these groups, it's important that you pick the right people on your team. Of course, we all want the people in the top right corner of our team. They have high capacity. They're well skilled at their job and they're anxious to get started. So we'll give them a green light. So the low capacity people are your second choice, which is they don't really know what they're doing yet, but they're really anxious to get started. And then the other two on the left, uh, the willingness part, that's harder to cure. So if we were to respond to these people as they've been given to us, maybe you're an agile team leader and you've got this mix of exactly these four people, what are you gonna do with them? Well, first of all, the green we're going to promote. We're going to give them flexibility, autonomy. We're going to let them run their own schedule. We're going to make them creative. Uh, the low capacity people are going to make mistakes, of course. And so we're going to pair them up with somebody that knows what they're doing. We're going to give them training if they don't know what their language is or, or if they haven't worked with a certain technology. Uh, as the manager, you're probably going to want to keep track of this person. You're going to help them out, share with them what you know, or pair them with somebody that does. Now, our third person here is our high capacity but low willingness. And so you, as the manager of the team, are going to probably have to clarify why we're doing what we're doing. 
So one-on-one -on -one meetings, clarify the goals, the directions, why this, why this sprint is necessary, what the vision of the company is. Try to clear out any hesitations they have. Maybe they need a schedule change. Maybe they need something more interesting to work on. But you got to find out why they're not so willing. And then for the last part where you've got these incompetent people that really don't know what they're doing, they're just toxic and you should probably fire them now. So when you look at your agile team, you want to make sure that you can get as many people in the top right quadrant as we can. Because you're going to make them work kind of independently. You're going to put them in co-location areas, hopefully where they can see each other frequently. And so uh, studies have shown that the further away people are isolated, uh, the less effective they are in solving collaboration problems. So unfortunately, with the COVID plague that we experienced in 2020, many of us didn't have the chance to work with our teammates in the office. Uh, we'd started to do remote work. But the ideal is to have a close relationship where unplanned meetings can occur, quick questions, where you can have people show each other ideas. Uh, you don't have to wait formally to present something. You can either go with an idea or abandon it based on immediate feedback. So if you do find yourself in the remote work situation, which is probably the future, uh, try to do as casually as you can. Um, as you can see in this case, we have a mix. So some people are remote, some people are close by. But the idea is to keep up a constant flow of communication so that ideas can be tested or approved or abandoned quickly. Now, one of the things that you're going to work with on a project is the product backlog. Now, a backlog sounds like you're behind, but really what it means is a product feature list. And so that feature list is going to be everything that your app needs to do. And so you can see in the left column of this board, we have sticky notes. Every sticky note is going to describe a feature of the product. For example, let's say on one of the sticky notes it says, I want to display all of the orders of a, of a, of a user in a date range and print a report. So that's a feature. Now that feature is going to take somebody some work. There's going to be lots of other features uh, and each one of those is going to require a sprint to be able to uh, get the work done. But we want to identify which, which features in the backlog are the most important. And when we find the first important ones, we're going to put them into the next column, the sprint backlog. So a sprint, as you might recall, is a short period of time, maybe two weeks, and we will work on a few items from the product backlog. And then you can see the rest of it. We're going to move them on until we get done. Now, when you have a sprint planning session, you and your teammates are going to pick out some items from that product backlog. And you're going to take a look at what needs to be done and prioritize them. So you might pick some feature because it's easy to do, or you might pick a feature because it's critically important for the app. But whatever the reason is, you're going to move those items from the product backlog that are going to be currently uh, busy and put them into a sprint backlog and they will get your full attention for the next two weeks. So our sprint backlog then is our guide. You're going to put that on a board and you're going to talk about it every single day. So your backlog is everything that has to be done either in the app or in the case of the sprint backlog everything that needs to be done in the next two weeks. And then of course completing those steps is a daily task. So now we've gotten to the term called sprint. What are we going to do in that sprint and how long is it going to take? So a sprint typically is two weeks long. The first day is the planning meeting so that you can decide what the next goals are. And you can see that every day of the sprint is a scheduled meeting, probably early in the morning that says your daily stand-up. So a stand-up meeting is where you literally do not sit down so it doesn't take too long. So for 15 minutes, you give a brief update on what you're doing. And then when we get to the end of the sprint, you can see that there are two items. One's called a sprint review and a sprint retrospective. So you can kind of look back to see what went well and what didn't. So the product increment is what we're trying to create in a sprint. So an incremental product is something that is, like I mentioned, 
less featureful than the full thing, but still enough functionality so that we could call it shippable. So shippable means you can show it to your client, you can show it to the customer, they can test it out and give immediate feedback on it. So this is the magic of why you do incremental development, is that if the product is a failure, you can find out right away. So instead of building a billion dollars worth of software, you spend a hundred thousand dollars worth of software, and then you can change it or reject it before you waste too much money. So an incremental approach saves money. Now the Daily Scrum is where you're going to get together with your teammates. And what are you going to talk about? Well, really the agenda is three questions. You're going to tell everyone in your team what you did yesterday. So yesterday I created the report that would show all the orders from a certain date range. And it now converts into a PDF file. Okay, so there's my accomplishment. Today, what will you do today? Well, today I am going to make that available to users or I'm going to make it available to administrators, some other new feature. And so something concrete. And then, is there any impediment is the third question. So is there something blocking you? Do I need help? Do I need a new uh, uh, permissions to something? Do I need to understand something? Do I need someone else to do something for me? But in the daily scrum, you have those three questions. Now, if this is a good way to manage employees because you know what they're doing. They can report, and they can report to each other. So if you have a lazy employee that is just out at the beach, and he says, what did I do yesterday? And he really doesn't have anything concrete. If that happens for too often, then it's obvious who is the dead wood in your tree and will probably either be terminated or looked over for any further uh, enhancements. Now, when you get to the end of a sprint, we're going to call this event the Sprint Review. What we want to do in a review is just to look back at what we created. So in this case, you're probably going to have your team around your uh, computer showing you the product, the digital product you made. And in front of us is the man in the chair. He is the customer. He is the person that is paying you. And you can show off, this is show and tell to say, here's what we made. This is exactly what you told us. And at the sprint review, this is his chance to say, I don't like it, or perfect, you did it in a creative way. I love it, and uh, let's keep going in the same direction. So the sprint review is that periodic checkup point with your client to make sure that you're on the right track. Now the retrospective is also at the end of the sprint. And we just look at our own work process and we ask, is there anything that's working really well? Or is there something that we should change? And what can we commit for the next sprint? So a retrospective just kind of gives us a chance to do some self-improvement. If this is relevant to you, then check out this other video on the four roles that you would expect to see in a software development team. Also, if you'd like to see the entire playlist of things that we've talked about in the business of apps, I'll put that link here as well. So thank you for coming and join me again for class. Hi, welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course to help you as a manager of a small business or a team in building mobile apps for good solutions. We've got several chapters in this course that we've already covered. And we are coming up here to number seven, which is called hiring the team. In this video, we're going to be talking about writing a job requisition and a good job posting that will get the people that fit your needs. We've got one more topic ahead of us, which is called future trends. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. If any of this looks interesting to you, make sure you subscribe so that you get all of the information that will help you succeed in your venture. So in this video, we're talking about writing a job requisition and attracting the right people that will make your success a reality. So first of all, we're going to talk about the difference between an internal and an external requisition. So if you're writing an internal rec, it's because you're working at a company that needs to know these basic things. And so I probably don't need to fill out the form for you. You can see what your company would like. But I would predict that you're going to be asked several of these things. So you're going to be picking a title 
You might not have any liberty on what you call that job because there's already predefined jobs. Uh, you probably have a salary band that you are offering to your employees. So you don't really know exactly uh, what your upper and lower limits are until you talk to your uh, boss and the con company controller. Uh, you will probably have some requirements that you put in there and you probably have some kind of a contract. And so sometimes you see the words salary and exempt or non-exempt, which is rather confusing. So exempt means they're exempt from the rules of overtime and union representation. So these are the people that you can have work 80 hours a week and not pay them any extra money. You'll probably be asked to set a budget. So how much do you expect to pay here? And of course, you're trying to find somebody that will be worth, willing to work less than that. Now, quite different is the strategy of producing an external posting because this is what your candidates will see, not the internal documents. So the differences are because there's differences in goals. The internal documentation is to meet your business goals, your HR requirements, and to budgeting probably. So when you write an external document, you have to uh, clear away any of the language that you're comfortable with as an insider of the company. And think about people that are on the street or working at other companies and they don't know anything about you. And so you're trying to target the language to the people that will likely fit the role the best. So you probably want to start off with this question about what do I really require for this person to have on the day they enter the job? And what would be nice to have? Because if you put too many requirements, of course, you're not going to have anyone actually apply. So I picked a few um, job postings out of Indeed.com that are currently being posted where I live. And you can see here that this was for a mobile developer and the company called uh, Signing Day Sports. So I don't know anything about the company other than the fact that they are looking for a mobile developer. Notice they have the qualifications listed here. So they are looking for a degree. They want some experience. And they, they mention some specific languages and frameworks that they work on. So it looks like React Native is what they're building in. So they've already decided the technology. And if you don't know that technology, then you're probably not a very good fit. However, you can see that they have familiarity as a requirement. So these are the nice to haves. And so things that are not necessarily uh, directly on the job and the first day. So you have to distinguish between things that you need to have and then what you're willing to train them on. So if you find a really good employee who has got most of the skills, then you can probably make them work. Here's another one. You notice they use the quote must in capital letters. So they obviously have a hard, fast rule. So this comes from the Nikola Motor Company. So this is a company in Phoenix that makes electric trucks. And I think they want to be the next Tesla. Anyway, they're looking for Android development. So specifically, you must have proven experience in Android. But then notice below, they have some other things that they probably will not get in most of their candidates. So the Android Compose framework. So if they find somebody with the Android Compose framework, they're going to guarantee them that they're going to have an interview likely. So next, let's talk about what would be beneficial in a cross-discipline candidate. So if you're looking specifically for somebody with experience in another field, this would be important to put in your job requisition in the public. So we're looking for the core developer skills here. But you might have other things, such as somebody that's worked in a travel environment before. Have Is your product geared toward travel agents or for online purchases of airplane tickets or something? Then maybe you would want somebody that's worked in that field. Are you working in a medical plan? Are you Is your app serving doctors or nurses or hospitals? Then if somebody comes to you with a degree in nursing and software development, which would be a, a, quite an odd combination, that would be certainly a valuable thing. And of course, your uh, automobile mechanic would be another example. Uh, one of my students actually has these two things now and wants to find a job working where some software is in a garage environment. Military experience. A lot of students that I teach come from the military and they're trying to transition into a new career. And uh, my career advice to them is, if you are looking for a job as a software developer, why not go back to the military and work as a civilian? 
if you are serving military clients with your app, then maybe these are the kind of people you want to hire. People that have worked in the military and they understand it, and they also know how to write code. And of course, education comes to mind is if you're trying to serve schools. So it's not really essential that your software developer is cross uh, professions, is it? Uh, you'll have to decide that. But if it is important to you, then you probably want to put it in as one of those nice to haves. How about the intangibles? So you're going to have a variety of people looking at you and they don't really know what you expect. So think of your own expectations of what your team is going to be and see if you can filter out the people that really don't matter. So for instance, are you going to be working in close teamwork with like agile systems or are you looking to hire a single lone developer? So that would be important for the people to know up front before they apply to your job. So some people have strong preferences both ways. Now the question is, what is your preference? So if you're looking for a certain person, make sure you put it in the description. Uh, what is your parameters? What are you going to expect your software developer to be? Are you going to have strict guidelines, deadlines? Are you going to have code that must be written in a right format? Do you have specific languages and frameworks that they must work with? Or are you going to be so flexible that they can choose their own technologies and their own ways of building things? So uh, if you're comfortable with either one of these, then you probably should specify in your job requisition how you want it to look. Because once again, people are going to waste your time if you offer them a job that they really don't fit with. Uh, how do you handle ambiguity? So are you going to have very detailed designs? Are you going to require people to create detailed designs? Or are you more flexible to say, let's just see how things turn out? And uh, what, is the, uh, what is the structure there? Be very clear about what you expect, whether it is either uh, very strong or very weak in your picture. Also, when you look at job postings, uh, I see these two uh, very often. So what kind of intangible do you have at your company? Are you called fast-paced and goal-oriented? Or are you more flexible and work-life balance is important to you? Now, honestly, I've never applied to anything that had the word fast-paced environment in it. Because I really think that a place like SpaceX would be an awesome experience if you have 180% of your life to give to them. However, I have other things in life that I do besides work. And so a job description that had fast-paced environment would likely just turn me off and say, I don't think I would turn out for more than a year in a high-pressure system like that. So how are you going to treat your employees? Are you expecting them to work as a startup and dedicate their whole life? Or are you looking for them to produce a balance between what they do in their time away from work and what they do at your job. So whatever your expectations are, it's probably a good idea to put them right in the job posting. Now there's also some HR language that you should include in your posting. So probably you're required by the company policy or even state law to have non-discrimination phrases. Uh, you should have probably some company language. Uh, the company probably has a statement of their purpose or they have something that goes into every job description and so make sure that you include that. Or if you're your own company and you're a startup, you might want to think about what your story is. Why would people want to work for you? If you're the greatest thing in the world, then tell us what it is. So you're trying to sell yourself when you put the posting out there. Are you going to require citizenship or will you provide visa and sponsorship? That's an HR thing. How about this? Well, remote work or on-site work? Are you comfortable with each? So if you're comfortable with remote work, you can have a wide group of talent from all over the country or even around the world. And uh, if, you're, if you're a more face-to-face -face person, then of course you're going to be limited by the people that live in your area. So that's a decision that you're going to have to decide based on uh, your comfort, comfort level with that, that system. So whatever the case is, make sure that you are upfront with your employees of how you expect them to work here. Also think of adjacent skills. So you might have your must-have list, but don't be too restrictive on it because you want to have enough people that can really do the job even though they might not have the exact experience you need. So a software developer 
with web experience can probably transition into mobile development pretty easily. Uh, they, it depends on how many experience years they have. Languages also are very similar. So the syntax of Java and Swift and C Sharp and C++ and JavaScript, they're very similar. Uh, obviously, those that are experts in each of these are going to argue with me to say there's huge differences. But honestly, these are all the uh, descendants of the original C language. This, these are C-like languages. And so if you have an expertise in one of these, then you can probably pick another language that is in that same family. Also think of the structure of how software is designed and architect. So the model view controller, the MVC frameworks and the, and, the, and the setup there are very similar, no matter whether you're working in PHP or in Java or in JavaScript, a lot of the strategies and designs are the same. So if they've got heavy experience in a framework that's not the framework you're on, they're probably going to have a lot of lessons that they can carry in. And so adjacent skills work well. So let's say if we had a situation where we have a React Native developer, that's the job we want, and you get these applications that come from people with expertise in cybersecurity, or a web designer, or a database administrator, or embedded systems, or electrical engineering. Don't throw them out, and don't restrict them from applying if you are willing to do the training. So once again, think about what is essential and what can be trained. I would rather pick somebody who is an expert web designer and can demonstrate a great portfolio but yet has not learned React Native. They've proved themselves in some other field that is adjacent. And so you might want to think about inviting uh, related degrees and related experience to apply if they can prove that they're a good employee. Now I would also recommend that you ask people to apply with a portfolio. A portfolio, of course, is a collection of things that you can see that people have actually done. So let's take a look at an example of a portfolio. And you tell me if you would like to hire this person or not. So Holland Acoin was one of my students for several years at Grand Canyon University, and she just graduated. Now, she created for herself a portfolio of everything that she's done in her university experience. So let's take a look at her projects. So she's uh, built this tool here in Java Spring. So you can see that right away she knows how to program in Java. And she's sorted it nicely so that you can see each of the languages that she's worked in and the projects that relate to them. So let's say I want to see what she's done in Java. And let's see what uh, is going on in iHeartRate. So iHeartRate was something she did in the spring of 2020. You can see all the different languages that she's built with the design and the final product of what it works with. So I believe this was a watch application. So that an Apple watch that would just record your heart rate and put it into a database and then you can have some web reports to go along with it. So I recommend to all my students that they create one of these portfolios because it demonstrates in a concrete way what you know how to do. So as an employer, you get to know a lot about your candidates just from looking at their portfolio. As a matter of fact, there's not really very good information that you can gather at a job interview just by asking them questions and having them tell you generic answers. So a portfolio is a great answer to the question is, can you build an app? Now there's probably some other things that I failed to include in how you should write a job requisition. So those of you that are looking to hire and have hired people, tell me in the comments below what has worked for you. The next video in this course is about the future trends of technology and especially with mobile. If you'd like to see the entire playlist, I'll put a link here so you can go back and catch up on all the great things about the business of running apps. Please subscribe if you like this and welcome back to class. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course about mobile app development. In this section, which is number seven, we're talking about hiring the team. Now this is an assignment video, so we're talking about activity 7-1. So if you're one of my students at Grand Canyon University, this is what I'm going to assign you for homework. What we're going to talk about in this assignment are the team roles. Now in a previous video, we talked about four background specialties that would be 
in a lot of uh, teams. So this is the project manager, the designer, the front end, and the back end developers. Now there are probably other roles in a team, but we're focusing on these four. So in this assignment, what I want you to do is write a two-part paper that compares the responsibilities of these four roles. So essentially, I want to ask you in part one of the paper, what do these people do? What's their essential job function and how do they add value to your team? Then the second is in your particular situation, based on your expertise and your company or your startup company, where are you going to fill these roles? Who are the people that are most likely to join you? Now that could be that you're going to fulfill them yourself or you've got friends in mind or you've got a way to go and recruit them. So this is the two-part solution here. So instructions for part one. I want you to answer the question, what important service do each of these members provide? What education and experience would you expect that these people would have? So if you were writing a job posting and trying to hire them, what kind of experience and education would you put as a requirement? What strengths does this person bring to the team? So is a designer just as good as a developer or does one do something slightly better than the other? In part two, I'm going to ask you if there are any opportunities for you not to hire them. So for instance, can you double them up? Can you outsource the role? Do you have to pay a full time? Now, are there any of these roles that can be combined into a single person? For instance, do you have a friend who is a developer and a designer, or are you good at this on your own? So what is your case? What's your situation? How are you gonna save money? Which of these are the most expensive to fill? So based on your market research, which of these do you think are the most critical and you would never outsource, or which of these is where you could save some cash? So then for your role, are there any roles that can be considered minimal? Or are they all equally important to the development of your app? So only you can really answer that based on how well you work. Now describe your own set of skills. How strong are you in those four roles? Is there anything that you feel like you would want to do yourself? Or is there something that you feel inadequate on and you would want to hire it out? So that's part two. And analyzing how well these four roles would fit in your team. So if you were one of my students, this is what I would expect you to send me. A Word document that has two parts. So part one is a description of what these four roles are and how they add value to the team. And then part two is a recommendation for you personally, how would you plan to consolidate or fill these roles based on your own expertise and the people that you already work with. And so that's the goal here for this assignment. So if you're not one of my students, feel free to put in the comments below what you think of these roles and how valuable are they. For instance, is a designer a critical person on your team or have you worked on a team where the designer is you as the programmer and how well did that go for you? Now, if you would like to subscribe, you can see the rest of the channel and see what the uh, ideas are on this course. I will put a link to the full course so that you can see the other videos and the lessons about app design. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next class. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course on mobile development and the business decisions that go along with it. So we're on part seven here, which is a seven of eight chapters, and we're talking about hiring the right people for your team. So this is a homework assignment video. So if you're one of the students in my class at Grand Canyon University, this is what I'm going to ask you to do. So we're going to write an internal requisition form. So if you are a hiring manager, let's say you're now in a medium to large size company, you're going to have certain documents that you have to fill out to justify why you need a new person on your team. So put yourself in the role of a team manager of a medium to large company. Assume that there are multiple levels of management and multiple departments in the company. In other words, a bureaucracy. So what I want you to do is to assume that you're going to fill one of the roles in your team that we've talked about in a previous activity. So remember that was the project manager, the designer, the front end developer, and the back end developer. Or if you've got another role that's just as critical and I haven't thought of, then you could use that one too. So what I want you to do is to write an internal requisition. So think of how you would justify adding a person to your company. So sometimes companies are very hesitant to hire because people are expensive. 
So what we want to do is justify it with a certain goals. So in the first part, make sure that you include a job title that, it re, uh, that coordinates with the rest of the company. So don't invent something new. See if you can figure out what your company already calls people. Make sure that you get the right department and you put your name for the hiring manager and you probably have to just justify it by what this person is supposed to do, right? A job description. And then you have a reason why a person is needed. So did somebody quit or are you creating a new position? So depending on your company, one of those would be easier to justify and get authority for hiring than the others would. So let's keep going with part two of what you would put in the internal requisition. So you'd have to do a salary estimate. So you don't just invent numbers out of thin air, you would have to justify it. So if your company already has very fixed salary bands, you might call this a person level A or B or 3.5 or whatever your system is. And if you don't have a system like that, then you would probably have to justify it based on averages from websites like salary.com or someone that is like Glassdoor and they are estimating what is average for your area. So remember, we hire people at average salary and then we say to our customers that we hire the best in the world. So I don't know how that works. But anyway, that's usually how you justify a salary range. And then you put a start date on it to say this is uh, going to coordinate with either our fiscal year or maybe a project start date. And then we have the number of hours that we plan to work. So sometimes you can hire part-time and of course full-time equivalent would be 40 hours a week. And then how long is this going to work? So are you gonna have this person as a permanent employee or are you gonna keep them on until the project's over? So that's some of the things that you would justify in a internal requisition. So I forgot to put a few others. So contract type, is this permanent or is this uh, temporary? What are the qualifications? Are you going to expect to have a degree? What kind of degree? Or maybe just work experience? So trying to fit the role is uh, appropriate, of course. And then the budget. So. You can put down what you expect to em employ the person as. And of course the game is you try to find somebody that will tell you that they're willing to work for less. And if they are, then you hire them. So I don't know if that's uh, morally objectionable, but I think that's how most people do things. Now, if you were one of my students, this is what I would expect you to send to me. You would send me a Word document that has the internal requisition for a position on your development team, filling out all of the details that are in the items that I just showed you. So this isn't really a thought-provoking assignment. It's more of an exercise to investigate where you work and find out what kind of things that are out there. So your requisition at uh, your company will probably look like nothing uh, similar to what other people's are doing, but it will not be identical. And if you're not working at any company, then of course you've got some flexibility to say uh, what you would think would be a likely way to requisition a new an employee. If you're not one of my students, then you can put down in the comments below what you think about the experience of how your company works and how difficult it is to justify a new person on your team. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you haven't so far, and I will put a link to the entire playlist for this course and other courses as well so that you can join me again in the next class. Thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course about mobile app development and the business decisions that go along with it. So we're in chapter seven of eight chapters. We're talking about hiring the team. And this video, we're talking about an assignment that I would give you if you were one of my students. So this is homework. So activity 7.3, which is about creating a job posting. So remember, we're trying to put you in the role of the team lead, and you're trying to justify why you should hire somebody. Now, once you've got approval for that, how are you going to attract the right members to your team? So we're going to actually write a job posting using examples that we would find on Indeed or on Glassdoor or other places. And we want to apply the principles that were taught in previous videos of what makes an effective job posting and how you can make it fit with the people that you want to hire. So choose one of these four roles 
whether it's the project manager, the designer, the front end or the back end, or if you've got another role in mind, you could probably use that. But somebody that is relevant to your app development process. And we want to be able to study the materials for this topic. So that means I want you to go back and look at previous videos that I've created that give recommendations for how to post. So what are we going to put into our job posting? So this is some of the things. You're gonna have the job title, a clear summary of what the job will do, the responsibilities on a daily basis or on a monthly basis or whatever your plan is. We expect to put the qualifications there. So how much education and experience or licensing or certifications does this role need? What are the benefits that you provide to them? And describe your company, why they should work for you. And so some of the recommendations that I put there earlier would give an idea of the style you are and what kind of a, a fit that most people would want to apply for. So make it look attractive, but of course make it look realistic as well. So what I want you to then do is to take a look at what you wrote and do a one-page self-evaluation. Compare this to where other people have written. So yours will be different than what you would find on other companies. So for instance, if you worked in Phoenix, where I do, you would probably think, find things like for Intel or American Express or Carvana or PayPal. Some of those are the big companies around here. How do they differ from what you plan to do? And so what I want you to do is to say, if you've borrowed from another posting, uh, compare the two. So I think frequently, that's how a lot of job postings are created, is that the manager copies and pastes from a other company's work and then tweaks it. So if that's your process, then tell me what you changed, what you deleted, what you added, because it's probably not identical to other companies as well. So that's what I want you to do, is evaluate what you wrote. So if you were one of my students, this is what I would expect you to turn in. Send me a Word document that has the job posting, and then following that, an evaluation, kind of a critique of why this works. What makes your posting effective? What did you emphasize? And so that would be uh, a reflection to on what you just wrote. So if you're not one of my students, then feel free to write in the comments below about some of the greatest job posting errors that you've seen, things that are laughable perhaps, or things that would make you run, red flags you might call them, of why you would never apply to a company based on what they wrote in their job description. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. So there's lots of other points to this course and there's a playlist here that would give you the other items. So thanks for watching and make sure that you come back for the next class of mobile app development. Hi, and welcome to the business of building applications. This is a course for people that are business leaders or entrepreneurs. So we've covered several items already in this course, and we are on the last of our chapters. So we are going to look in this video about 12 trends that I see in the next decade or so regarding mobile technology. My name is Shad Sluter, and I teach computer science and software development at Grand Canyon University. So if this looks interesting, make sure you subscribe, and then you can come to class with me on a daily basis. So let's get started here. We're talking about 12 mobile tech ideas that are coming or developing in the near future. And so some of these are here, but they just don't work very well, and others will grow in popularity. So the first one that I'm going to put on the list is cloud computing. And cloud computing is far more than just running a server on the cloud. It means that you are able to offload a great deal of the work that your phone does as a low powered device and put it in the hands of supercomputers. So the best way to show you what is available is just to go to cloud.google.com, for example, Google is one company that has great cloud services. So what do they do? They have everything from machine learning and AI to storage to ways to make uh, your finances work. So you don't rely on your computer as much as you used to to actually do heavy computing items. So for instance, think of the voice recognition tools that are on your phone right now. So Siri and Cortana can understand you pretty well. Do you really think that your phone is doing all of that voice recognition? 
No, it's not. They're sending your recorded message to the cloud and the supercomputers in the data centers are doing the analysis on your voice and then immediately send back what they think the text is. And so all of these cloud services are a huge variety of things from voice recognition to all kinds of processing power. And uh, your phone doesn't really have to do the work. It just has to connect you to the place that does the work for you. And so I see cloud computing growing even more than it is today. So the next trend that I see a greater emphasis on is artificial intelligence. And so the major software developers like Google and Microsoft have great tools that allow developers like you and me to simply plug in libraries and functions and APIs and we can just take advantage of it. So I'm not an AI expert, but I can add AI to my phone apps because of these plugins. You can see that this is Microsoft's uh, collection of things. Let's look at some of them that we can understand. So the top right corner, it says text analytics. So with just a simple plugin with an API call on your application, you can do sentiment analysis, it says, on any kind of text that is either written or spoken to you. So you can find out if somebody's in a good mood, if they like your review, if they hate your business, and the artificial intelligent agent will give you a score. And so that, that's an AI example, and you don't have to do much programming other than tell it, analyze this. So the next item here in the center is the AI route planner. So for instance, when you start using Google Maps or Microsoft Maps, you don't have to compute the uh, the best route that a car should take. There's a AI agent that is doing that for you. And so, like I said, you don't have to be the AI expert. You just have to be a programmer that knows how to access data points and endpoints of APIs. So look at the other things. There's language understanding and video indexing. So you can actually analyze videos as they've been processed. And computer vision down in the bottom is also where you can recognize objects that are in the field of view of a camera. So this is where AI is as of right now. I just see this growing and AI agents becoming better and better and helpful in their in their process of making our apps more and more powerful. So, so I don't mean that AI is going to become like the overlord robots that are going to control our life and ruin our civilization. Uh, AI is just a manner of doing computing that makes the apps work more efficiently. So the next item up is cross-platform development. So the reason why I say this is going to be a trend in the future is because people are talking about it a lot and trying to do some work on it. But look here at the actual statistics about what apps are in the store today. So you can see that the Android store is much bigger as far as the number of apps go. And the uh, overlap here shows the number of apps that are cross-platform. They've been developed in tools like uh, React Native or Flutter or some other tool to have one code base between the two. But the majority of apps are written in a single platform environment. Why is that? It's because that's the best experience for the user and the app actually work well. And so there's a lot of improvement that needs to be done on cross-platform application development. And so I can only see it as a trend that will increase Google is putting quite a bit of work into their cross-platform tools, such as Flutter, and their current edition of Kotlin is compiling the guts of your application right now and leaving the user interface to custom development. So there's attention being paid to this, and so I would expect that it's only going to grow from its humble place that it is in right now. The next is e-commerce. So you've heard of e-commerce, of course, is when we've turned stores into websites. So e-commerce is the idea that you can run your entire store on a mobile phone. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is the idea of responsive design applications. So if you have a web app that w works well on your phone and your tablet and your computer, then you can use your phone in a greater degree. So when you're out in the store or the warehouse, you don't have to have your laptop with you. And so that's one reason why 
computing on the phone is growing and eventually will hopefully replace your desktop for the majority of the purpose that it needs. So you've probably seen this in some of the uh, coffee shops you've been to where they don't even have a cash register or a point of sale computer. They have a tablet or they have an iPad or something like that. And so that is M computing. That is running your entire business on a mobile platform. And so I just see that as a great way for people to save time and save money and save devices. So M computing will probably be a growth area. So consider that an opportunity if you're an app developer. So virtual reality shows up next. So virtual reality has been a great thing for the future. It has always been a great thing that's going to happen in the future. Right now, virtual reality pretty much stinks. Um, this is how I see it, is people get headaches, they get nauseated. It's as good as the 3D televisions were, what, some years ago. Uh, it was a great technology that the engineers loved and they promoted, and nobody bought them because nobody cared that their TVs were three-dimensional. And it seems to me a little bit like that right now with VR. Nobody really is buying into this, even though there's a great deal of research being put into it. So the potential then is amazing. If we could get VR that doesn't stink, then we are going to have a great uh, view for the future. So right now, mobile phones um, on like the Google Cardboard are pretty much dead. Uh, if you go walk through Goodwill or any secondhand store or any garage sale, you're going to see all these uh, headsets that were designed to hold mobile phones. And obviously everyone tried them and nobody liked them. So what's, this, what's the current share? So if you look at the actual headsets that are designed for virtual reality for playing serious games, and you plug into Xboxes or high-end computers, you're gonna see that Oculus is the market leader. They have about 50% of the share of all the models that are currently connected to devices. This is uh, data here that comes from Steam. So we're talking about games here. And you can see that Oculus has uh, this Rift and Quest and the Rift 2 or the Rift, Rift S, I'm sorry. And so they're obviously the leader. So if we can get a mobile phone to work as well as an Oculus, then maybe we'll have some potential there. So let's keep it in the future category for a little bit longer. Virtual reality may eventually become really cool and people will adopt it. Augmented reality probably has a little bit better future because as you can see the applications in augmented reality allow you to stay in touch with the real world. You don't have to stumble around in a headset. So the people that I work with at Grand Canyon University tell me that the best experience that they have in their students and working with AR is with the Microsoft tools. So Microsoft makes the HoloLens and they have version 2 out. And you may have seen in the recent news that the uh, Pentagon has awarded um, some contract worth billions of dollars to Microsoft because they have this augmented reality headset that really, really does work pretty well in comparison to the others. So you can see a couple of applications here. Is that Here's a student, it looks like, and he is uh, pulling apart the spinal column of a, of a model here. And you can look at it in detail even though you're, you're still looking at the world around you. It's just kind of the superimposed image over your glasses. So here's another application of the technology that looks interesting. So you go to ancient Rome and you see these ruins that are maybe half there or 90% destroyed. With an augmented reality app, you could get to see what the original looked like. And so you go to a museum and instead of looking at the skeleton, they might show you a more realistic view of a model of the dinosaur. So right now, AR is kind of quirky. It's kind of gimmicky. I don't really see this as a necessary item that you have to have. And so we'll keep it in the future then. Now, remember, this is a video about what, com what is coming, what's going to be developed, and what's going to improve a great deal. So we can still keep AR as a developing and growing technology. So take a peek here. This is uh, Google's developer website for what they currently have for augmented reality. And so you can experiment with this. As you can see, you can put cartoonish looking models on the street or on the table. And uh, they've got plugins that work with Android and Unity and Unreal and iOS. And so uh, right now you can do the cartoony kind of a guy standing around your neighborhood. So 
Go ahead and experiment with this if you want to become a developer that works with augmented reality. Now I mentioned, so the technology is not particularly useful. I don't know of any apps right now that you must have that make this work uh, other than Pokemon Go. So maybe, uh, maybe you'll be the guy or the girl that comes up with a great solution why we all have to have our phones for an augmented reality app. So no doubt in the future, we're going to be seeing higher bandwidth. So 5G networks currently are being rolled out as I'm making this video. What will that mean for mobile developers? Well, you're gonna see some trends, which means you're going to have greater emphasis on connecting to the cloud resources. Your GPS will be more responsive. You can have higher resolution video conferencing. You'll have better response times. You're going to have always on services and the IoT revolution, the internet of things, will become easier to develop and AR will be better. And what's going to then in decrease in trends? Well, if your phone is working well with 5G, then less dependence on the computers. You're gonna have fewer disconnections. You're gonna have less reliance on the storage in your phone. And they promise us that our batteries are going to last longer, so less energy consumption. So those are some trends that will accelerate as we have higher bandwidth. Now, IoT, or the Internet of Things, is a growing field, and I honestly think that mobile developers are in a great situation to figure out how to use this. So I picked off this uh, page here from Microsoft, Azure IoT Edge, it's called. And so the idea of Internet of Things is that we are going to have a different trend. Instead of more computing on the cloud, we have more computing on devices. Okay, so that's the complete opposite of the trend that I was showing you earlier. So what this means is that they're working, as I want to say they, I say we're talking about electrical engineers and computer engineers. They are designing apps that are super low power and have higher abilities to do computing. So if you have these tiny little things that require almost no energy and can do a lot of processing on them, which is obviously impossible for most of us to think of right now. But if that goal is met, then the IoT will it will take that that heavy CPU usage from the cloud or from the core and move it to the edge. And so less uh, computing power is going to be needed in data centers if we can make the IoT devices better and more strong. So what are the IoT devices, you ask? Well, hopefully you can understand that those are the smart devices. So don't even you don't have to think about the smart coffee pot anymore. IoT devices can be embedded in things like concrete, and so you know what's going on with your bridge, what's the vibration, what's the load, what's the temperature. So you build things into materials. Uh, you have home security systems are right now, which are current IoT devices. But if you think of every object with a smart chip in it, from your car to your ballpoint pen, to the chair you're sitting on, to the medical devices that are embedded in your body, all of these things are considered IoT, the Internet of Things. So really IoT is another form of mobile programming, mobile application development. So if you're a mobile app developer, then you're in the right field for the future. Wearable technology is going to be more and more. Um, so right now you've got the smartwatch, uh, you've got maybe uh, smart glasses. We've got the tools here right now at Android developing um, SDKs. So you can build your own uh, watch apps right now. Security is going to be obviously bigger and more important than ever in the future. So you're looking at any software developer uh, best practices guide, whether it's Apple or Microsoft or uh, Google, you're going to have best practices in mobile development going on all the time. So make sure that you include security as part of your design. Uh, blockchain is going to fit directly with that increase on security. So currently, we're all using our phones and credit cards to make purchases. So we're kind of on the top row of this model here, where we're the customer and there's somebody in the middle that's taking a cut from everything that we do with our credit card. And what we want to do, or it would be nice maybe, is to use virtual currencies and uh, blockchain type things to just do a direct transaction. So we cut out some costs. So right now we have the model on the left where you add a credit card to your app and then the transactions are made through your bank. 
So in the future, maybe we can have direct payments using Bitcoin or something similar. And so I expect that that will be a trend that will accelerate in the future. Here's something that I haven't actually experienced much of myself, but I see it as a trending topic that will be in the next few years is beacons. So a beacon is a small radio server that can tell you that there is a phone nearby and then you can get a message. So in this case, somebody gets an alert that says, hey, would you like a special drink? Now you can do this right now with GPS. And so maybe if high bandwidth and improved GPS accuracies are, are with us, then beacons are really just redundant. They're not even necessary, but it's not a tool that's in common use right now. So maybe beacons will be in the future. So I'm kind of skeptical that this will actually be something that I would care about. I, as a consumer, I want less uh, annoyances, not more annoyances. So I don't want beacons telling me, hey, you got a new alert. I mean, I try to shut off the alerts that I have on my phone already because there's so many. But anyway, beacons are something that people are working on and we'll keep it in the future. If you'd like to see the entire playlist for this course, then take a look here at the link. You can watch through all the things from designing an app to hiring your team to choosing the right platform. So I appreciate you coming. Make sure you subscribe and you will become a better mobile application developer. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course that will help you as a business manager and a team lead for mobile development. We're in chapter eight of this course, so we're near the end. We're talking about future trends of app development. And this is a video for doing homework. So I'm going to give you an assignment if you're one of my students at Grand Canyon University. This is assignment 8-1. What I want to do is take a look back at what other companies did in past decades when they were predicting the future. So we can learn from the past and predict how well we will predict the future. So for the background, I've got a couple of videos that I want you to watch. So first of all, called in, from 1987, called Apple's Future Computer the Knowledge Navigator. And so in 87, Apple provided a vision of what they thought we would be doing by today. And so it's interesting to see that they got quite a bit of it right, but it's kind of funny to see where they didn't get it right either. Then they have a second video that was made in 93, which is called Your World, Your Newton. So the Newton, of course, was the early version of a smartphone. And the technology was kind of bulky, but for the time it was very compact. And some of the features that they thought were great, uh, we don't use today. So both of those are great ideas that Apple had in the past. So these videos were created at a time when personal computers were still relatively new. Think Apple II and the early Macintosh. Uh, the internet was still 10 years away and smartphones were still at least 20 years away. So. These were fairly forward-looking videos. So what I want you to do in this is to write a one-page reaction. Tell me what you thought about Apple's predictions. What predictions did Apple get that are in common use today? In terms of percentages, what do you think their, uh, their grade should be? How good were they in the quantity of correct predictions? And which features did they show in the video that were complete failures? Why didn't they succeed? Why were they not adopted? Were they too clumsy? Were they just dumb ideas? Or what do you think went wrong? And then what did they not anticipate very well? So are there things that they forgot to include in the videos that we do today? And why did they miss them? So let's take a look at how Apple did. And based on our Monday, Mac, Monday morning quarterback ability, looking in the, in the hindsight, Let's find out what we think they did well and what they did not do well. So if you're one of my students, I would expect you to submit this to me as an assignment. Send me a one-page document, a Word document's good, that will evaluate the Apple's predictions, how well they did, where they got it right, where they got it wrong, and what you think our prediction ability is for the future. So that's how I would grade you based on your analysis. So send that to me if you're one of my students. If you're not one of my students, go feel free to add into the comments below what you think about what Apple predicted. Or are there are other companies that had just as interesting predictions in the uh, 80s or the 90s for what we would be doing by now. 
I'm going to add a link to the course so that you can see all the videos in this course called The Business of Building Apps. And if you're one of my students, I will see you next time. And if, if you haven't subscribed yet, do that now. Thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course about mobile app development and being the business manager in the process. So we've gone through a whole bunch of material and we are on chapter eight, which is about future trends. In this video, I'm going to give you an assignment. So if you were one of my students at Grand Canyon University, you now have homework. This is assignment 8.2. What I want you to do is to analyze the current state of development tools, the process that we can consider uh, things that are working well. So look at Stack Overflow, for example, and they have a customer survey or a user survey that talks about what is popular. So they analyze which languages are growing in popularity, which frameworks are growing, and of course, which ones are declining. So through this survey, we can understand the current trends and we can predict the direction of certain languages and frameworks. So what's emerging? and what's fading away. So the instructions, what I want you to do is to take a look at a uh, survey data and based on that, what are the current trends? And then applying that to what you're working on right now, such as your application, your business, your plan, which languages have you adopted and what do you think their future is? Are they good in the future or not? So for instance, if you've adopted Xamarin, for your choice of development tools, what do you see in the future? Is it good or is it gloomy? And I want you to also think about a cost estimate. So based on what other frameworks have done in the past, uh, how often do you think you're going to have to release a new version of your app? So that depends on the operating system of the phone, of course, as well as the language itself. And so if you're one of my students, this is what I would expect you to send me. I would expect you to send me a Word document that analyzes the trends and the technologies used in your application. So what's growing, what's shrinking, and how future-proof is your current app. If you're not in my class, then you don't have to submit the assignment, but please, in the comments below, talk about which languages that you see are emerging or dying. What have you adopted and which are you abandoning? So if you have not subscribed yet to the channel, please do that. I will also provide a link to the playlist so you can see all the videos about the business of building apps. And if you're one of my students, I will see you in class next time. Thanks for watching. Hi, and welcome to the business of building apps. This is a course about mobile application development and the business decisions that go with it. So we're in chapter eight here, which is about future trends. And this video is a homework assignment. So we're on assignment 8.3. So if you're one of my students at Grand Canyon University, listen up because this is what you're going to have to do. So this assignment is about the future of mobile technologies. So what I want you to do is to create a paper that is going to examine what is growing in possibilities for the future. So future trends are technologies that are currently gaining popularity and they might not be quite there yet. So they have significant obstacles to overcome. So if you want to see a background video on this, I have taught my own uh, lesson on my opinions and what's there, but I'd like you to do your own research as well. So here's the instructions. I would like you to write a paper that answers the following questions. So which predictions mentioned in the topic readings or in the lessons that I've given you, do you feel will be the most successful? So express your reasons for why you think they will be successful. So for instance, virtual reality and Bitcoin and uh, augmented reality or things like that. So what did I mention and which ones do you think are most promising? Which predictions do you think are most likely to fail? So just because something gets a lot of press doesn't mean that you think it will be uh, where you would put your money. So explain your reasons for pessimism. And so based on both of these optimistic and pessimistic views, you would probably think about what you would put your investment in in your own business. So how could they provide solutions to you? And so in this course, we've been talking about your own app, your own idea, your own business, and uh, what future plans do you see? So we're talking about five to 10 years from now, how would you think your app will grow? 
So if you're one of my students, this is what I would expect you to deliver to me. I would expect a Word document uh, that's maybe about a page long that evaluates the likelihood of success or failure for current emerging technologies. So you're going to give me a ranking, your top five, let's say, of what things are in the future and why you believe that they will succeed. Now, if you're not one of my students, go ahead and write in the comments below what you think is probably the future of mobile tech. If you'd like to subscribe, make sure that you do that. And I will put a link to the playlist for the entire course so that you can go back and see all of the great gems of knowledge that have been shared here on the business of building apps. Thank you for watching.